There's no time. No. O'clock. Hello there, everybody. Oh my god, it's your Flock of Seagulls shirt. I haven't exactly. seen that in a yeah, really yeah. long time. Where, yeah, yeah. where is that been? I'm bringing Fuck a Seagull on the show. <laughs> yeah, I know you're always fucking with me on the show, Tom. <laughs> I mean, you go cigar all over I know. It's like that, that, that'll, de- that'll derail the entire mm-hmm. fucking show. We're supposed to be talking about good actors. Ooh, yeah. that was a burn. So, yeah, hey, everybody. I'm not an actor, I'm an entertainer. <laughs> and, and martial arts legend. <laughs> okay, I'm Steve. a living action figure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's definitely what he would say. Yeah. Can't you uh, just tell by my build? <laughs> Sure. I don't ever use stunt doubles to walk up and down stairs. It's a lie. <laughs> See, it's already started. It's already yeah, started. Yeah. I'm not going to do it anymore. Zach says, love the red, Jenny. Thank you. I, I realized that I hadn't worn my, my red wig in a, in a while, and I figured, I don't know, since we're talking about Bella Lugosi and mm-hmm. stuff like that, and it's vampires and it's red, you know. And uh, the, uh, the funny thing about this is that we didn't really do this on purpose, but... We actually recorded a review today for Horror of Dracula, the Christopher Lee, like the first Christopher Lee, like Hammer film, where he played Dracula. So yeah. we're doing a whole classic monsters week this week, I guess, which we didn't even really mean to. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay, movie. <laughs> I what Horror of Dracula? Yeah. Oh, I really yeah, like yeah. horror. I really like okay. Horror of Dracula. I mean, Christopher, how can you not like Christopher Lee? Well, and the thing about it well, is the best that thing about it, about it was him, with him and uh, the other guy. Peter Cushing. Peter, yeah, Peter Cushing. Well, see, that's the thing, and I'm glad that we finally got around to doing this, like Karloff and Lugosi, because we did, actually a while back, we did a show about Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, and then for some reason, I don't know why I didn't think of it, but somebody recommended, hey, why don't you do one about Karloff and Lugosi? And I'm like, uh, yeah, duh, we probably should have done that one first. But, you know, there you go. Uh, so yeah, I watched those. Uh, actually, there's a couple good documentaries about both of them. Shudder has a really good one called "The Man Behind the Monster," which is about Boris Karloff. And then there's another one on YouTube that's called "The Gentle Monster" that came out a couple years ago that had like some interesting stuff in it. And then the Bella Lugosi one, I think, was called "The Dark Prince." I don't know what year that one came out, but those are both pretty good. I watched those like earlier today. So there's that whole thing. All right, so. Uh, uh, Zach says, I know very little about either of these guys. I tried watching the 30s Dracula once and almost fell asleep. Um, well, the thing about the, er, the 1931 Dracula is that, one, it's based on a stage play, and it's very clearly a stage play because it's kind of like, that's the early you days know, of place. cinema. Yeah. So you were kind of like essentially... You know, watching a play. Watching a play, but, like, on film. Yeah. Uh, so they didn't really have the whole, like, cinematic language, like, set up yet. I loved it when I was like six or seven. I still like it. I still really like it. I, li- I like Bella Lugosi. They would play it um, on television, sometimes way early in the morning. Um, out on, out in California. While it was still dark, they'd play it. Um, before the Saturday, night, Saturday morning cartoons would come on. And yeah. Yeah, because they, they were playing monster movies for like, you know, five o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. Well, yeah, they were probably cheap at that point. Right. So when I was a little kid, I'd wake up at like five and watch watch some monster movies. <laughs> and then uh, and they had good monster movies. And then the cartoons would start at around six. That's why Saturday is the best day. Yeah. But when you're a little kid, you could wake up before the sun would come up and with, automatically without even setting a damn alarm clock. And then because you knew it was Saturday. Yeah, it's like woo, like, like all the fun. Yeah, monster movies. Yeah. Wake Sit in front of the TV watching monster movies and eating cereal and yeah, and. It's dark. <laughs> and uh, no nah, man, when you're like six, seven, fucking that little Dracula was, that old Dracula movie was just scary enough for you could handle it, you know. I liked it. Well, the thing about it, I kind of feel like maybe the reason that uh, that the Universal monster movies, and I'm not saying that they wouldn't have still been as iconic, uh, you know, to this day, like if that if this hadn't happened. 
But I kind of feel like what happened is because they were so popular at the time, like in the 30s, and then after World War II, like it kind of started going more towards sci-fi, and it was like the Universal monster movies were seen as kind of like old-fashioned. But at least in the United States, like in... I guess, like, later on, like, in the 50s and, and 60s, they started showing all the old Universal Monster movies on TV. So, like, a bunch of little kids grew up, grew watching. up watching them. Yeah. And then that kind of started, like, Forrest Ackerman, like, started Famous Monsters of Filmland. And it's, like, because you got, like, a whole new generation of kids that were seeing them for the first yeah. time. And they got really into them. And so I kind of feel like that really helps, like, cement their legacy. Frankenstein. Yeah. Wolfman. Invisible Man. Uh, they had... Some of them were silent, long silent ones, like uh, or silent that was converted to to audio. One of them that I remember was like that was uh, Phantom of the Opera. I think I, I don't. Yeah, I think that was converted to to uh, to a talkie. I don't think it was a talkie at first. That one fucking was. No, weird. the original Phantom of the Opera was, was silent. silent. I think they did later. another. No, I think they did another version another of it version. later. Like okay. that was a talkie, but the original one was okay. a silent film. Yeah, because I know that movie was remade several times. They yeah. Paint, they patch them together. I think they had the same, mostly the same cast. I think they still had all what's his name. Lon Chaney. Lon Chaney, yeah. The thing about Lon Chaney is that, you know, he was like a massive international star, um, you know, Man of a Thousand Faces, right? And he actually died fairly young. I think he had, like, throat cancer. And actually, Bella Lugosi was supposed to be, like, his successor. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like, he was going to be, like, the next big horror star, which in a lot of ways he was. And I kind of want to talk, too, about um, just the way I kind of feel like of the two... Uh, between Bela Lugosi and Bo Boris Karloff, I think Boris Karloff had a more successful career because he was more... I don't want to say he was necessarily more versatile, like he was a better actor, he but didn't I... He didn't get typecast. He didn't... Yeah, one, he didn't get typecast yeah. in horror movies. Like, he did a little bit, but not to the same extent. And yeah. I think that Bela Lugosi suffered uh, because of his thick accent for a long time whereas you know Boris Karloff obviously was a native English speaker so he got a lot more roles that because he could play other things too like he played criminals and he played like sheiks and he played now Bela Lugosi did that kind of stuff too but I think that Lugosi's accent once he came to Hollywood really kind of was a little bit of a detriment because it really and conversely like his role as Dracula was so iconic like everybody immediately just associated him with that role that he couldn't really get anything else and I kind of feel like that didn't happen to Karloff as much maybe because he was so changed for the role of Frankenstein with all the makeup and like all the padding and the big shoes and everything like that so it was easier like when you saw him like playing a person we might lose the stream there's a storm going out of there just tell him yeah, I'm just, yeah. yeah I mean, it might not be too bad, but I mean. Lot, there's thunder out there. There's lightning. thunder and stuff, yeah. so I don't really know. All it takes is a lightning gonna... strike and we can lose power. Yeah, but if that happens, you know, we'll come back we'll on. We'll try to come on if we can. As soon get, as it uh, comes as back on. As soon as we on. get power back, yeah. I mean, usually we don't, we lost power, I think, like on one of these from a storm, but it was only like a couple seconds and then we had to kind of. Yeah, but like, there was a time we lost power for two days. Yeah, but. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was like hurricane. Right. That was a hurricane. So, um, yeah. Uh, what else I was gonna say about this? I guess, it's, I guess it doesn't matter. Yeah. What was it? Something about something about Bela Lugosi. He got slightly typecast, but another thing is that they don't talk about is that he didn't age very well. He was. I think he he started to look old pretty quick. He was old when he got famous. I think he was in his forties when he got famous, wasn't he? So was Karloff. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Karloff was not, and actually, I didn't even realize this until I was watching it earlier. Um, they had both been acting for a very long time, like before their big break. Karloff was actually, I think he was 43 yeah. when he was in Frankenstein, which was kind okay. of his big breakout role. Yeah, but the difference, there's a big, they aged very differently, though. I mean, they did. Uh, Bell Agosi was a junkie. Okay, he, he was not. Yeah, a that happened later, though. Yeah. I mean, that did happen a little bit later. He, he hit 60, he was, he was shot. But then you had Karloff. He was still making movies at 60. Yeah, actually, Boris yeah. Karloff, um, he, probably, he, actually, probably picked up. he was still doing yeah. movies. Well, and the thing about Karloff, too, was that he, again, like, you know, maybe not entirely, like, Bela Lugosi's fault, but Karloff just had more 
versatility he got more offers so he was actually a really respected stage actor as well like later on like bella lugosi was on in a lot of stage productions earlier and then went into movies yeah. whereas karloff was stage acting movie acting and then later yeah. went into stage and tv and stuff like that and so and obviously like he got really famous later from doing like the grinch stole yeah. how the grinch stole christmas and he actually did because that great voice that he had he did all that voiceover work of like he would uh you know read children's stories and he edited horror anthologies and all this other kind of stuff so yeah. he like had a lot more stuff yeah. going on like as he got older yeah we call him bella but his he called his real name was bela all right and bela yeah. he, he was a stage performer and he really was became a fucking international superstar and kind of sex symbol from dracula that's oh, yeah. really and i said it on this other thing recording we just made <clears throat> bela kind of invented dracula as you know him and a lot of the a lot of the fucking things about vampires visually mm -hmm. you know that you recognize shit like dressing up be a suave the cape um uh, kind of a sex symbol type thing that was Bela Lugosi that yeah. fucking did that all right that was not in their fucking source material and the source material what they were talking about was that they were talking about Nosferatu yeah he was like a, he was like a gross old man with basically a, a stragoi yeah a fucking rat you know a rat demon an undead rat demon that could do all kinds of weird shit and Bram Stoker's Sto I, see I did say Stoker but I just said that because it's my <laughs> accent Bra Bram Stoker I got a mush mouth Bram Stoker um, kind of simplified what he had what he had heard about Strogoi and fucking came up with the Dracula story there's a lot of stuff that he left out Strogoi are actually cooler than, than, than vampires they were ugly but they could do weird things like have sex with a dead body and create living children out of that, or undead children. They could have sex with the undead also, like a van like a zombie or whatever, and, and give birth to an undead child. They could have sex with a living person and give sex and give birth to a living vampire. A vampire that had never died. But when they die, they become now an undead vampire. So all kinds of abilities that they had. They were also sorcerers. They would literally do magic and cast spells like a like a like a wizard or a witch. So they weren't just and they, they were ugly, basically. You know. It, it well depending on what, what they were born from. If they were a stragoy who had had sex with a dead woman. And when, what came out of there wasn't going to be good looking, <laughs> okay? <laughs> or two stragoys that were undead stragoys having sex, then that wouldn't be... But if it came out of a living woman, it might be good looking when it came out. It might look like a normal person. It might be closer to what you would consider Dracula to be. So I, there's a lot more to the lore. But the visual archetypes that you think of when you think of Count Dracula and all the other ripoffs that came from that for a long time and even Interview with the Vampire and Blackula and all that Bela Lugosi came up with a lot of that that's the thing. If you go up to somebody yeah. now, I don't care who it is, go up to anybody in the United States or Europe or anything like that and say dress up as a vampire for Halloween yeah if it's a man, they're gonna like have a suit and they're gonna have like yeah. the widow's peak and they're it's gonna look like Bella Lugosi, yeah. pretty much. I mean, that's what it's gonna look like. Yeah. So the fact that he kind of established that. Now, like I said, we and we talked about this on our other thing, which isn't going up yet, but because we were talking about the Christopher Lee Dracula, which is a whole different thing, which I like that too. I like both, they're both very different interpretations. The Max Shrek fucking Nosferatu is closer to what St Stoker was talking about. That's closer to a Stragoi. Yeah, like more, more obviously a monster. Obviously, yeah, a rat cr creature, undead, evil looking thing. <laughs> long nose, big ears. Yeah, fangs, nothing you'd be, nothing hands. that would be like you'd want to yeah. be that you want to have sex with. Body, you know what I mean? That's kind of what a stragoi looked like. Yeah, but yeah. you want to see a good stragoi movie, see Blood Vessel. It's a newer movie. It's really good. Yeah, I think what is it? 2018. Yeah, something really like that. good. And that's got, that was one of the better like new movies I've yeah, seen. One of the better be new honest. vampire movies. It's got uh, at least 
At least two Stragoi I think it's on I think it's on Tubi Yeah matter of fact. The Nazis had Found A Nazis had one Put it on a ship And uh, it gets out Yeah it's a good one Back in World War II uh, John Smith said, uh, Karloff made an amazing film in his old age, Targets. Was that the Peter Bogdanovich one? Yeah, I think so, in which he pretty much plays himself. And uh, Slash of Red points out, Boris Karloff is also in the original Scarface. That's true, from the 1930s. He was. So, yeah, that's the thing. I think Boris Karloff, and I know, and I kind of want to get into this a little bit, because I think that, especially after uh, Tim Burton's movie Ed Wood came out, that that really kind of fueled... Uh, the rumors that Bella Lugosi and Boris Karloff hated each other. There was like a big rivalry between them. Um, that seems to be not entirely the case. Now, I think that Bella Lugosi was probably rightfully so um, professionally jealous because Boris Karloff got more roles than him and like had a lot more, like had a bigger career, I guess. Uh, so I think that he was that, but he didn't have, he didn't seem to have any animosity toward Boris Karloff. He, he knew that it wasn't Boris's fault right. that he was getting more work. He just was just kind of like, man, that sucks that... He got more work because of the popularity. You could take him places, uh, you know. Bela, at the time all that shit was going on, he was he was a drug addict. You know, people, they, and they knew it. Everybody knew he was a drug. He, he was yeah, a I mean, the public. It's interesting too yeah. because Bella Lugosi was actually—I don't know if you guys know this—but he was actually the first, like, Hollywood celebrity mm-hmm. to come out and admit that he had was a drug addict and had been to rehab. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not saying that it didn't happen before that because obviously it did. He broke the taboo, but he t- broke the taboo about it and came out and talked about it. Now he was, yeah. yeah, he was in rehab for three months, and actually when he came out. They said he was 74 when he came out, but they said he was actually in pretty good shape. Like, you know, he still looked like an old man, obviously, but he seemed a lot better and he was like actually on TV and stuff like that. But he didn't live too much longer after that. Yeah. And it's it's kind of like sad what happened to him because, you know, he kept working up until the end, you know, more or less. But like I said, he kind of ended up in like Ed Wood movies and shit like that and then was like a drug addict. Whereas Boris Karloff, I feel like, as he kind of got into his old age, he was a lot more distinguished. Like I said, he was still working in the theater. He was still doing a lot of voiceover. He was doing like editing, like horror ed- anthologies and things like that. So I kind of feel like he got mo- a lot more respect, like into his dotage, I guess. Yeah. Uh, whereas Bella Lugosi was kind of like seen as I don't know if I'd seen say seen as like washed up, but he didn't really. He didn't command the respect. He didn't get the same respect, I think, that Boris Karloff got. Yeah, everybody knew he was... Which is sad, because they were both, like, amazing actors. Yeah. According to fucking interviews that I saw over the years, is that it was common knowledge in Hollywood that Bela was strung out, would work for a short change. He was, at that time, he was he was, he was an addict. You weren't going to get any big gigs. Uh, they just didn't want him around, you know? They wanted somebody who was who could hang, you know, who could hang with the drugs were a fucking huge fucking faux pas back then. You know what I mean? It wasn't the, the Hollywood of today where you could be addicted to something is okay. No, not really. Well, and back then, and it's kind of yeah. sad too because back then, uh, you know, he it was prescription drugs he got addicted yeah. to because of injuries. And then he started taking morphine, and then he just started taking yeah. So and then there's that. So, yeah, it's kind of sad how that happened. But like I said, he's not the only one that happened to. But you have to kind of give him respect for being having the balls to, like, come out and, like, be the first Hollywood celebrity to admit that, Um, you know. Yeah, and he would talk to the papers, you know. And there's there's a good scene in the Ed Wood movie. If you guys haven't seen Ed Wood, you must see it. It's a fucking must-watch movie. It's I great. mean, it's yeah, that's an amazing movie. It's amazing probably movie. my favorite Tim Burton movie, yeah. but um, it's all in black and white. Now, it's about it, old Hollywood. Now, a lot of the yeah. stuff that they say about because I think like some Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff's kids, like their mm-hmm. relatives, were kind of like, yeah, we're that's not, not so that's not really what happened, or that's not really right. like they didn't really like the way Lugosi was portrayed. It's like he really didn't hate Boris Karloff or time, but. Yeah. If you go into it with that, like, don't think it's just, like, an absolutely true story, then it's an amazing movie. Right. It's so fucking good. Yeah, but there there evidently was some accuracy, because when he was in rehab, evidently people were like, man, you maybe you shouldn't be talk you shouldn't talk to the press about all this. And he's like, no. Uh, no, I fucking, first of all, this is publicity. Yeah. Any publicity is good publicity, but people like the truth, and the truth is, is that there's drug addiction in Hollywood. Yeah. And that's really... And he, and he he was in his 70s. You can't punish a man in his 70s. He's, yeah. 
Okay, and he was breaking the taboo. He's like, there's drug addiction in Hollywood, and you guys have to fucking, you know, be forgiving of these people. You know what I mean? Fucking people need help with, with drug addiction. And, you know, evidently uh, the, the public was sympathetic because they, they liked Bela. Yeah. They were like, yeah, well, shit. And he evidently told his story to the newspaper that he got addicted to painkillers from some injury or something. And yeah. He yeah, we'll never could that. shake it. Yep. And that's the thing. It's so I, I think that was really ballsy of him because he was really the first big actor that had done that. Everybody yeah. else, they're trying to like keep it. Oh, no one has drug addictions. No, right. Yeah. None of that is going He's on. To, they were. Everybody thought that actors and actresses were prim and proper, and that they were like the paragons of virtue, and that they were things people that you saw on the big screen, and they were role models. That was the old way. Yeah, the, I mean, the studios definitely tried to portray yeah. them that way. So yeah. anything, any kind of scandal, like if yeah. anybody was fucking around with their wife or somebody, like, accidentally killed somebody in a hit and run or then, or a drug addiction or anything yeah. like that, they would absolutely try to cover yeah. that shit up. And it was and it was bullshit because even going all the way back to the, the golden era and the silver screen, even pre-golden era, silent films, a lot of those girls came from, of course... Professions they were, you know what I mean, where the fucking a woman had to make money. Okay, that happened. The first concept of the star in Western or in the American culture, a star was a hooker who was given a star at a brothel because she could sing and dance. Okay, because hookers don't want to be hookers; they want to be entertainers. You know, kind of like a geisha. So that's where even the word star came from. Uh, and then, you know, even the silver screen actresses, especially when they were new into the business, they were all in fucking wine, you know, fucking, what's his name? Weinstein? That's his name? Yeah, you know, Weinstein Studios. They were in Weinstein type situations, you know? These yeah, girls. that's what I mean. There's nothing new about it. Yeah. I mean, like, humans are going to human. Right. I kind of feel like the entertainment industry, Those girls going had, back thousands of years, has always couch. been like that. It's always been like that. Casting couch, and those girls were passed around between executives to make sure that they had good careers and shit. All right. And uh, they had to do what they had to do, and then sometimes they were almost basically literally pimped out to rich guys. It helped their career. That's what they would say. This will help your career. He's going to finance your next movie. But, but, yeah. You blow him. He does you. He fucking coughs up $10,000 to make the new fucking silent movie we're going to make. That's literally what was happening. Yeah, I'm pretty... It yeah, is like, what it was. It well, was yeah. Every, every, was. I think everybody knows that now. Yeah, I don't think yeah. anybody knew that yeah, at the time. Pretty much still like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I mean. It hasn't yeah. changed. So I think right, like people yeah. talk about it nowadays. Like right. it's I'm like it's not any different. You know what I mean? It's just they were better at like covering it they up back in the old up. days because they right. didn't have the internet. Right. Um, so Oracle said Judy Garland could have done with a bit more honesty regarding the drugs the studio made her take. Yeah, that's true because that man, that yeah. poor girl, and they got her addicted on shit when she was like a kid, still like a teenager, because they didn't want her to get fat. Yeah, they wanted her to be thin. And, and nimble, and they wanted her to look as young as possible for as long as possible. Yeah. That's not possible. No, it is. Not, not with the technology that they were using. That's not. That's it. And that's what's sad about yeah. it is that, and especially if you got kind of sucked into it at a young age like yeah. Judy Garland did, um, you know, you, you really can't, it's hard to like bust out of that, yeah. to be honest. And really, what, su what sucked about it is that for weird reasons, I guess the, the tastes, men's tastes in women back in that time was kind of like Japanese or Chinese tastes. They liked real skinny and small for some reason. And, and because that's all they saw on the screen, they liked it even more. So it was like a never-ending cycle. It was like a vicious cycle. And you showed them somebody who was voluptuous or muscular, they'd have liked that too. So they didn't have to look that way. It's just that the studios thought they did. Well, the weird like, thing... Look at, look at what's her name? Mae West. Mae West was what you'd call big fine today. You know, today you call that big fine or, or thick. And she was fucking sexy. Uh, for her day, the women really didn't look like that. Big boobs, fucking... Yeah, uh, and I think she kind of got a pass because she yeah. was so funny. Funny. 
So funny I think and sexy. Yeah, that's what I mean. Real well, and, and I think that the funny helped the sexy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. She wasn't just like a little ingenue. Right. With she, her big wide eyes and her little right. baby. She was just like, she had like a personality. That she was, was like, like larger than life. And that was like one of the first white girls, this is back in the 30s, that's basically on the slick saying, no, I date black guys. You know what I mean? Which she did, that, yeah. Which we should probably was, do a show about her yeah, too. Right. I love and, and they were West. always she making so these awesome. kind of sideways comments, and she's always accompanied by her big, handsome, muscular black chauffeur. <laughs> you know that was her fucking boyfriend. Yeah, yeah. yeah but they, you know. Well, we have to tell everybody yeah. you're my chauffeur. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But everybody knew. Yeah. Everybody knew. Well, it that's just, what I mean. Yeah. It's like people like did know. It's, it was just like about Bella Lugosi's drug addiction. Read between the lines. Everybody yeah. in Hollywood knew yeah. about it, right. but they didn't like tell the public about that kind of stuff because yeah. they thought that nobody would go see the movies if yeah. these people were just like people. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I, her comedy routines said a lot of the shit that she was... She, uh, her comedy routine was openly fucking sexual and she was a sexually aggressive type woman and then she made a lot of fucking sex jokes and they made fun of dudes for being inadequate. She And then she, she, she just did a lot of funny shit. That's but, what I mean. But they did it within the framework of what was acceptable in right. the 30s. And it was barely acceptable in the 30s. She knew how to fucking walk the line. But no, Mae West was the shit, man. She was fucking hilarious. hilarious. Well, the cool thing about that... She's the original it, bad girl. You can get away with a lot in comedy because yeah. you can say stuff that's true, but and then you... think they're joking. But then you can yeah. kind of just, like, back off and be like, hey, man, I'm only yeah. joking. What's the matter? Like, you know what I mean? So... You can kind of yeah. get away with a lot if you're a comedian. Yeah. Uh, Oracle said Mae West did a lot of charity, too. She was rags yeah. to riches and didn't forget where she came from. Yeah. Uh, and Zeusia K said, awesome, way to go, Mae. She did her shit and didn't care. No. Yeah, I kind of feel like she was one of the coolest ladies yeah. of uh, the golden era of Hollywood. She was kind of... Uh, there was a lot of cool ladies back then, but yeah. I think Mae West was probably the coolest Her one. Her, her um, public persona... And they made weird movies in the 30s where the movie's happening in a nightclub and it's going from one table to the next. Everybody's famous and they're all telling jokes. She was oh, yeah, 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 I've seen I don't know what kind of... And then there'd be people dancing, cabaret in the middle. They had weird movies. It's, like a vari- it's almost like a variety show, but like in movie form. But it's a movie form, yeah. Right. Which I, I've only seen a few of them and they're actually kind of good. Which, yeah, they are entertaining. I've yeah. seen them. And uh, she'd be in those things in fucking real low-cut dresses and looking good. Her and W.C. Fields playing fucking pool together and her her saying fucking sideways jokes and shit just real good real good she was um, her public persona was that of kind of like gangster girl kind of yeah. like somebody the mob would ha- would love you know she was like that she was a bad girl yeah but she wasn't dumb she was good she was fucking high quality high quality she was just wild for 1930s wild nowadays you just go yeah okay she's just cool the back in those days, a lot of shit she was doing would be unacceptable. But people don't realize that 20s and 30s was another sexual revolution. And when they think of sexual revolution, you think of the 60s. Now that happened in the 20s, too. Well, it's cyclical. It's a cycle. Right. It usually happens every 30, 40 years yeah. or so. Same kind of thing. Like, you know, everything gets real wild and permissive, and then, like, everybody yeah. goes, oh, we can't have that. And then, then yeah, they get super conservative then, again. Right, right. And then they, you know, and then it all right. repeats all over again. Yeah. I've seen it happen a few times in my lifetime. Yeah. The, so. the, the, barrel, gang, the barrel Gang, you know, with Clyde, Bonnie and Clyde, they were 20s and also fucking wild. Fucking <clears throat> Clive, Clive Barrow was fucking bisexual and pretty open about it. And... That was the 20s. Her, yeah. But, you know. So, like I said, it's it always her. just kind of like, I don't know, just I remember like talking to my grandmother about this kind of stuff because she's like, you know, no one was gay back in the old days. I'm like, Grandma, really? Like, it's, people. They just didn't talk about That's it. what I mean. Yeah. It's like all kind of shit like that was going on back yeah. in the day. They just didn't talk like you didn't hear about it. That's yeah. all. There's nothing different about people nowadays 20s and 30s was fucking nothing wild. different it's yeah. just you hear about it more than you did back then back then that was very scandalous to like talk about anything like that so shit man you couldn't even until the 1950s right you couldn't even show like married people sleeping yeah. in the same fucking bed yeah. you couldn't even show a toilet when yeah. alfred hitchcock put a toilet in psycho like in the bathroom in the shower scene people flipped the fuck oh, out oh man civilization's falling apart a toilet <laughs> showed the toilet yeah like yeah. you were like you could do you could have a toilet in your house obviously hopefully but you couldn't show it 
Yeah. It's like you're allowed to poop, but you can't tell anybody that you poop. It was that <laughs> kind of situation. And it's just kind of like that is just so so funny to me. That kind of stuff. I was that's what I mean. That's why I'm saying like I like a lot of things about you know, I like a lot of stuff about all different eras. Like I like, you know, universal movies. I like stuff from the fifties. I like stuff from the sixties. But I don't really like this whole attitude of we're not all human beings and we don't all like do this kind of shit. Like, I don't know. I, I'd much prefer when you're just like open about stuff. We've had a lot of comments you might want to catch up on. Yeah, I'm trying to uh Jane Mansfield was a fascinating character. Yeah. We should maybe do a show. Maybe we should do like a Maybe we should do like a whole like Golden Ladies of Hollywood or I don't know, something like that. Because, you know, I just feel like that's something we should do because I love that kind of stuff. Jane Mansfield was actually like really interesting. And uh, Zeusia said she liked Jane uh, Mansfield better than Marilyn Monroe. But yeah, um, let's see. What is that to do? Yep, no gay people in Hollywood ever, LOL. Yeah, never happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, no gay people in bodybuilding ever. That's what I mean. Yeah, and it's yeah, like, yeah. well, that's the thing. Like, you only found out, like, you, for example, like, the first thing that I thought of was, like, Rock Hudson. Like, yeah. you know, nobody knew that Rock Hudson was gay. Well, everybody in Hollywood knew. But, like, nobody in the public at large knew that Rock Hudson was gay until later on. And then they're like, yeah, he's got AIDS or whatever. And then it came all out about it. But... It's just, I don't know, that seems really dumb to me. And like I said, I'm really happy that nowadays you can just be whatever. And it's like, people are like, okay, fine. But back then, you had to, like, really keep shit secret. You couldn't, man, like, some of the actors back then that were gay, they had to, like, marry yeah. actresses and stuff. And it was like, they had to have a beard and all this other nonsense. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I can't imagine, like, what that must have been like. Just to have to constantly pretend you were someone else yeah. just for your job. That must have sucked. You know what I mean? But yeah. Uh, yeah. Tammy said you couldn't even say diarrhea on TV in the 50s. Yeah. Honestly, I still remember uh, commercials from the 1980s and even maybe into the 1990s where there was like a commercial for, uh, for example, uh, like maxi pads, like always maxi pads or something. And they still were using the blue water in yeah. the thing. Recently, I saw a commercial for maxi pads or tampons or whatever, and they actually use red water. And I was like, "Hallelujah! They're yeah. finally fucking doing shit." It's like that's exactly what it would look like. It's not fucking blue. Longtime listener Sass is asking, "Was it Jane Mansfield that was involved with the Anton?" Yes. It sounds familiar. Yeah, I think they did. Yes. She was also involved with uh, Howard Hughes mm -hmm. too when she was young. I think Howard Hughes designed or tried to design a special bra for her for one of the movies. That's right. So, I think yeah. we did a show about Howard yeah. Hughes, and I think I brought that up. Yeah. That he was trying to... Trying to get support that would fucking lift them. And yeah. Them to, and, and to make I sure laugh, but that's a pretty important... Yeah. I mean, you they know... They didn't have that shit back then. That's what I mean. And uh, laugh if you want about fucking Hughes. Howard had multiple head injuries, and uh, which fucking been there. Uh, but then he also kind of had OCD and uh, some some other things that a lot of pressure on him. He ended up going crazy. Drugs had a lot to do with it too. But he was a brilliant engineer, and he was just yeah. tutored at home how to be an, an aeronautical engineer and a structural engineer. He he was he was a rich dude. He, I wouldn't say he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, but he got his dad's money and then he'd like fucking multiplied it ten times with a bunch of real wise purchases. I would have loved to have fucking uh, had the opportunities that fucking Hughes had. They didn't make him happy, though. He'd walk away from it and go disappear from his empire. Where the fuck's Howard? We don't know where fuck's Howard's is. You know, and he'd show up later, you know, living like a bum, been gone for a year, you know. I mean, everybody's got their own issues. Just away from it. Yeah. It's like you can never know. Right. Like you look at somebody else's life and be like, man, I want that life. Yeah. Like I would do this, that, and the other thing. But you don't know what the fuck yeah. is going on in that person's head. Howard, you don't know like what they've been through. You're not that person. Yeah. So like you don't know. Howard was a great race car driver. Uh, he could race. He could fly airplanes. Great pilot. Uh, engineered a bunch of stuff. Came up with ideas for heat-seeking missiles later on. Uh, knew about jets and fucking ultrasonic stuff. Um he had a fucking high-speed World War II airplane he was working on. It was kind of like a P-38 Lightning with, you know, uh, fucking two fuselages in a central cell with fucking counter-rotating props. And it was going to be bad. It didn't make it in time for the war, but it was going to be really good. It was kind of like a P-38 Lightning. Uh, 
Hughes Aircraft came up with a bunch of really cool shit. And he bought RKO Pictures. And that's how... He bought RKO Pictures, I think, when he was in his late teens. If I remember, or early 20s. And he did it so he could date movie stars. And he would hire movie stars and never let them make movies. He'd just date them. Sometimes then he got where he just hire him and then never date him. He's like collecting them like he's a collector. She's wondering when she's going to make her first, when, when she's going to make her first movie. She never will. He's just got her in a damn apartment fucking waiting for two or three years. A movie never happens. All kinds he's of like, weird shit. He's like, here, you just stay in the closet. Stay like, in the closet. you stay, stay in the box. Stay in the box. He was a fucking woman collector. Well, yeah. He would forget about it. He would forget about him. <laughs> it's like collecting Star Wars action figures. Right. And just, you have to keep yeah, them in the box about them. to keep their value. Now, he did some real important shit. And this is the weird thing. This is the fucking biggest impact Howard Hughes ever had. He had his own private security company to keep an eye on all these women that he was hiring. Okay? And to do other shit for him. He would only hire Mormons uh, for a bunch of reasons. He liked Mormons. He said they were real trustworthy. Those guys did everything they could to fight the FBI because they were protecting Hughes from the FBI because the FBI was trying to put FBI was trying to put fucking um, bugs in his fucking phones and do all this counter espionage shit. Howard Hughes's security apparatus was the fucking blueprint for all modern intelligence agencies in terms of like the FBI and the CIA and everything. They, they 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 had to up their game and they they modernized because of Hughes security. Uh, and Hughes Security would be like the fucking model security agency and counterintelligence agency for the fucking world. He was looking quite a man. Oracle said, Jenny, I thought the same thing. Tampons and pads are for menstrual blood. We all know it. Admit yeah. it. Right, exactly. Porn and blue stuff. That's the blue stuff. I know, and they use that for diapers and stuff too. Which yeah. I was, It's like, you know, I know they don't want to be gross and everything like yeah. that, but come on. Uh, John Smith said would still be hard for a gay leading man in Hollywood now i.e. allegedly Hugh Jackman and other confirmed bachelors yeah but nobody I'm not, cares well no but I'm not yeah. saying that it's not it's, well especially if you're like an A-lister it might be kind of harder then like but it's not anything like it used to be like yeah. back in the old days you couldn't even like have any whiff of anything that you might not be totally heterosexual or like I said communist like, well, that too, but yeah. and we'll get into that because there was a little yeah. bit of that with Bella Lugosi and a little bit with Boris Karloff too because they were both kind of more leftist union kind of people, so they kind of got in trouble with that. But, um, yeah, the whole thing about that was like some actors back in the old days, um, they would the studio would make them marry somebody. They would legally make them marry somebody so nobody would, and they had really had to keep everything on the down low, which must have been exhausting. Yeah. Exhausting. I can't imagine. How do you but, compensate a woman for that? See, that's what I'm saying. It's like, well, what they would do... Now, I don't know if this happened a lot, but I know that it happened in a few situations. Like, because I've written about... <laughs> Uh, a couple true crime cases like uh, where like an actor got murdered or something and if that actor like the actor uh they thought he was gay but they would they married him off to a actress that was a lesbian okay so basically they were just kind of like they would match them i don't know if they did that all the time but i know they did that in a few cases where they're just kind of like hey she's not going to get married and you're not getting married so why don't you just marry each other and then do whatever you do whatever you want but it's like don't let anybody like take a picture of you doing it type of thing yeah you think you'd run out of lesbians i don't know about that i don't think you'd run out. i think i think i think gay men outnumber lesbians well, I wouldn't know what I. Well, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the numbers. I don't know what the numbers were like back then, and what they considered a lesbian. Well, they're just sometimes they would consider shit weird. In a weird way. Well, like I said, maybe it's just like women that didn't were maybe not even necessarily lesbians, but didn't really have any interest in getting get married, married or anything like that, or any kind of like you know conventional kind right. of shit. So they're just like, well, why don't you they just legally marry this guy, and then you can just go yeah. do whatever you want as long as, as right. long as nobody sees you. Right. I kind of feel like it was probably that kind of situation. Yeah, I'll pay you a certain amount. You can live here, and you can date. You can do whatever you want. I think that's more mostly what it was. Yeah, I yeah, I think that's probably what it was. But I mean, the studios back in the old days, you know, it's not the same now. But the studios back in the old days had an amazing, like, uh, amazing amount of power yeah. over the actors because a lot of the actors, like, particularly in the golden era, they kept them under contract. Like, so we you also, couldn't, you couldn't just, you weren't like a free agent. You couldn't just like go and do movies for another studio. You had to do this many movies, and they kind of had control over your whole entire life. They're yeah. like, you're not allowed to be in public doing this 
this, that, and the other thing. And in, you Cal know. And in California, they had an amazing amount of power over the police and the court system. That and, too. And they and covered and up murders and all yeah, kinds of everything. stuff. Everything. Yep. They covered up murders, all kinds of stuff. Covered up murders. They could fucking help with the elections. They did everything. They were almost kind of merged with the California state government and its law enforcement apparatus. And then that, that got bigger in World War II when Hollywood and the federal government joined for, uh, for the purposes of fighting World War II, which a bunch of shit happened there, too. And the only fucking stipulation the feds gave Hollywood was keep that commie crap out of the damn movies. And they did. Because a lot of the people that were in the movies and behind them were communist. But they said, if you, you can merge with us if you just keep that out of the movies. And during World War II, it was nothing but fucking war propaganda. And then afterwards, it was peace propaganda to get all them damn savages to fucking get a job at a damn factory and settle down and have kids in a fucking house and a picket fence. Because those two were too dangerous to just be left running around. That, that's a whole other story right there. And they knew all about it, seen the documentations, there's whole fucking programs about it. How to re-civilize those dudes after World War II and bring them in and make them disappear. Uh, I was going to read some. Uh, let's see, hold on. Who just said it? I just saw it. And now I can't find it. We said, oh, uh, John Smith said, uh, take in that Liberace denied he was gay until his dying breath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was not, yes. Okay. Was the, yeah. I mean, you know. He was trying to keep the dream alive. Like I said, that's kind of like fans. sad, though. That makes me really sad. It's, yeah. it's like that you just have to deny like you your fucking personhood your entire life. That's yeah, like you, really shitty. If you're new to the show and you haven't listened to the other shows, we've mentioned Liberace quite a bit because that was actually Evil Knievel's hero. Uh, he fucking Evil Knievel loved Liberace. Everybody knew he was gay. But Liberace would never admit to being gay because all his fans were middle-aged and older, overweight women who fucking loved him. And he did not want to let them down. And I respect that. I, res I, I respect it. He did not want to let his fans down. Although those bitches would have loved him anyway. They were on fag hag status anyway. I mean, it wouldn't they, have they, mattered. He was just trying. I, they he, probably knew. Oh, I'm anyways. sure they did. I'm sure they did. But they they were in they were in the cognitive fucking dissonance. They were in a fucking fantasy. They were in a fantasy that one day Liberace would make, might fucking love them. You know. It, but no, man. It's like, well, I'm the, gay, but for you, you're so special you're so that I'll special. make an exception. Yeah, right. That's I kind of right, think yeah. that's what that's like right. a certain type of fantasy. Sure. Yeah, this, yeah. And I don't think it's that unusual. Yeah. Like I said, it's not weird. That's, a lot of people <laughs> have that. Um, Danny Rowling said Frankenstein's monster is way cooler than any vampire, and he's green, great color. Yeah, I'm gonna say. I don't know. I really don't want to like pit these two against each other, no. but I'm kind of like I'm different. I'm less of a vampire person. I do like a lot of vampire movies. You would think like being all goth and everything that you'd be more into vampires, but to be honest, I'm kind of more into the Frankenstein movies. Although the the all the Dracula ones are good too. I'm going to say that. And I like Boris Karloff. Just in my personal opinion, I thought Boris Karloff was hotter, but they're both yeah. kind of they're both hot. It's just, it, like I said, it's kind of like a Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing situation. Both of them are hot. I don't know. They're all hot. Is that weird? No. Uh, all of them are hot. I don't know if I could rank them. I think, I think they're all cool. I mean, you know what I mean? I, you know, I'm not attracted to them. I am. I like yeah, that kind yeah, of thing. Well, yeah. <laughs> of course. I like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I told you one of my earliest crushes, I know some people think this is weird. One of my earliest crushes when I was a kid was um, Ted Cassidy, the guy that played Lurch on the Adam yeah Family yeah show. you told me that that's funny yeah, yeah that's <laughs> i was like super into that yeah <laughs> like the one episode where he's like where uh wednesday is teaching him to ballet dance mm -hmm. and he has like a tutu on yeah i was just kind of like oh my goodness you you like that? <laughs> i don't know why i got so into that but i was just kind of like ridiculous that was i know but it's like hey the heart wants what it wants. Okay. I'm just saying. It's just like, I was into that. I still think he's like, I know he's dead now, but um, yeah, I was like, I don't know. I'm like, I'm, I like that big, tall, cadaverous, corpsey thing. I, I like that. Okay. I, don't, I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> but um, I guess, well, I guess because I'm a horror girl and I like a lot of that horror kind of iconography. So I always thought, I always thought Boris Karloff was super hot. Plus he has like that voice and mm -hmm. he just looks like that. He's got that great head like that yeah. weird looking face What's I funny love about that shit fucking Karloff is that Karloff I would have never known it but he's half Indian his dad was from India 
Uh, he, I don't think he's half Indian. He's more like a qu- well, well, a quarter. I, mean, I thought his I thought his mom was. They're both British Empire people. Yeah, the mom. Was his mom, British. I think. His mom, half I think, Indian. was half Indian. Half Indian. Okay. Oh, and maybe his dad was also half Indian. Yeah. I can't remember. I've got it like yeah. written down in there. Because uh, they went on that. He was, he was very like, dark as yeah. a child. Yeah, I saw pictures of him as a kid. Said early on, he got a lot of roles that were what were considered like ethnic roles. Yeah. Like if, well, we have this dude and he's not a white guy, you got to play him. He was like, okay. So there was a lot of that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's like, hey, we got we have a, like an Arab sheik or dude, whatever. You gotta play that. Yeah. yeah. We got a Mexican guy, you're going to play that. You know? So he's like, okay. So that was, that was his first jobs. But he was a great actor. And really, he could look like anything. You, you know, you dressed it up right. I never would have thought. I just thought he was a British guy. He didn't look Indian to me. But you could make him look Indian. Or you yeah. could make him look fucking real Anglo-Saxon. It didn't matter. He was a good actor for that. I mean, what a great fucking face that dude had. Well, he kind of had a, almost kind of like a, like a Greek or a Roman statue. You know, he had a real strong nose. Kind of had a he, looked like a, he looked like a... he looked like an emperor or something. Like a Roman emperor. Yeah, it was just a very, very distinctive yeah. like face that he had. Yeah. You know what's crazy? And I think I just learned this today. Because I guess I always perceived Boris Karloff as being taller than Bella Lugosi. That is not the case. No. Bella Lugosi is actually taller. Oh, okay. Uh, Bella Lugosi was actually, I believe, six foot one. Oh, I didn't, and I didn't think he Boris was that Kar- tall. Yeah, I guess it was because I'm so used to seeing Boris as Frankenstein's monster, and they put yeah. like those big lifts in his yeah. shoes and like made him like real big and hulking. I mean, he was a big guy, but he wasn't. I think Bella was a little bit taller. I thought Bella would be like five seven, five eight. No, it's like I was actually surprised okay. about that too because okay. he's actually much bigger. Right. Oh, you know what's crazy? I was just watching like right before we did the show. I was watching a documentary on YouTube about uh, Bella Lugosi, and they have his son. Um, you know, who's a grown man now, obviously, but he's like talking about his dad and he was talking about like all the roles that his dad played like on the stage and stuff. And he's like, oh, and um, Bella Lugosi played Jesus. And he was like the best Jesus, like in this theater production, like company that they had. And they had like photos of it. And I'm like, oh my God, he makes a great Jesus. He looks really good. Okay. Like all the, all the, um, photos that they have him it's like he had the, like the crown of thorns on and the hair and everything like the beard mm-hmm. and i was like holy crap he looks fantastic he looks really really good i thought yeah. he he made like a really good jesus because when you say that like it sounds we everybody's so used to like seeing him as dracula but when you see um because they had all these publicity stills of him from other roles that he played on the stage like when he was much younger and in some of them, you wouldn't even, unless you looked really close, you wouldn't even really know that that was Bela yeah. Lugosi. You know what I'm right. saying? Because everyone so associates him with, like, the Dracula look yeah. when he was actually, like, a little bit older. Yeah, as I said before, he was actually, actually, Lugosi was a fucking stage actor. That's where most of his work was. That's where his, that's where his character was built. And evidently, as he got older, he always... Um, thought of himself as a, as a stage actor and would remember those times because that's that's where he was built you know and that's where his that's where most of his time was done yeah I so, mean that's just Karloff started out, out like that too so yeah Seth B says my first crush was Rocky Horror's Frankenfurter men in makeup just do something for me <laughs> yeah also hot uh, also hot Tim Curry in that um Lars Ulrich said, oh, I've been meaning to watch this. There's a movie called The Sorcerers. It's free on YouTube. One of the last with Karloff. Might be the last movie. I don't know if it was actually, because I know that they released some, like, posthumously, like, after he died. But that might be the last. Is that William Friedkin? I want to say that's a William Friedkin movie. Same guy that did The Exorcist. But, um, yeah, I've been wanting to see that, actually. Zach says, oh, shit, Karloff's aunt was the chick they based The King and I off of. Yep, that's true. Uh, Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah, so it's a, gr- a great fucking movie. It is. I yeah, I really like King that movie. If you guys haven't seen The King and I with Yule Brenner, you'll fucking love it. It's a musical. It's, it's really good. Yeah. I mean, the thing about, about an it. an English teacher who goes to fucking Siam, which is a country no longer exists. I think it's, it's probably Thailand. Probably yeah. Thailand or Myanmar. Yeah, Thailand. And try to teach him how to be civilized and speak English. And fucking. And Yule Brenner plays uh, the King of Siam, and all kinds of shit happens. It's good. And in the end, they get married. They get married, which is based on something that actually happened, and that was that was Karloff's yeah. aunt. Karloff's aunt, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's his mom's sister, yeah. I think. Um, 
Segita, is that how you pronounce your name? Uh, or Segita, like Sagittarius? Uh, I loved them all, but I think my favorite is Vincent Price. I mean, Vincent Price is also fucking awesome. I just, all of those guys. I love all of those guys. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. John Smith said, my first crush was a puppet. Kira the Gelfling from Dark Crystal. Make of that what you will. I remember that. I get it. Like, she, yeah, she was pretty cute. And she kind of looked like a person. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I used to think those things were cute too. But you, just, you see them recently, and they just don't look. They just don't look like anything. They're little puppets. They actually kind of look low quality. Well, they are little puppets. Yeah. I don't know if I'd say that. That's that was Jim Henson, man. That was like top of the line. I saw them quite recently, though, and they. they I was like, man, they don't look as good as I remembered them looking in terms of quality. The Skeksis looked pretty good, though. I still like Ske- those. Yeah. The Skeksis were like yeah. looked really awesome. Although that it was everything, it was a very repetitive movie. I couldn't get through like the first twenty or thirty minutes. I had to turn it off. The dialogue was real repetitive, of chanting, sing songy. Maybe I could make another run at it, but I, tr- I tried to. Yeah, because you might have been in a bad movie. Yeah, I tried to watch a Dark Crystal again, and I could I only got about twenty minutes into it. And I was like, well, we started good. watching it again because remember, like, didn't like Netflix did that series, yeah. like a continuation of it. Yeah, which evidently didn't do well. Even though, like, a lot of people seem to be talking about it, like did when it, it first started. Okay. Uh, Sarah says The Tingler a great movie by Vincent Price yeah we reviewed that Weird, not yeah. too long ago I think it was just like a couple months back we talked about The Tingler I have to say my favorite Price movie would have been um, I Am Legend I have to see it again or Last Man on Earth Last Man on Earth I mean yeah it's based on I Am Legend yeah, yeah. but yeah it's. Um, I mean Vincent Price was good in everything Yeah. I'd probably say House on Haunted Hill but I don't know he was in so much good stuff that it's kind of hard to say kind of hard to say uh, all right, so are we ready to get into this? Oh, I, I had a couple. We were into this. Well, we are kind of, okay. but we haven't even got into the biographies okay. or anything like that yet. So uh, I had a couple shout outs. I think we mentioned this on the matinee show yesterday, but I wanted yeah. to mention it again on the main show. Uh, thank you to Louie for sending us the Steelbook edition of Sicario. Yeah. Which we really need to review. Yeah, I've watched it and the second one. It's just we that really we never review reviewed that. it. Yeah. We'll do it. So we will do that. Oh, and also I want to give a shout out to our patron, Liam, who increased his patronage oh, great. this week. Thank you. So thank, thank you very, you much, very much for that. We do have a patron, Patreon, yeah. you know, if you're interested. And if you go on our Patreon, you can, one, I tell you like what all the shows are that are coming up that week. Um, also for my scare salon and crime immemorial thing, I started like adding that in there too. And you can vote on the topic for whatever the next week's uh, show is and the movie for the movie retrospective. So you yeah. can vote on those as well. And of course, Super Chats are active. You can drop a Super Chat right there in the damn comment section. And I have a Twitch that I just opened. Twitch account. It's called uh, Tom13 o'clock. And um, I've been playing some video games. We've had some people pop in. It's usually in the what I would consider to be the, the, the morning time or the afternoon time that I play. I've been playing... Um, right now I'm playing um, Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider Legend. And after that I'm going to play Anniversary and then I'm going to do Underworld. which is That's classic Tomb, it's classic Tomb Raider stuff. Um, you can drop chats to me live and we can talk. And uh, I got headphones on with the damn microphone so we can talk live. And because... Uh, there's less people following. I think there's maybe only like fucking 20 people over there. Uh, I can talk about things over there that I, I can't talk about here. I don't want the channel to get banned. Because i got to watch out for the fucking business. You know what I'm talking about? But uh, I've had some decent questions asked to me over, over there about uh, fucking current events and stuff. And what I think. Okay. Let me go get another. Uh, Legend of Hell House. Actually, Legend of Hell House, yeah. now that you bring that up, is easily one of my favorite films of the 1970s. Yeah. Easily. I mean, that's a great fucking movie. I love that movie so much. And the book is good, too, if you haven't read it. It's just called Hell House by Richard Matheson, who is, again, like one of my favorite horror writers. So, all right. So let's get into Let's talk about Bela Lugosi first, because that's just uh, happened that he was the first one that I put in my notes. Uh, I wasn't going alphabetical, or I guess I went alphabetical by the first names, not their last names. So, you know. So, all right. So Bela Lugosi, that's obviously not his real name, although he is, uh, of, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher this, because uh, his actual name is Bela Ferenc, Ferenc Desoblasco. So his first name is actually Bela, it's Bela, 
um, even though a lot of people just say Bella because I think he lost a little accent. Lugosi, actually, he got that last name because the town that he was born in in Hungary uh, was called Lugos. So he was just like naming himself after the town that he came from, like Leonardo da Vinci or whatever. So he actually grew up in a pretty uh, middle class family, like middle class, upper middle class in Hungary. So his dad had started out as a bakery and actually like baker and like ran a successful like bakery business and made quite a bit of money doing that. Uh, his dad's name was Itzvan, by the way. And so he decided, well, I made a lot of money doing bakery stuff, so I'm going to like try to move up the ladder, I guess. So he invested in like a savings bank uh, and kind of set that up with him and a few partners and they actually had a really successful banking business. So he set that up in the late 1800s, uh, which is right around the time when Bela Lugosi was born. So uh, the thing about it though, is that Bella's dad was real uh, strict and was real very like conventional. He was very kind of like, you know, he was very successful in the bakery trade and then the banking trade. So he wanted his kids to go into, and I guess a lot of parents are like this, but um, you know, he's like, I want my kids to go into like a trade or something where they're gonna be successful and make a lot of money. I don't want them doing weird shit or anything like that. And he was very, very much like that. So, um, Bella, though, he seemed like, uh, he's very intelligent, but he just didn't really like school. Um, he was just kind of more of an unstructured person. He was much more into, like, singing and theater and all this other kind of stuff, which, obviously, his very strict father had absolutely no patience with. Uh, they said at one point, and this is from a biography of his, they said in school once they asked him what uh, job do you want to get when you know in the future when you grow up and he said i'm going to be a highway bandit <laughs> so you know what i mean it's not not great so like i said he was just very into like theater kind of stuff he was a like a guys who liked that i was theater like school that. kid i yeah. was like that yeah uh so his dad was like jesus christ really so there was that there was, there was a lot of like friction in the household it seems like now interestingly though his dad died suddenly when Bella was just 12 years old. So this is hardcore. I mean, Bella left home at 12. Damn. Um, because, you know, his dad was I dead. It. I couldn't imagine 12 it. 12 years old. I don't even remember being 12 years yeah. old. That was a long I'm time ago. I'm not even sure I was a human being at 12. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Most people weren't. Yeah. The fact that you would actually leave home at 12 He's like, well, you know, my dad was dead, so I had to go get a job and, like, right. try and support the family. 12 years old. Right. So so he walks 300 miles uphill in the snow. I don't know. I'm, I'm adding that detail. To, like, the nearest industrial city and just got jobs. It's like he worked in a mine. Uh, he worked on a railroad. It was, he did, like, all that kind of shit, like, when he was a fucking kid, like, in a teenager. 300 miles. Sleeping on the side of the road. <laughs> Probably did. Yeah. 12 years old. I can't imagine. Like, nobody would want a 12-year-old kid fucking... to do that nowadays. What country was this again? Romania? Yeah, well, um, Hungary. Hungary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's where he was born. That was deep, deep back in the old school honky motherland. That's how they did shit back then, man. That was like, that was the, mis that was Mississippi of Europe. Okay. I understand. You just did what you, you had did to what do. You had to do. They weren't, I mean, the yeah. man of the house was yeah. dead, and so you were the next oldest son. Yeah. I'm imagining, so you're like, well, I'm only 12, but yeah. I shit got like shit that to probably, do. Shit like that was probably normalized then anyway. That's what I'm saying. It's like, yeah, it sounds like a big deal to us, one. but yeah, I'm sure it happened lots. Yeah, it happened lots. But that's the thing. It's like everybody, you just... Yeah. And it's not like... You know, it, it's easy to, like, look back on it now from our, like, cushy modern era yeah. where, you know, you don't have to do that, thankfully. But it's like back then, that was just, oh, well, you just had to buck up and do it because you didn't really have a choice. You know what I mean? Yeah. Those days can come back. They can come again. Yeah, I'm not saying that, but yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, I'm not saying it wasn't hardcore because it was. Yeah. But I'm just saying that a lot of people probably had to yeah. do that kind it of was, crap. It was culturally normalized because it's easier to suffer in mass. If you're in the army... Suffering on your own is pretty bad. If you're yeah, suffering with fucking thousands of your fucking friends, you're all being punished for the fucking sins of the fathers or whatever. And the fucking <laughs> battalion commander says, fuck you. It's easier to suffer in mass. 
than it is. So when you see other kids doing it and everybody else is doing it, you're like, it gives you permission to do it. Well, because yeah. I think that a lot of the depression and stuff like that that comes out of bad circumstances yeah. is when you're in bad circumstances and everybody else seems to be good, doing so, okay. Yeah, it's a lot so harder. it's just kind of like yeah. you're seeing all this, like, why can't I have that? Yeah. So there's like some resentment and like yeah. wondering what you're doing wrong. So if everybody is in the same shitty situation, then yeah, it's shitty, but it's yeah. not as shitty because you're not comparing yourself everybody's doing shitty so you don't feel as bad because you're not comparing yourself mm -hmm. you know what i mean i yeah i've kind of seen like yeah so it might not have been like that like back in the old days but yeah so he's 12 years old and he's working in mines and railroad and stuff like that for several years i guess well like when he was a teenager now when he was 18 apparently his sister uh who i guess was a little bit older now, she was married, and she got um, Bella, like, a place on, like, a traveling theater troupe. Because that was what he was really into, and that's what he wanted to do. So, he actually started acting on the stage in 1902. So, as far as they know, like, his earliest known performances, like, on the stage were with kind of just little theaters here and there, like, in 1903, 1904, or somewhere around there. And he was in a bunch of plays. He was usually small roles, like, little operas and stuff like that. And then, like, later on, he would go on and do uh, Shakespeare. He was in, like, in a lot of Shakespeare plays as well. Now, he actually moved to Budapest in 1911 and actually got a spot with the National Theater of Hungary. So he was there for several years from 1913 to 1919. Now, although it's very, and I've seen other, I saw Roddy McDowell on um, talking about, was it Roddy McDowell or it was somebody? No, it wasn't Roddy McDowell. It was, um, what's that actor's name? Ray Walton, I think his name is. Roddy McDowell was on the Boris Karloff documentary. But Ray Walton was talking about being in something with uh, Bela Lugosi and he's like, Bela Lugosi would always say, I was, uh, what did he say? I was like the Cary Grant of Hungary's Royal National Theater or something like that. That doesn't appear to be the case. He was in a shit ton of plays around this time period, but he wasn't, um, I don't know if he was like famous throughout the region or anything like that, but he was in a shit he ton just of known. stuff. He was known yeah. like in that area, but they, it was like small roles, supporting roles. I don't think he had any leads or anything like that. Bela knew, knew what he was doing. You fucking, yeah. You don't sell fucking steak. You sell the sizzle. Right. You know what I mean? He's like, man, back in back in Hungary, I was the shit. Yeah. Uh, of course, that's what you do. Everybody knew who I was. Yeah, everybody knew who I was. It's like they're not yeah. going to check, so yeah, right. might as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but yeah, so yeah. The, there is kind of a thing where it's like, yeah, he was like the most famous. Like, I'm the John yeah. Barrymore of like, yeah. or whatever. And they're just like, <laughs> he was in a lot of stuff. I'm not yeah. I'm not like trying to discount, but they, you know, he was kind of like blowing it up. And I think he knew that he was too. So then World War One comes along and he was actually uh, in the Austro-Hungary Austro Army. Uh, from 1914 to 1916, he was an inf infantryman and then yeah. uh, got up to lieutenant. Yeah. And he got a medal for, like, he got some uh, wounds while he was on the Russian front. So the he got a medal, Hungarian medal Empire for that. was actually a fucking proud empire. It was around for a long time. Right, bef right, be right before, uh, you know, World War I happened and fucking, like, a dozen empires, a lot of them fucking centuries old, all vanished. One of them was Austro-Hungarian Empire. But they were a good army and a, and a decent empire. So him serving there as an infantry lieutenant, that's no mean feat. Yeah, that's that, that's good. Real good. They were, they were a good outfit. Yeah, so he was there for two years. Like yeah. I said, he got wounded on the Russian front, got a medal for that. Yep. Then he goes back to regular life and then started acting in Hungarian silent films. Now, they, actually, a few of these do survive, um, he wasn't going by Bela Lugosi at that point. He was going by the name Aristide Olt. Um, he went under different pseudonyms, like, before he actually, like, established himself. And like I said, and I don't think you were here when I said it, but uh, the last name Lugosi came from the town that he was born. Like, okay. the name of the town was Lugos. Yeah. So that's where he was just, like, paying, paying homage to the town that he was born at. English names mostly had to do with jobs, being a porter, a smith, shit like that. A lot of other Latin-based names have to do with where you're, where you were from, where your last place you were from. That's what I said, just like Leonardo yeah. da Vinci, yeah, and shit right. like that. So that, that's just because da Vinci was not his last name. That was right. that was where he was where from. from. His name was just Leonardo. Yeah, he didn't have a last name. That but yeah, that's where a lot of last names came from. I'm not, like really fascinated by that. I love that yeah. kind of like I love that stuff. But when you think about it, it's, it's elevated slang. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. 
So you'd be like, <laughs> Jenny from Deltona. Jenny from Daytona. I'm this from Daytona. Jenny Daytona. from Daytona. I mean, it's not, there's only like 20 Jenny miles. Jenny de Daytona. Daytona. Yeah. That'd be some sexy ass Latin shit. De Daytona. God. <laughs> Genevieve de Daytona. <laughs> That's my that's my fancy Renaissance artist yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fucking yeah, it's like Daytona. It sounds real, like I said, continental. But you actually go to the place, and it's like, oh my god, this is like a redneck shithole. Well, it's, it's not race. that bad. No, it's, it's not that bad anymore. It's not that bad no. anymore. It, it, it's uh, not as bad as when I grew up. That's the way there. it was decades ago. It's a racetrack with a with uh, the downtown area and uh, suburbs. Mm. And a lot of housing, uh, there's there's also new housing complexes that have sprung up in the last few decades. They were nice. They were kind of like the one we just left. Yeah. You're like that. Lots of those. But yeah. I mean, you know, when I was growing up there, it was like... Right. was hitting there in those days, yeah. Not, not much, no. Uh, like I said, it was all country bars. Right. <laughs> so there's that. Yeah, Zach said, my ancestors from Norway had their last name come from the farm they were born on. I kind of feel like that was yeah. mostly kind of the thing. It was either your job or where, the, you, were from. Or where you were from. Yeah. So, like I said, Bela Lugosi was just honoring that because that was the name of the town that he came from. And his name is, uh, you know, very hard to pronounce, like his actual birth name for, for people like us. Now, after that, uh, he actually had to flee Hungary because, as I said, he was uh, very, like, a left-wing uh, sympathizer. And when Hungary, like, I guess the communist government took over, like, the they were trying to do, like, the communist revolution, and it got defeated. So he was like, yeah, I gotta get the fuck out of here. I'm gonna get assassinated or executed or whatever. So he took off um, in 1919. So he actually went to Vienna, and then he went to Berlin, and then he started acting in German silent films. Now, uh, during this time period, his first wife of... Count him five that he had over the time of his life. Not judging, Boris Karloff also had five wives. It just, uh, it happened back then. So uh, his Pop, first... These are popular men. Yeah. You know, well, and Bella Lugosi... Out and they get another one. Bella Lugosi, <laughs> um, according to his relatives and friends and, like, people who knew him that I've seen, like, interviewed, they said, yeah, he was a realist, particularly when he was younger. He was a real ladies' man. But they said that he was a... They said that he was a lovely, lovely person, but in relationships he tended to be very very jealous and he tended to be very um domineering so sometimes like women that couldn't hang with that they'd be like yeah i don't like this situation and they'd be like taken off it's an so, eastern personality yeah, yeah 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 they said they said he was very very jealous yeah. like you just like the woman like yeah. talks to another man he's like oh no oh, we're, not shit, having, we're not having that yeah shit. we're not having that so a little bit like that but yeah. but i mean everything else like people said that but they were like he was like a good dude like he wasn't you know he wasn't a shitty person or anything but he was a little bit like that so uh his first wife at this point like after he went to germany uh his wife left him and went back to her parents uh, and filed for a divorce. So, like I said, that was the, I think that was the first of his uh, eventual five wives. So, at this point, Bella comes to the United States on a merchant ship. Like, he worked on a merchant ship. I think he was, like, an engineer. In 1920, he worked his way over to the U.S. And he landed in New Orleans and eventually worked his way up to New York City. 1928, he declares his intention to become a U.S. citizen, and in 1931, he was naturalized as a U.S. citizen. Now, as I said, he arrives in America. He's six foot one, which, like I said, if you see Dracula, I always thought he was a shorter motherfucker. Yeah, I was thinking five. He's not six eight, foot one. Five, yeah, six he doesn't one. look that tall. Yeah, six. Uh, they said when he first got here, he was six foot one, 180 pounds. That, you know, so that's kind man, of that's those, kind in, of a big dude. In those days, that that's huge. That's a big dude. He was a big in dude. The, in those days, that's huge. Mm -hmm. Especially for an Eastern European. That's huge. Yeah, so he was a big fucker. So when he By came... By today's standards, it's 6'4". Because fucking average heights have gone up amongst, uh, amongst you know, like Caucasians. You know, not well, so, better nutrition, yeah, better, you know, right. childhood uh, health, right. things like not that. Not so much against fucking, like you say, Central Americans and stuff, you know, the, 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 you know. Me coming up in fucking South America, you know, Central American Maya type people, they're short. And, you know, average age, average height in the United States is going down because so many Central Americans are moving in. There's a little short little dudes, man. I can't hate. I'm also five, three, short. I'm five, also four, short. I am right. also five foot three. Yeah. So. Right. Not, not. Go down to a Mexican restaurant here. It's a real Mexican restaurant. 
and I see these dudes from damn Nicaragua and fucking El Salvador and shit coming in, and some of these dudes, I'm like, I, I feel huge, and I'm, I'm five foot six, I feel fucking huge. These dudes are like five feet tall, some of them. They come here to work on these farms, and they're just short, man. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it'll do. Well, like yeah. I said, there's not a lot you can do about it. Yeah. Like some height things, yeah, yeah, it does have to do with, uh, you know, childhood nutrition and things yeah. like that. But a lot of it's genetic, to be honest. I think in I think in Central America, you know, with the Maya and the Aztec and everything, is uh, had to do with basically selective breeding. You know, they were, well, well, accidental selective breeding. They were sacrificing all their best people to fucking, you know. Quetzalcoatl and shit at certain times, so they took the tallest ones first. So being shorter meant you were least likely to be fucking executed, to be ex- sacrificed. So it's probably then, better to be short. And it's yeah, it's better to be short. Now fucking we got Khan, <coughs> Khan of Atslan. I don't know if he's in here now. He's my buddy from Tijuana. He's like 6'2". All right? He is truly Khan. Fucking, <laughs> you know what I mean? Big motherfucker. Big Mexican. You know, and they do have some. But... Probably, you know, fucking royal bloodlines, that motherfucker, you know? Because everyone, every Central American I see here, you know, when you go... Mexico <coughs> broke up in a bunch of parts, you know, and some of them were ended up being El Salvador and Honduras and Nicaragua. Those guys were all short, pretty much. Like I said, no shame in being short, because yeah. I am also short. Yeah. So, I'm not going to... They're like shorter you. than us. We're it's, tall. It takes a lot, like, to yeah. be shorter than me, because I'm yeah. pretty fucking short. Oh. Um, John Smith said, "Actors never lie about height." I'm totally convinced Tom Cruise is six foot two. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. Wears, you caught that too, right? He just no. wears height releasing trousers. Yeah, less yeah, yeah. Eight people. I'm telling you, people. I've tried to figure out how tall Tom Cruise actually is. I'm five six. I think Tom. Cruise you need my- to meet him in person and make sure that he doesn't have any lifts in his. He's going to have magic shoes on and everything, but I, I and per- stand next to him yeah. and then we'll discover. Yeah, him. I'm pretty sure Tom Cruise is about my size, probably about five six. I'm pretty sure. I, yeah, but, and like I said, there's yeah. no shame in that. That's no. so silly. It's no. like just tell people. He has good physicality. He's and he's a fucking great actor. That's what fucking, I mean. And, no one's and gonna care. He and fucking actually, delivered, man. His movie's still out there playing, making money. Fucking uh, Top Gun Two is still out there making money. Anybody that would care yeah. that it's like, well, I'm not yeah. going to go see Tom Cruise's movie because he's only he's five foot short, six. short. I ain't going to see his It's movie. just like, you don't need those people's money anyway. <laughs> right, yeah. So don't worry about it. Right. Seriously. Yeah. I mean. Uh, so, yeah. You know I love you, Tom. You know you're watching, You know I love you, Tom. It's all right. Wouldn't that be funny if Tom Cruise is watching? Yeah, and he comes in. And it would be. I love you too. It wouldn't be. Qu- it wouldn't be as funny as if Steven Seagal was watching this. That would be yeah. hilarious. Now Steven Seagal is fucking big. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not shitting three. on Steven Seagal's yeah. height because right. yeah, he's big. He's big, yeah. But he's I, just not the martial artist. Fucking people, he claims. And if to be. he keeps going the way he's going, he's gonna be as big around as yeah, he is tall. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. he's gonna be as wide as he is tall. So I'm just saying. He's swimming in whole pools of Asian experience. Fucking energy drink. We're having an Asian experience. Yeah, We're having an Asian have experience. A, I love you too, baby. Yeah, I'm gonna have an Asian experience. Me and you. But <laughs> that fucking commercial is awesome. Do you know how much a can, a sealed can of Asian experience goes for on eBay? How much? $120. Holy shit. Yeah. And they had a dude open one up and drink one. And he says, it's gone bad. Yeah, that was on Cinemassacre. Yeah, it's pretty bad. That guy that's on there. It's not James, but it's like the other guy yeah. that's on there all the time with the glasses. It's $120. He's a big fan of like Steven Seagal, and he actually like bought that and drank it. Yeah, and then drank one, and it had gone bad. I'm sure it probably tasted like ass, like even when it was fresh, because... Well, you, you know, don't like energy drinks. I don't like energy drinks. They all taste like ass. They all kind of taste like pot, sweet tarts. That's so. what I mean. They always taste like gross, like, like sweet them. like sweet tarts that somebody has yeah. kind of like put in their armpit. That's kind of what it tastes like. I liked like. the worst one. That was the Rockstar Cranberry. Everybody hated that one. I still liked it. Oh, I liked it. I can't imagine. Mm-hmm. Zach says, it's weird with Tom Cruise. He's attractive as fuck, but I'm not attracted to him. I don't know what it is. That's not weird. Um, I don't, I'm not willing. That's like th- Arnold. Arnold's like that. Well, the th- yeah, that's the Arnold's thing. Good it's look, like being really good looking and yeah. being like sex- sexy or like yeah. sexually attractive. That's two completely different things. Yeah. That's two completely different things. Yeah. I can admire somebody. It's like, oh yeah, they look like aesthetically, they look nice, but I wouldn't do them. Yeah. Just It's like they're not attractive to me. Yeah. Even though I admit that they're good looking. I'm not saying Tom Cruise is ugly. He's not. Yeah. But he's not sexy. 
It's like, I don't think. It's like Arnold. Arnold was always a good-looking guy. He had a fantastic body. But Arnold knew that he wasn't really sexy. Um, although there were a lot of women that fucking liked him, of course. You know what I mean? But there's just something about Arnold Schwarzenegger that doesn't evoke sexuality. Especially with, with the, most women, you know. Um, although I saw some photographs from Predator 1 of behind the scenes where he's grabbing the girl. You know the girl that was from the movie, Anna? Mm-hmm. They were taking a photo together. Yeah. And she obviously was just totally into fucking Arnold. And that was quite a, quite a sexy photo. But it was a behind-the-scenes photo. Yeah. Of them, like... He I'm was sure hu- some people he was are. Hugging sure. her. Like, right. obviously, some people find him sexy. Yeah. It I'm was, just saying that, like, I don't. It, it, it has to do with the way he's shot and filmed and the, the, and the, the characters that he's playing in the movie. It's just that in the movie, he's not sexy. But evidently, in person, he was. Some of those women that married him said that he was at, that he was addictive. That if you were around him, that's what I mean. It's like addicted. it's hard to like translate yeah. because it's like From you know you don't you don't know really them. Right. So it's like in real life, yeah. they might be super sexy yeah. because you know, like. Right. But like I said, that's why it's hard, and especially for yeah. women, I think, because we're less generally less visually oriented usually you have to like know a person yeah and it's like then it doesn't matter as right. much what they look like like you know if even if they're weird looking it's just kind of like if their personality is awesome then that'll yeah. make them like a lot more attractive to you yeah um so there's that like john smith said i thought this was kind of funny famously nicole kidman after divorce divorcing tom cruise was asked what she was looking forward to and she replied wearing heels again yeah <laughs> ice yeah, yeah, cold yeah, yeah. i'm like oh my god Ooh, what a I, bird. I like nicole kidman Whatever. Like that was so bitchy. I love it. He wouldn't let her wear heels. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I'm five six, and I f- it doesn't bother me if Jenny's fucking. And she's shorter than he me. He is not. Yeah, he is. I not don't. I don't have an issue. But you know what's funny is that I'm not gonna name any names. I got a friend that is. Yeah. He doesn't let her wear heels. I was like, which is crazy. I was like, what the fuck? You like heels? Yeah. I don't even like to wear he- wear heels because they're uncomfortable. I never but, had an issue with it because... But I have big platform boots, yeah. and I have some platform boots that do make me taller than him sometimes, yeah. and he has never, ever... I love it. To, he loves I love them. it. He loves them. Uh, it's just... So, uh, I never it's, had... It's I never had that insecurity, I guess. To me, it was always like a status symbol. Like, I felt like a goddamn big game hunter. You know what I mean? Fucking like, yeah, look what I landed. She's six feet. You know what I mean? It's it's like, I brought down a whale. You know what I mean? (laughs) But, uh, I get, and I think that happened in high school. I dated a Swedish girl who was like six two, but no one would date her in high school. Well, girls that are really tall. she was that tall. Yeah, they really have okay. a lot of problems. Because I had though. a I had a friend in high school that yeah. was six one, six two, and she had a fucking bitch of a time. Yeah, feet like huge feet, like feet like a fucking bigger than a man's feet. That was the only thing that was weird about it. And that was up in Brazil when I was in international high school, and she was like six two. She from Sweden. She was sweet, man, cute, good body, smart girl, Swedish girl, um, huge. And I gotta say that yeah. It took some getting used to. It was weird. But you're a teenager. You're just lucky to get some pussy. You know what I'm talking about? But sure. it's just, I didn't have that sizest. I think, to be honest with you, I think the dudes that complain so much about, oh, girls won't date me because I'm too short, are too yeah. hung up about being short. Yeah. And that comes across, like, that insecurity yeah. comes across, and that's what's turning people off. I don't yeah. think it's your shortness that's turning people off. It's I wrong. think it's your insecurity about it that's turning people we off. Knew a dude, we know a guy, I'm not going to name names, he was shorter than fucking me. He was maybe 5'1 or 5'2. And his girlfriend, he, she ended up dying later on at a young age from a brain tumor. She was about six feet tall. Yeah, she and, was way taller than I was. Yeah, right? and she was dating him. And the only thing wrong with him is that he, he was just fucking a know-it-all and just fucking to drive you fucking The crazy. only thing wrong with him is that he's kind of a douchebag. That's what I meant. He was a, a douchebag know-it-all. <laughs> like, Man, fucking stop it. And I she think was, that I kind of feel like he's one of those dudes that'd be like, oh, girls won't date me because I'm short. I'm like, no, they're not dating you because you're a douche. But they were dating him. But I know, I'm just, I'm just him. saying that he seems like somebody that would give off that yeah, energy. Yeah, they were dating him, and fucking these... And, okay, based on things that fucking have happened to me, 
from an early age, and based on what I've seen other short dudes, even dudes shorter than me, a lot of them end up with really tall women because women who are real tall are in a worse position than a guy who's short. Yeah, big time. Yeah, they, no, nobody dates them. Nope. It's fucking sad. This, they can be gorgeous. They just won't date them because they're just too tall. And uh, he was picking up on all the tall ones, this little short motherfucker. And... Um, that's weird. Yeah, you know, I never really had. I never really had that mental hang up. Oscar said yeah. the friend Tom is referring to is Little Swole. No, it isn't. No, not Little Swole. No, it isn't. No, Little Swole. Little, Little Swole is not. Uh, is not a douchebag. He's, he's not. Douche, he's not. actually like a really, really he's cool real person. Cool. He's really cool. And uh, he f- he was dating a, f- a tall girl who ended up. She went down to Australia for a while. She was a mensis. Mensa. Mensa. Yeah, yeah, she was, she a, was mensa. a mensa. Real, a genius chick. Stacy, that girl. Stacy, yeah. She was real I liked cool. Stacy. She was a weirdo, but I was into it. Yeah. And she, she was like a door, she was like a hot dorky a real hot dorky chick, girl. which I like that. Yeah. I like, I like hot she dorky She could dress girl. and shit. And then like, she would disappear for a while and then come back, but they were dating for a while. It was just, no, but Little Swole was actually kind of cool. He's, you know, only, he's not a douche at all. Yeah. He's, a, he's actually really awesome. He I, just I, needs I like help with diet. Because he can't eat anything. He has, he's a super taster, and he can't eat anything that has flavor. And he can only eat things that are white. Yeah. He eats and, toast and spaghetti pretty much all the time. Yeah, spaghetti and rice. And um, his favorite flavor is butter. That's his favorite I mean, flavor. no shame. And butter again, is delicious. Right. I'm and not then he, that, but. he can't eat, eat any meat, but he thinks he might like... He, he might like... Um, lobster because he smelled it and, it and it smelled like something he would like i was like look if seafood smelled yeah. good to you then that's something we can work with right but then he never so he's extremely low protein and i'm like dude man we're gonna have to get you on hrt we're gonna have to get you on fucking steroids you gotta start fucking eat drinking protein he drinks protein okay but his diet is fucked up and a little swole i call him a little swole but he might be my size is he my size or shorter, you think? He's about the same height as you, maybe yeah. an inch shorter, but it's not a huge okay. it's not a huge difference. Yeah. I can't like cause usually when we're hanging out with him, usually I have my big boots on. He's yeah. probably like my height, I don't know. Yeah. Like maybe he's an inch or two taller than me. Right. And like I said, I'm five foot three. So if he's an inch or two taller than me, then he's probably like an inch shorter than me. Little you Swole are. likes all those old cheesy '80s karate movies. Fucking, you know. Uh, Even though he's younger than us, he's younger by, than us by quite he, a by, by quite a large quite a margin. He loves fucking Sylvester Stallone. Fucking, he loves fucking uh, Seagal. Um, fucking um, dude who did Octagon. What's his name? And Chuck uh, Norris. Chuck Norris and. Just Octagon was actually cheesy. one of the better movies. Yeah, if it's che- if it's cheesy '80s shit, he loves Kung Fu. Shit. He fucking loves it. Well, honestly, like one, me and him will sometimes because yeah. you and him get off on action movies, but yeah. he's real into like old horror movies too. Mm-hmm. So if I get him on that, like we'll just talk for hours yeah. and hours. Like he's like super enthusiastic yeah. about it. Which, like I said, I love that. I love like people that'll go all like dorky about horror movies with me um but yeah we're getting way off topic again zach says whereas daniel craig is kind of weird looking but i think he's hot as shit yeah daniel craig uh is way way hotter than uh arnold schwarzenegger or tom cruise or anybody like that like daniel craig is way fucking hotter way fucking hotter what like i said i'm i like weird looking it's not necessarily weird looking because that sounds bad but it's just like i like distinctive looking if you look too good there's something like sterile about that you know what i mean like if you're you've had a bunch of plastic surgery and you look like and i'm just saying like yeah aesthetically that looks good that is pleasing to look at but it doesn't like stand out in any way i tend to be like more attracted to people men women whatever that are kind of weird looking or that, or that, like, stand out, that are, like, distinctive looking. Like I said, some of my first crushes, and this is going way back, some of my first crushes were, like, horror guys. Like, I was into, like, Peter Cushing. I was into the dude, Ted Cassidy, that played Lurch. I was into that kind of stuff. Like, if they're weird looking, um, that's kind of more my jam. And I wouldn't even call it, like, weird looking, but it's just kind of, like, 
like I said, distinctive. They have their own thing going on. You don't confuse them for somebody else. I kind of feel like if you're sort of like, uh, you know, a big A-list kind of star and like there's a particular look, like depending on whatever the era is that you're watching the movie from, there's a particular kind of look that was like really popular at the time. So you had like a lot of like A-list stars that looked like that, but a lot of them just look the same to me. So I can't really, I'm just like, which one is that now? You know what I mean? I kind of like what I like weird looking people. I like weird looking people because it, it's distinctive. You're like, sticking out like i said there's even something hot about somebody like steve buscemi like yeah he's ugly kind of but i don't know there's something like still kind of hot about that <laughs> you know what i mean because you're not going to confuse him for anybody else that's for sure and that's uh not going to happen with some of the other kind of like bigger a-list stars who sometimes i can't tell one from the other because they all get the same plastic surgery <coughs> so there's that <coughs> so where was i we were so like not even a quarter of the way through this shit this is gonna be like oh my god this is gonna be such a long show <laughs> and i'm just like i don't want to get too much into it but i'm last night after the show um i kind of got sick and i'm not gonna say like what it is because it's tmi but uh yeah so i was like i'm i'm feeling better today but i'm still kind of like what not. time is it? it is one it is uh 7 25 okay 7 look one thing i it's can't so early. do what in about a half hour go down there and down pull that chicken out and uh, season it and put it in the oven and slow cook it. Okay, well, you can do that. Yeah, we might have to do that in a while. That way it's done by the time we get out. I got a fucking whole chicken. I'm going to put that thing in the oven. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah, I, mean, the whole, I, got, the whole, I got two of those whole chickens. I'm oh, okay. Gonna, I had one of them out thawing. Try All to right. cover it with some oil and clean it off, cover it with some oil and put some spices on it and put it in the oven. It'll only take a second. Okay. Okay. Rebecca says, oh, God, I just noticed Tom's T-shirt. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, bought yeah, him yeah, that. Yeah. Did I buy yeah. that for Christmas or your birthday or something remember. like that, like a year or two ago? ago? <laughs> it was a long time ago. That's just, it made me laugh so much. I'm like, oh my God, yeah. I have to get that. Yeah. Uh, Danny Rowling said, who would win in a fight, Frankenstein's monster or Count Dracula? Dracula. Dracula probably would because yeah. he has more. I mean, Frankenstein's monster is just, I mean, let's be fair. He's bigger, sure, but he's just like a corpse that was reanimated with lightning. He doesn't have paranormal powers. He doesn't have paranormal yeah. powers, whereas Dracula does. Mm. So I'm going to I'm gonna give it to Dracula, even though, like I said, I kind of like the, as far as the Universal movies go, I think I like the Frankenstein one slightly better, but they're all good. And honestly, if we're talking about Boris Karloff, I was really into him as the mummy, too. I thought he was, like, super hot as the mummy. I was, like, I was into that. I thought that was... Honestly, the Frankenstein makeup is iconic, and that's amazing, like the Jack Pierce did. But for my money, I think the mummy makeup, I think I like it a little bit better. Like, as him as Imhotep, I think he... I, oh, man, he looks, like, so fucking great. So you got this for a minute? Uh, Yeah. I'll be back in about five minutes. All right. So yeah, so Bella gets to the U.S. Like I said, he worked his way over on a merchant ship because uh, he really wanted to come here. So he worked, and this actually was, Boris Karloff did this too, which we'll get into in a little bit, like you just did what you had to do back then. So he just uh, worked as a laborer, pretty much, because he was a big dude, and, you know, he just did whatever had to be done, like, to make some money. And then, like, he gets to New York City, and his English was not great when he first got here. I've seen different sources. Some people said like he could speak absolutely no English. Uh, some people said that his English was very broken, like he could make himself understood, but that's about it. So at first, um, he kind of like went into the theater world in New York City, but he had to basically find jobs within the Hungarian immigrant community, like in that theater. So there's that. So what he did at first, rather than trying to break into English-speaking theater, I guess, was he got together with a couple of other Hungarian immigrants, and they formed their own uh, stock theater company. So they would kind of, like, tour around playing for other immigrant audiences. So they would do stuff that was not in English, you know what I mean? Because, you know, that was what they were more comfortable doing. So uh, Bela Lugosi actually acted in a bunch of uh, Hungarian plays, and then he actually got a role in his first English-speaking Broadway play, which was called The Red Poppy, and that was in 1922. Now, as I said, I don't really know how much of a command he had of the English language at the time. Uh, some people have said he learned all of his lines phonetically, 
Uh, so I've heard that, uh, you know, so it, it might have been that he kind of understood what he was saying, but I've seen some sources that he didn't have any idea, like, what he was saying in the play. Uh, he just learned the lines phonetically and said them, and he wasn't aware of, like, didn't have any understanding of what was going on. But regardless, uh, his performance was still good enough to, like, really get noticed. So apparently he was, like, kick-ass because even though he couldn't really speak any English, <laughs> like, he still, like, fucking sold it. So uh, he actually got uh, his first American film role in a melodrama called The Silent Command, which came out in 1923. And he got off of the back of that. I kind of feel like he got a lot of other, uh, you know, roles in silent films, mostly villains uh, because of his look, uh, you know, or continental type roles. And these were all kind of like, uh, you know, productions that were made in and around like the New York area. So there was that. Now, in 1927, over the summer, he got approached to star in a Broadway theater production, a new adaptation of Dracula. Like I said, the very famous stage adaptation that had been adapted from the book, obviously. So he agreed and he was in that. And this was wildly successful actually ran in new york city for 261 performances and then toured around the united states uh, and got a whole bunch of like you know people came to see it it got all kind of like really good reviews and stuff like that throughout 1928 and 1929 so he kind of made a name for himself playing dracula on the stage like in lots and lots of performances before he even was in the movie what what? what I did was put it in the middle bowl. It's a little too frozen. Put it okay. in the bowl, put some water in it, let it thaw a little bit more. Maybe mm. it'll go down in 20 minutes. Okay. Got to make sure that center's kind of thawed before you cook it, people. The cooking well, time will be all fucked up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Juan said you bought the shirt for Tom for Christmas. Yeah, I thought it was Christmas. I couldn't remember if it was Christmas or his birthday. Juan knows the deal. Sure. Yeah. But it That's was a good Christmas. shirt. I got you that one, and I got you um, the Conan one. Yeah. That said about like hearing the lamentations of the yeah. woman and stuff like that, like on the back. <laughs> Which is a good shirt, but I just think it's too big a little bit. I think it's a medium. I think it's a large. It's not though. It's I always bought a medium. But the thing about it is that there's different, something about it, and it didn't fit. Different companies right, yeah. have different right. Yeah. Sizes for it's still a good shirt though. I'll wear it. Yeah. It's like I just thought it was like really funny. Uh, so yeah, so he had been touring around as Dracula in this very, very successful stage production. Now, 1928, um, the play like actually ended its West Coast run, so he decides he's going to stay in California. But, uh, you know, his performance on the stage had actually kind of got some interest from, you know, the larger film industry. So he got cast in a uh, movie called The Veiled Woman from 1929. That was Fox Film. And he was in another movie called Prisoners, which I think that came out that same year. Um, I don't. I think that's lost. I don't think they have that anymore, which a lot of movies from the silent era have been. Um, but that was actually released in a silent movie version and a talkie version. So 1929, uh, he got a couple movies, but then after that, like I kind of feel like the film, uh, you know, offers were drying up. So then uh, the Dracula thing was doing another like West Coast tour. So he's like, okay, well, I'll sign on for that. So he did that. Now, he also was in like some other, like later on, he'd be in some other talkies. Like I said, he'd usually have to be like uh, a villain or he'd have to be like the exotic chic type of character, uh, that kind of stuff. So he, at the, around this time, he started to hear that, oh, they're making a film version of the stage play of Dracula. So he starts approaching the studio saying, hey, obviously I've been playing this role for however long the run was, which was very long. And he's like, so he wanted to be in the movie. But Universal Pictures, uh, Bella Lugosi won their first choice, really. Uh, they had a whole bunch of other actors that were very prominent at the time that were lined up. Uh, so they started making it in 1930. There was a bunch of different actors. Uh, John Carradine was one of them. Uh, Conrad Veidt, who'd been in uh, several silent films like Man Who Laughs and uh, a couple of other ones. Uh, Hands of Orlac, which actually t I talked about on my site. But yeah, so they wanted uh, one of them to play Dracula, but a whole bunch of other ones were considered. So uh, they actually cast another dude named Lou Ayers. He was actually uh, hired to play Dracula at first, but then he got cast in a different like Universal movie, so he had to like you know uh, quit. 
So then they got another guy, and then they got this other guy named David Manners who was cast to play, but then he they moved him to Harker and shit like that. Now, because Bella Lugosi had played the role on Broadway, like I said, the director who came on, Todd Browning, was like, okay, fine, we'll put you in the movie. For the movie, Bella Lugosi was paid $3,500. Damn, not much. Which... I mean, for the time was probably okay, but considering how successful that film was yeah. and how it spawned a whole yeah. entire fucking franchise yeah. of shit, like that seems like not really all that much. And then all the damn, uh, how many times it was played over and over again, royalties sure. and shit. That's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, it. it I kind of feel like it's the kind of thing where... $3,000 back then was probably only like about 100000 today, probably. Which is, yeah, like I said, it's, it's not, not nothing, much. but... It's not that much. Considering the cultural impact yeah. that it had, I kind of feel like, yeah. Right. And he probably he didn't get any royalties. <laughs> but yeah. that's the thing. You're a working actor. You right. don't really you know, don't know what's gonna how successful this movie's going to be, that it's going to spawn this whole fucking cultural phenomenon. And then you're going to be like, shit, I wish that I had said that I wanted... He wouldn't have got the job if they put somebody else in there. They probably would have. <laughs> because, like I said, he was not not even on the list, to be honest, right, yeah. even though he p- played the role, like, many times on You Broadway. would think he would be a no-brainer because his accent and where he was from wasn't far from where where where, where, where fucking Dracula would have been from. Right. Which is Wallachia, which had been Romania. Yeah. Yeah. So you would go, yeah, we'll use you. And a good thing that they did. Yeah. Made it, it's an iconic character. I mean, yeah. The thing yeah. about it, though, and I kind of feel like this was a problem that Bela Lugosi struggled with the rest yeah. of his life after this came out. Like, I'm sure he was probably, like, really excited because he really wanted this role. Like I yeah. said, he loved playing that role. He played it on a stage many, many times. And so when they were making the movie, he's like, well, obviously. Um, but it. I don't want to say it ended up biting him in the ass, but it kind of did. Because he got so typecast. He got so, like locked into that one role that nobody really saw him as much of anything else like after that which is kind of sad had he not taken that role people would have saw him as nothing though anyway. that's true that's what i mean it's kind of like a double-edged yeah. sword that's like really really you've never gotten famous and like i said the same thing like didn't happen to boris karloff i guess because you know like i said he was playing a monster so he wasn't really playing somebody that looked like himself necessarily like you'd still tell it was him but it was like a lot of makeup and he was a monster and stuff but you know, Lugosi, that was all him. He wasn't... So. A lot of it, I think, had to do with Karloff's name, which was the stage name. That is a very memorable name, it Karloff. Is, yeah. yeah. You sound like a fucking sorcerer. Yeah. Or a magician. You know? Yeah, he was kind of brilliant coming up with that shit. Yeah. <laughs> that might be part of it. Because if you guys... That's not his real name. His real name is William Pratt. Yeah. Karloff. Sounds like a dude that could disappear. <laughs> Carl off the fuck out of here. I'm gonna Carl off the yeah. fuck out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Step aside. Here comes Carl. <laughs> yeah, Lugosi doesn't. It, it sounds foreign, but it doesn't sound that awesome. I mean, it is awesome, but it's yeah. not quite as. It's awesome not as else. awesome as Carl off. Carl off is a fucking propaganda name. There well, Boris Karloff. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like Boris it has all those Karloff. really hard consonants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like you're serious. Sounds like some you're serious about some shit. Yeah, like some dude from Russia yeah. that can fucking disappear in a cloud <laughs> of smoke. You know, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> he can read minds. Right. You know, he can mesmerize women. <laughs> shit like that. You know? That's what it sounds like. I know. Now I'm like picturing like a fucking poster. It's yeah. Like <laughs> He's got a fucking crystal ball. Touring the continent. Yeah. Boris Karloff. Boris He's Karloff. got like a fucking Lock turban your, on and shit. Lock up your women. <laughs> Here yeah. he comes. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I Like think, I said, I think it was the hard consonants. That yeah. All the hard consonants. I think that name has something to do with it. Yeah. He does have the look to back it up and he could act. But I think Bela, Bela Lugosi would have been better to have a stage name. I mean, that was a stage name, but yeah, something that it's was like. Something that sounds harder. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, I don't even know if it was... Yeah, that might have factored into it. Yeah. I think Bella's main problem was his thick accent. And honestly, he didn't really learn English until like later on. And I, I think that that might have limited his roles in the beginning. I'm going to say no. You know why? 
Arnold Schwarzenegger had a thick accent. They said he'd never make it in Hollywood. He conquered Hollywood. During his yeah, but that's one case. That doesn't yeah. usually happen. You can do it. It can be done, but it doesn't you can usually do it. happen. It you, they just have happen. to be cast the right way. John Rumbleslap says Bloody McMurder. Yeah. <laughs> that should be a stage name. Yeah. <laughs> could be could be that he didn't have proper management. They weren't casting him the right way. He didn't have the right representation in Hollywood. There's more to it than that. I mean, his Legosi son... Legosi probably could have gone fur further if he had somebody fucking batting for him with studios. Different kind of producers that could back him for fucking projects that were good. They had a lot, I think that had a lot to do with it. Because it's, it's always a team effort. It's not so much... It's not so individual. It wasn't, it wasn't Bela. It was well, the thing... Like, his son actually said... He's yeah. like, well, he's like, I know a lot of people said, oh, maybe he had bad, bad management or something like that. He's like, the thing about my dad was that he just really liked to act and he would just take whatever work uh, was offered. Yeah. So. He's not building a legend for himself and he's not. Yeah. But it kind of worked anyway, even yeah. though he didn't really live to see it, which is right. kind of sad. It, uh, yeah. When he was alive, he needed better management. Probably. He probably did. Yeah, I would imagine. Somebody said, oh, no, we're not going to have him in this movie. And we need to get this movie made, this movie. If we get this movie made and you got Bela in there, it will fucking be a hit. This movie's, this script is for him, you know. But shit like that really didn't come come about until later. You know what I mean? What the fuck was that? I don't know. Did you see that too? Yeah. Was that light or? I don't know. Did one of my lights flash and go out or some shit like that? I don't see anything wrong back there. Yeah, nothing's about it. It just kind of flickered. Yeah. Um, Ghosts. You're haunting my shit nah. again. I think it was... He was a little bit ahead of his time. Had a dude like that appeared a little bit later, maybe you could have done more with him. You know. Yeah. Hey, think about it. You were limited in his era. Of what kind of subjects you could write. His best movie is not Dracula. Sorry, people. If you ask me, his best movie is The Black Cat. Which we reviewed not too long yeah. ago. And that had Boris Karloff in it, too. Right. And that's his best movie. That's an excellent movie. I fucking love that movie. And that movie was pushing the boundaries of what was possible. Uh, it was a movie that had damn torture, stealing people's fucking women, stealing their wives and their daughters. Uh, necrophilia fucking guys human sacrifice Satanism it had all that in it it's just a that was his best movie per se I, I don't think he, that was uh, that didn't make him famous but that was the best movie he was in that was better than Dracula a lot of people think his best performance actually came a little bit later uh, in like when he played uh, Igor, like the one with the broken neck or whatever. Yeah, that was, what okay. was that? Son of Frankenstein or something like that? I didn't like see that. it. Which we'll get into that. I didn't see but, it. But I mean, I've always been a big fan of White Zombie, to be honest, but... I haven't, I've seen it, but I have to see it again. It I mean, he's away. been in like so many movies. Like yeah. everybody knows about Dracula, but holy crap he was in like so many if you ask me overall when it came to story and production and everything that happens in the topic the best movie he was in was Black Cat and both of these guys were in it and they were both excellent in it both real good like I said we just reviewed that not too long ago yeah. and that's actually like a, yeah that's a really really good movie that's a really good movie I can't you know I was watching, when, that, when I was watching that shit I couldn't believe they actually did some of that stuff in there yeah and I think that movie actually made them bring on the Hayes Code about what was it might have been one of the ones that was instrumental in like the yeah. Hayes Code coming in, yeah, because it of like was, the stuff they were. It was, it was like I said, from now, from today's standpoint, yeah, it's all like implication and hinting and everything like that. But I was yeah. like amazed that they got away with some of that crap yeah. like back in the '30s. Holy crap! Yeah, I wouldn't have thought that they would have done that. What is that noise? Thunder. I don't think it's thunder. I think rednecks? it's somebody. I think it's rednecks. It's rednecks. <laughs> it's rednecks. It's called right. redneck thunder. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a drink. I'm gonna fucking. I'm gonna. Uh, I gotta go out to the fucking boot. To, uh, to, That's right. Tomorrow. To, yeah. Because in case you guys weren't here for the last Friday, we decided that what we were gonna do. Because last Friday's show about taste testing Colt 45 and Colt 45 High Gravity. Yeah. yeah was like yeah. so fun and so yeah. successful. I'm like, man, every week. We should go to the liquor store and, and see what kind of weird shit. ass shit that we can like taste as. I don't want to like 
spend money on shit that I think is going to be gross. Yeah. But I don't mind stuff that would be like super cheap, uh, you know, that might be better than I expect, or yeah. something that's like weird but might be awesome. I'm, you know, the series is going to be fucking. Well, it's not going to be a, a regular series, but this little special series we're going to do. I'm going to be slumming <laughs> you know, and try to find low cost stuff that is high value. In other words, it's cheap but it's good. So far, Colt 45 passed the test. Colt 45. That was Colt actually yeah. That was actually like way better than I was. Hell expecting. yeah! For what I paid a dollar thirty five a can, I'd rather have that than Budweiser. That was a lot so better. So would I. Yeah, it was pretty good. So would I. Very drinkable. Yeah. And then I even looked at the old ads back when back before Billy D, back in the fucking sixties. Colt 45 spokesman was basically like a James Bond type dude, sitting sitting at a table at the beach in a suit. Fucking talking about Colt 45. It's all serious. Like a secret agent. A secret agent is selling you a can of damn fucking malt liquor. Ain't that some shit? Well, you know. That's how they did that shit back then. Yeah. And then uh, in the comment sections in that one, we have some people, some dudes from England saying, oh, yeah, we got malt liquor here in England. They're fucking naming off all the brands that you try this brand and that brand. But no, it's just. It's a cheap way of making fucking a beer like product. It tastes like beer. It's cheaper. It tastes like a high quality cheap beer. So, yeah, high quality beer for for less. All right. So, like like I said, let me let me get through this fucking. Go ahead, dude. Let me get through the topic. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. <laughs> he okay. just dropped his glasses no, on my on my foot. All right. Let me see what's going on. So yeah, so I think what a lot of people forget is that Dracula and Frankenstein came out the same year. Now I think somebody mentioned earlier that Lugosi, after the success of Dracula, was actually offered the role of Frankenstein. Now, Frankenstein's monster, rather. Um, there are conflicting stories about this. I think the most popular story is that Lugosi looked at the script and was like, I'm not doing that because, one, it, he doesn't have any lines, and two, um, I'll be underneath all this makeup and nobody will recognize me, so he doesn't want to do it. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's kind of like the main story about it. Um, according to Bella, at least like in his later years, he actually didn't really want to do it for whatever reason, but he recommended Boris Karloff. I don't know if that's true or not. You know what I mean? Because like I said, I think they wanted to sell the rivalry between them later, which did have a little bit of basis in reality, but I think it was way overblown because, you know, they could sell movie tickets like later on. They're like, ooh, Dracula versus Frankenstein, like these two guys and they hate each other and blah, blah, blah. So I think they were doing that just to sell movie tickets because from everybody that knew them, they were like, you know, it wasn't really all that bad. So what for whatever reason, he turned down the role of Frankenstein's monster and it ended up going to Boris Karloff. And of course, you know, that we all know how that went. Now, as I mentioned, because Dracula was such a success, I mean, obviously that's good, like for an actor, but it also sort of like ended up biting him in the ass because he got absolutely typecast. Everybody was just kind of like, well, he's Dracula and that's pretty much it. So when he would try out for other roles, they'd be like, why is Dracula here? Like, what? you know what I mean? So he would get other roles, but they would usually be kind of like small roles and he'd always have to be like a villain or he would always kind of have to have like, you know, and it, it would just be shit like that. It would be like something that was similar to what he had done before. So he couldn't, I feel like he could never really like break out of that type, you know, the typecasting that had been kind of like thrust on him. Now he did audition for some other roles, like he auditioned for Rasputin uh, in the movie Rasputin and the Empress, which is 1932, but he lost it to Lionel Barrymore. He also went out for another role in Charge of the Light Brigade from 1936, uh, but was uh, you know thrown over in favor of C. Henry Gordon. And he also wanted to be in this other movie, uh, Tovarich from 1937, but lost the part to Basil Rathbone, even though Bella Lugosi had played the exact same part in a stage production of the same story. So, yeah. Um, like I said, it's kind of sad because he seemed like he had come up in theater. He had played a lot of diverse roles. Once he did Dracula, like I said, that's great, and everybody remembers him because of that, but... At the time when he was just trying to like fucking work and put food on the table, maybe not so good because nobody would give him a chance like to be anything other than that. 
So I guess he sort of accepted, well, I'm just going to be like the horror guy, which, you know, so that's kind of what he had to do. So he was in like a few other ones. Obviously, he was in Murders of the Rue Morgue, which is the Edgar Allan Poe uh, adaptation. He was in White Zombie. Like I said, I actually really like White Zombie. That was also from 1932. Uh, Island of Lost Souls. He was in that as well. Mark of the Vampire uh, from 1935, in which he essentially played Dracula again, but because of uh copyright issues they had to call him something else but he looked pretty much exactly the same um so yeah and also like i said they started kind of like pairing him with boris karloff because you know the whole monster mash thing that was like a big thing at the time so the black cat which was 1934 which like i said tom is really into that movie and we reviewed it not too long ago they also did uh the raven in 1935 and like the invisible ray in 1936 so they did a bunch of movies together and like i said the the studios were kind of like hyping up this rivalry between them which i think that was kind of like overblown now one thing that he was i think that bella lugosi was probably understandably like mad about was that because Karloff had, I don't know if he's necessarily been around for longer, but because he had been in more films, like in more diverse roles, and because Frankenstein was so iconic, even when, like when Karloff and Lugosi were in movies together, even if Lugosi was technically playing the lead role, Boris Karloff almost always got top billing. And Boris Karloff, in fact, after Frankenstein, was so famous that he was one of those motherfuckers that you could just, like, refer to him by his last name. Like, you didn't have to put his first name on there. It was just Karloff. You know what I mean? And so if a movie had Boris Karloff in it and Bela Lugosi, it'd be like, Karloff! Oh, and Lugosi. It would be kind of like that. So I can see how, if you were Bela Lugosi, yeah, that would kind of, like, piss you off a little bit. But like I said, I from everything that I could determine... It doesn't seem like Bela Lugosi, like, he didn't blame Boris Karloff for that. Because, like I said, it wasn't Boris Karloff's fault. It was whoever was making the movies and whoever was making the posters and all, the, you know, the production companies behind it. It wasn't Boris Karloff's fault that they did that. But that was something that he did seem to have, like, a little bit of resentment about. Is that even when he was the starring role, like, Karloff would get top billing because he was, like, Karloff. So maybe there is something to, like, what Tom was saying about, like, the name. That is kind of like, a, and the thing about, we'll get into it when we talk about Boris Karloff a little bit more, but Boris Karloff, I mean, obviously, like I said, that's not his real name. His real name's William Pratt, but um, he just kind of like, essentially he pulled that name out of his ass pretty much. Um, Boris, he just liked it because it sounded foreign, like it sounded exotic. And Karloff, he said, oh, it's from my mom's side of the family is Russian or something like that. But a lot of his family members are like, we don't know what he's talking about. That's like kind of bullshit. But he basically just like made it up <laughs> out of whole cloth. But if he did... I mean, it's a great name. Like I said, people still fucking remember it. And I think it, like I said, it might have contributed to why he was, why his name was a lot more memorable, I guess. So uh, there's that kind of thing. And I think that even at the time, like Karloff was like, well, when we did movies together, um, you know, Lugosi was, was thinking, oh, well, this Englishman, he's going to upstage me. But then when he kind of got to know Karloff and because both of these dudes like by all accounts were super nice dudes and especially Boris Karloff everybody said he was just like the nicest dude ever so he wouldn't like he doesn't seem like the type of dude that would like go out of his way to be like a bitch to the dude or to somebody else or anything like that like you know and he seemed like he was just I don't know everybody just said that he was a really nice guy so he wouldn't have really done that so, you know, there, there's that kind of thing. But they seemed like to have a good professional relationship, even though there was some resentment, maybe, on Lugosi's part, just because Karloff was more successful and, like, better known and blah, blah, blah. So, now, what ended up happening? So, uh, so Lugosi's in some movies in the 30s. And, like I said, it's good, but he's getting typecast. Like I said, he's not working as regularly as he might like. And a lot of roles that he wanted that were in non-horror movies, he would usually lose them to other actors. Now, in uh, August of 1938, though, which is, you know, if you're counting, seven years after the original uh, Dracula came out, there was a California theater owner named uh, Emil Uman. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, who got it in his head. He's like, ooh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to revive the, um, you know, the Universal Monster, the Dracula and Frankenstein movies, and I'm going to do, like, a double feature. Like, I'm going to show them in my theater, and I'm going to do Dracula versus Frankenstein. It'll be this big thing. 
And that ended up being like way more successful than anybody had ever anticipated. Like, and like I said, it's only been seven years. So it seems like not that long a time, but you know, a lot of movies had come out and everybody just kind of like moved on from it. But he's like, yeah, I'm going to bring him back and I'm going to make it like a monster mash kind of thing. So it was like hugely, hugely successful. And the fact that it was so successful, I mean, he had to add on like extra showings and all this other kind of stuff because people just like line up around the block like to see them. And it was such a big deal that he actually like called up Bella Lugosi and said, hey, like, do you want to come here in person, like in your cape and everything like that? People would love that. So, you know, so he would like come out and do that and like be at the theater show and everybody fucking love that shit. And it almost kind of like reinvigorated his career a little bit. Because you're getting, I know it was only seven years, but you're getting like a new generation of kids that hadn't seen the original films and now they're seeing them and they really dug them. So there was, uh, it was kind of like gave them like a little bit shot in the arm. So after that happened, I guess the studio was kind of like, oh, maybe there's still some mileage left in old Bella Lugosi, even though, (laughs) old. Like I said, the thing about it, both Lugosi and Karloff were a little bit older when they started out. Like I said, Karloff was, was, I think it was 43 when he played Frankenstein's monster. I can't remember how old Lugosi was when he played Dracula, but he wasn't young. So it's not kind of like a thing where they came came out and like they were big stars like they in their 20s and stuff, and then they kind of aged out. They were older when they started. So you know the fact that they were in like a few movies and they got like super famous and then they kind of started getting older and like the you know so it was kind of a thing but then like i said they were older when they started so it's kind of like a different situation so the studio is like all right well maybe there is some life left in bella lugosi so they uh kind of hired him to act in some more movies so um well actually one of his later roles that a lot of people point to is probably being his best one Uh, was, as I mentioned earlier, Son of Frankenstein, where he plays Igor. That was 1939, um, where he had, like, he had been, like, hanged, I guess, and his neck was broken, but he survived, so he has, like, this fucking bone sticking out of his neck. So he was, like, great in that. Um, He was also, he played Igor again in Ghost of Frankenstein, which was 1942, but by that time, like I said, yeah, he had, like, a little resurgence, like, in the late 1930s, but it didn't last very long, sadly. So they kind of put him in a few more movies. And then he just, from that point on, I think 1942, right around there. Or I think Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein was like the last time that he was like in a big budget, like eight list kind of picture. After that, he kind of started working on Poverty Row kind of movies and, you know, exploitation flicks, stuff like that. Now, uh, as we brought up earlier, um, because he had been injured when he was in the military that's what the story is i don't know if that's true or not um but apparently he had real bad uh sciatica i think it was now at first he was kind of like just taking some just regular ass pain remedies or whatever that weren't you know uh addiction inducing i guess but the doctor started giving him uh opioids you know so he got addicted to morphine over these time periods because like i said because of injuries and things like that it's a painkiller addiction now uh and then after that in 1947 like later on 1947 when methadone became available in the united states um he got addicted to that as well like as doctors prescribed it and he like i said he just maintained that addiction over all that time period so um that's the thing uh you know his last big movie being the abbott and costello one which is actually like a good movie it's a good comedy and everything like that but by that point like i said by the 1940s everyone was kind of like they thought that the universal monsters were like they weren't scary anymore they were just like funny so they were all in comedy so he was in that and then after that he just went and shitty and like i said he uh you know because of his drug addiction and because there was he also had some problems with alcoholism as well during this time period so he was not in the best shape um, and he kind of got a little bit of a reputation about like being, I don't think he was necessarily difficult to work with, but you know, anybody that's like an addict or a drunk or anything like that, like, you know, they're probably not going to be at their peak performance. So there's that kind of thing. So uh, the thing too, about what I wanted to mention about Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein was that 
in the original uh, take of the film, like when he was in it, because he plays Frankenstein's monster in that, which is kind of ironic because he apparently turned down the role of Frankenstein's monster in the very iconic like James Whale movie that you know Boris Karloff got famous for. So he's playing Frankenstein's monster in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, and he initially had lines in the movie. But for whatever reason, when they cut it for theater release, they cut all of his dialogue out. So his monster in the movie, like, looks, it doesn't, he doesn't say anything. And he just kind of, like, looks like he's lumbering around with his arms out. And it almost kind of looks like a parody. Even though originally he did have lines. But they cut all of that out. And he was, like, really, really pissed off that they did that. Uh, especially that being, the, like, the last big film that he was in. So there was that. Now, he was in a couple other good movies after this. Like, he was in uh, The Body Snatcher in 1945, which was also with Boris Karloff, in which they played, like, you know, Body Snatchers, obviously. It was kind of loosely based on Burke and Hare, I think. So they both actually, like, played people in that, and that was actually, like, pretty good. And so there was that. Now, the thing about it... So after this point he just really started not getting work like i said because the studios were kind of done with him like he was having problems with drug addiction and then famously he meets up with ed wood who i saw this one documentary earlier that said this said this in a very diplomatic way it said well he had more ambition than talent and i said well that's a nice way of putting it Uh, poor ed wood he seemed to mean well he really did but he didn't have jack shit idea how to make a fucking movie. Uh, so there's that. But he was a big fan of Bela Lugosi. And he knew that Bela Lugosi was having some problems. So he basically is like, well, Bela Lugosi is like the biggest name actor that I'm going to get my hands on. So I'm going to call him up and see if I can have him be in some of my like fucking Z grade pictures. So, uh, so Ed Wood, much as they portray in the movie, and it's, like I said, the Tim Burton movie from 1994 is excellent. But it is uh, exaggerated. You know, it's it's a little bit fictionalized. But apparently Ed Wood did actually find uh, Bela Lugosi living in poverty and uh, was a big fan of his. So it's like, hey, you need to be in my movies. So the first movie of Ed Wood's that he was in was infamously Glenn or Glenda from 1953. Movie about transgenderism. Yeah, which is cross dressing. Yeah, it's more it's transvesticism. It's not really transgender because yeah, because Ed Wood was straight, but he was a cross dresser, and he just wanted to. Which is crazy watching it nowadays because I'm like, in a way, it's like it's a terrible movie, but it's like it's kind of way ahead of its time. Which one, uh, Glenn or Glenda? Glenn or Glenda? Yeah, it's an awful movie though. But it's it's like a fake documentary. It's fun to watch. It's fun to watch. Ed Wood had some. I mean. There's, Ed Wood was, he's iconic for a reason. I mean, he had some weird ass ideas about like what would make a good movie. Ed Wood fucking was a marine. All right, he fought the fuck. He fought the fucking Battle of Peleliu on the island of Peleliu, one of the fucking most savage wars of most savage battles of all fucking times. They were fucking cutting people's heads off. Fucking had Japanese heads. They were torturing people. Fucking setting Japanese dudes on fire. He, he went through the whole fucking battle of Peleliu with women's fucking underwear on underneath his fucking uniform. And yep. he wasn't scared of getting killed. He was afraid of getting wounded. Because <laughs> they would find out. Because they'd find out he's wearing that shit. See, people are complicated. Yeah. yeah. You can't just be like, yeah. oh, it's like, oh, well, they can't be a badass because they have women's panties on. <laughs> he had these, uh, he had these issues. He wanted to be calmed by the feeling of fucking having women's clothing on him and feeling having women's clothing on him reminded him of fucking, I guess, his mom and uh, would rev- would reduce stress on him and he felt comforted by it. So he didn't have to be a man, I guess. I don't fucking know what it was. But he was open about it around his friends. He'd fucking put his fucking shit, he'd put his women's clothes on in front of his friends and have a party and shit, but... When he was in the Marines, he had to fucking hide this shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fucking funny. It yeah. is. Yeah. Like, he seemed like an, he was troubled, uh, mm-hmm. like a lot of people back then were, but you know what I mean. Yeah, and he was straight. He was fucking into women. He liked yeah. women. He was not gay. He just liked the fucking... That's what I mean. People are complicated. Yeah. You can't just like... It's, right, yeah. You know, it's a spectrum. That's what they say. It's yeah. not just like black or white. 
but yeah, so uh, so yeah, so Ed Wood gave him a role in uh, Glen or Glenda, where he was mostly he was mostly like kind of like a puppet master type character yeah. in that. Uh, he was also in Bride of the Monster uh, from 1955. Um, you know, so there was that, and honestly, one of my favorite scenes in Ed Wood, like the mm. movie, was when they steal the octopus from the studio lot to put in the, at the end of their movie. <laughs> the end of the Bride of the Monster. And they forgot to steal the octopus motor. So then they make poor old Bella Lugosi, who was like an old drug addicted guy at this time. And they're just like made poor old Bella like laying out in this cold water at night. And they're just like, move his legs around, make it look like it's killing you. <laughs> and that's kind of, as far as I know, that's pretty similar to what actually did happen. But I mean, I mean, Bella was a trooper. Uh, you know, he, he loved theater. He loved acting and stuff like that. And he was game. I mean, he probably wasn't feeling too good, but he's just like, he would do whatever if, to be in a movie, even if it was terrible. He wanted to get that morphine. <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was that too. Yeah. But yeah, so he was in, I mean, and the thing about it is that he has actually, even though those are terrible movies, I mean, they're still entertaining. They're terrible, but they're entertaining. But he has like some great fucking monologues, like that fucking monologue that he has at the end where he's right, just like. Yeah, it's like or yeah. Bride of the Monster or Bride whatever. Monster, yeah. We're just like hunted, despised, hunted living like, like an, an animal. animal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, good. That shit Ed Wood wrote, which is poorly written by Ed Wood, delivered like. A I mean, it master. doesn't. I mean, it, the shit that Ed Wood wrote, yeah. it absolutely makes, makes no, no sense. sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Ghost, he was taking but this shit seriously. He did, and it's like he gave he gave that shit some conviction, son. Like I yeah, said, you yeah. gotta like fucking respect that. <laughs> He didn't phone the shit in. No. He <laughs> treated it completely seriously. And yeah. I'm like, like I said, you got to fucking respect that. Because the script was terrible. But that yeah. wasn't that wasn't his fault. Ed Wood, like I said, I, well, I think that's why everybody remembers Ed Wood movies nowadays. Just because the scripts are so fucking bizarre. Like the stuff that people say in there, I'm just kind of like, all righty. Nobody talks like that. They would right. show him Channel 13 fucking out in L.A. when I was a little boy. And, uh... For the monster fucking monster fucking afternoon, you know, monster matinee, and we kind of liked him. We liked him. We didn't know any better. Yeah. And I guess Ed knew that we didn't know any better. That we were the more target market. <laughs> so like, okay. Yeah. You it's know. like, hey, we knocked over the cardboard gravestones. It's yeah. like no one's gonna notice. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember it. Tor so Johnson ran into a wall, like yeah. ran into a cardboard wall, and like the whole fucking set shook. You know what yeah. I mean? It's that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you know, uh, but yeah. So now, while they were working on Bride of the Monster, like af after it had already been shot, and they were doing like the post production on it, which is hard to believe that there was any post production on Bride of the Monster. But okay, I've seen it like multiple times. It's on MST if you want to watch it with, uh, you know, with riffing on it. Now, dur while they were doing post production on Bride of the Monster. Bella Lugosi, as we mentioned earlier, uh, went to a treatment center for drug addiction. And when they did the premiere of the film, they actually used the money that they raised from the premiere of the film to pay for some of his hospital expenses. Which that was kind of a nice touch. So, uh, so there was that. And as we mentioned earlier, he's actually like the first Hollywood star to come out and say, yeah, I went to rehab like I'm a drug addict. So they did an interview with him after he got out from the treatment center in 1955. Like I said, he was in for three months, and I saw some footage of him coming out. Uh, and he looked actually in good shape. Like I said, he's an old man. He's an old man. He was 74. But he came out like he bounded out, and he's like, hey, everybody, and stuff. And all the media was there and everything like that. So he looked like he had gotten his shit together. He's like, yeah, I'm cured, and all this other kind of stuff. Um, now, while he was... Uh, being interviewed, he said, yeah, I'm working on another Ed Wood movie called The Ghoul Goes West, which I think they bring up in the in the Ed Wood movie, like the Tim Burton one. So this was, uh, like, Ed Wood, had, he had, like, a whole slate of pictures uh, planned, whether he'd actually written them or done anything about no. it. He just had, like, the titles and the ideas yeah. and stuff. Dr. Acula. Dr. <laughs> you know Acula, what I mean? Yeah. Acula, Acula. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. I don't like it. But yeah, so see Ed Wood. It's like, it's an awesome movie. But yeah, so uh, so he said he was going to be working on that. So while he was thinking about the next movie he was going to make, he didn't really have a particular script in mind. So he starts filming Bela Lugosi in his Dracula cape 
in front of various locations. He shot him in front of Tor Johnson's house. Uh, he shot him in front of like a graveyard, like in some suburb somewhere, and in front of uh, Bella's apartment building that he was living in. So the little house was Tor's house. Uh, I think that was Tor's house, yeah, okay. because Bella was little living in LA house. Yeah, because Bella bitty. was living in an apartment complex yeah. at that time. Like there is some footage of him like from in front of that uh, that apartment complex too. But so yeah, so they filmed all this kind of stuff. And then, uh, so he films all that, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to put that, like, in an upcoming movie. Um, but what happened was that in 1956, Bela Lugosi died in his sleep. So, I mean, thankfully, he died in his sleep. He's didn't like, know it, he it, No, he didn't. Like, his wife, yeah. uh, his fifth wife at the time, Hope, she, who was actually, like, a fan of his. Okay. And had been writing to him for several years, because his fourth wife, How Lillian... Old was she? Um, she was quite a bit younger. Yeah, quite, quite a bit 50s, younger. Yeah. Um, she might have been younger than that. I yeah, can't really remember. I think there was like a twenty or thirty age difference, okay. twenty or thirty year age difference. But um, she yeah, she had been a fan of his and like wrote to him and stuff. But I don't think she was married to him for that long. Like before he died, like his fourth wife prior to that was Lillian, who is uh you know Bella Junior. Like because you see him like on a lot of do- if you see a documentary about Bella Lugosi, like his son will be on there. Um, Bella Jr. is on there, and that's Lillian is his mom, but that was Bella's fourth wife, I think. So uh, Hope was his fifth wife. She found him dead, like in his bed. He died in his sleep per, uh, peacefully. It was just a heart attack. So because he died in 1956, uh, Ed Wood decided, well, I'm going to use this footage and I'm going to put it in Plan 9 from Outer Space, which came out in 1957. Yeah. And uh, most famously, I think everybody knows this at this point. Because he wanted to put Bill Lugosi's character, like the Dracula character, in there. This movie makes no fucking sense. No. So he's like, well, I'm going to hire this guy who's my wife's chiropractor, whose name was Tom Mason. I thought he was a dentist. That no, was he was a chiropractor. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, and I'm going to put him in there as a stand-in for Bill Lugosi. And he's just going to keep the cape over his face. Yeah. Even though the dude was, like, way taller and bigger than Bella Lugosi was. Um, and it's obviously not the same dude. But, you know. <laughs> I mean... The thing I about saw that, I saw that movie when I was a kid, and I didn't notice anything. I, I didn't notice anything about it. Well, you wouldn't if you're a you kid. Notice when you're a kid, you know what that, I mean. That was that's what they were doing. That's what that's who they were making those for. Oh, the kids are gonna love it. You know, it, that's what they were doing. That's like really funny. <laughs> it was funny. Holy funny when shit. you think about it. And when, when you think about it, out out in front of Tor Johnson's house, looking at old L.A., I was born there. Okay, left in 81. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you. What do you say? Loving the diverse content. Well, okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. I was born there. Fucking left in 81. Fucking. Where they're showing is the ghetto now. All right. It wasn't the ghetto back then. Uh, but, you know, most of the United States back in that era didn't have, like, extensive suburb, suburban areas. They didn't have any of that. California was way ahead back in those days. Now that shit is everywhere. And uh, the areas that they're talking about are just worn out ghettos now. But it, it's just fucking funny to think about it, how small American cities were at that time and kind of how new the modern city was. Yeah. Because the, the suburb was a post-World War II invention, really. Yeah. In fact, most people lived either in the city or in shacks <laughs> out in the <laughs> middle of the country. There wasn't anything in between. Yeah. But it's just funny to see fucking Bella goes to Bella out there in that old fucking footage. It's like I mean, old it's tract came, housing. And he's in front of tract housing. It looks like something straight out of down. It looks like straight out of Edward Scissorhands. Smaller. I know those houses. Uh, I wasn't born in one, but I kind of partially grew up in one. It's. I can give you the address. You guys can even Google it and look at it. It's 2524 Jackson Street, Carson, California. Right outside fucking... Dominguez Elementary, the same elementary school that fucking, oh, what's his name went to? Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino went to that elementary school. He was a couple years older than me. I vaguely remember him. And then he worked at the damn, he worked at the fucking, uh, worked at the damn video rental store down over there where the, where El Ranchito's Mexican fucking restaurant used to be. Yeah, I, I remember the whole area. Dominguez. But yeah, so what I was going to say was that when, as awesome as the Tim Burton, Ed Wood movie is, as I said, um, relatives of both Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff 
they said that as as awesome as Martin Landau's performance as Bela Lugosi, and he got an Oscar for that shit, and rightfully so, because he was amazing. I actually forgot that was an actor, then that Bela Lugosi was actually, like, not alive anymore. Yeah. Um... But they said that, one, Bela Lugosi would never have said, because he's, it's hilarious, it's a hilarious scene, like in the movie where he says, Boris Karloff, Karloff is not fit to smell my shit, he says. Yeah. But he's like, he, he would have never have said that. Yeah. Um, it's like, actually, he really, he quite liked Boris Karloff, or they had like a professionally like respectful relationship, and he never would have said, he, he didn't really use swear words like that. And they said, and also, you know, there's a scene in there where a vampire, and he's like, says, says something like she has nice jugs or something. Yeah. It's like, yeah, she ne- he never would have said anything like that. Like, that, like, he thought that like he didn't. Well, they're just saying that he didn't talk like that. Yeah, yeah. You know he, what I mean. He was, he was in dirty mouth. Yeah. yeah. They said that honestly, and his son said that he had like a lot of really good memories of his dad. Like his dad, like always spent a lot of time with him and was like really involved in family life and stuff. Yeah. And everybody seemed like he was said that he was like a really nice dude. Yeah. You know. So there was that. Like I said, he was married several times, and when he was younger. Uh, as I mentioned, he uh, had a reputation a little bit of a ladies' man, yeah. and was seen with some kind of like hot starlets at the time. Clara Bow, uh, yeah. they, you know, he supposedly had an affair with her among others. But and he was married five times. But you know, he definitely would have liked Mela though. He'd have been come. To yeah, the yeah, yeah. And the whole her whole vampire outfit and shit like that. He would he would have liked that. How do you do? Yeah, that? yeah. Like, <laughs> she understands. You know, because right? you know, fucking. Bela invented that look, basically. He did, yeah. The male version of it. October says, October 8th said, check out the movie with Gold- Jeff Goldblum, Mr. Frost. I actually really, really like that movie, and I feel like hardly, I'm you and me are like the only people yeah. that remember that one, I feel like. Now, the thing about that, um, so Lugosi, Bela Lugosi was buried in his Dracula cape, most famously. Uh, contrary to popular belief, I don't think he ever actually said that he wanted that. Um, according to his son... And uh, his son's mom, who was, you know, Bella Lugosi's fourth wife, they just did that because they thought that that was what he would have wanted. Because yeah. he did love that role. But I don't think he ever specifically requested, hey, bury me. But Because they said, we're, they, I don't think it was just the cape. It was the cape and the ring and the whole outfit. Yeah. They no, just he thought, it. He yeah, they, it. that's what they thought. Well, they yeah. knew him. And yeah. they're like, that's he would have liked that. So yeah. that's what we're going to do. Like, I don't think he ever specifically requested, but... Because, like I said, he the thing about Bella was that, um, you know, when he got out of rehab, he really thought, you know, even though he was 74, he's like, hey, I'm making a comeback or whatever. So he always had like a really optimistic attitude about the future. Like, hey, I'm going to like go on to greater things, even though he was old. You know what I mean? Which I don't know. I guess that's kind of like a cool attitude to have. So I don't made more Ed Wood movies. He probably would have. Yeah. Yeah. Which they were... I mean, Ed Wood would have kept... Well, and the thing about it, like, say what you will about Ed Wood. They were bad, but they weren't... They made money. They did... did people I mean, knew him. People were they, like, who watched them? Well, I kind of feel yeah. like... I don't know if they made any money at the time, but I think hindsight has been kind to them. I mean, people remember Ed Wood nowadays because he was so terrible. So yeah. there is also... There's, like, a talent in that. It was. It was. You have to. You have to consider the times. Television wasn't as well developed as it had be, ended up being become later on. What Ed Wood was doing was really low budget matinee cinema for young boys of that era. It was the TV of its time. A little bit better than TV, maybe. People try to get rid of their kids. Man, go to go to the matinee. Shit was fucking. Yeah, 10 get cents. out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> okay, and that's what they were doing. Go watch so, a bunch of movies. Yeah, go watch some movies. Get out of my hair. Out of here. Yeah, that, that's what they're doing. So, you know, Ed was able to continue producing for a while. The industry overtook him, though. Better movies started to fucking appear. TV got better. Uh, the game started to become more elevated. But he, there was probably another couple movies out of Ed Wood, though, if Bella was with him. Because I think fucking Bella actually carried Ed Wood for a little bit. Edwards well, movies would have never been remembered if Bella wasn't if in Bella wasn't in them. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm mean, yeah, because Bella Lugosi was easily the yeah, you got yeah. Tor Johnson, but it's like Tor Johnson was a wrestler, so he wasn't yeah. as big a name as Bella Lugosi. He couldn't really was. do that much of a speaking part and fucking you had Bella and fucking Bella would get kids to see the movies. You know. It was, and you remember them because they were recorded and saved. Pull the because, string. Yeah, because <laughs> pull the string. Be, be, they were remembered and recorded because Bella was in them. 
Bella wasn't in those, they'd be long forgotten. That's true. So, although, like I said, there is something very entertaining about their very terribleness. Yeah. More than because one thing you could say about Ed Wood movies, movies. Yeah. is that they weren't boring. Like a lot no. of fifties, like cheap, lo, like real cheap, low budget fifties movies were just boring. It was yeah. just like a bunch. But Ed Wood movies were not because they were so bizarre. Like all the choices that he made, yeah. uh, were just so weird that it's like you couldn't help but be entertained. Yeah, and it was mostly. Um, White dudes in, well, no, they had white girls too, but a lot of it was white dudes in offices talking to each other on the phone uh-huh. about what was going to happen. Uh, people in fake cockpits, uh, white chicks coming in to fucking with a clipboard to fucking say some shit, uh, and then Bella Lugosi doing experiments. There was, you know, it was it was it was stuff like that. Out in the graveyard, but it's obviously fake. There's just all kinds of shit. Yeah, all the cardboard grave. Did. I'm into it. But there was probably a couple more movies out of the Ed Ed Wood Bell Lugosi. The Ghoul Goes West. TV. Yeah, that that movie would have probably happened, and it probably would have done just like the other ones. You know what I mean? That one sounds like the worst of them all, so You're it right, probably yeah. would have been like really entertaining. There's no telling because Ed's writing didn't get better. <laughs> okay. And eventually, well, he also had some alcoholism problems, yeah, his, yeah. admittedly. Yeah, Ed wouldn't fucking f- wouldn't use anybody else's scripts, and that's a problem. Okay, but there wasn't anybody writing for Ed. Okay, these were just p- pull it out of your ass, fucking zero budget movies. But they were movies, and they kept the, they kept old Bella fucking active. All right, and he eventually, once Bella was dead, that was the end of Ed Wood. He ended up making. Really yeah, I, think, I think he did like porn after Yeah, that. he did really bad titty movies. They weren't even really porn. They were yeah, just like softcore porn. Titty movies. Girls dancing with titties, strippers. And they're forgotten. So no, Ed Wood was remembered because of Bella Lugosi. Yeah. And Bella Lugosi fucking acted in those movies. He did he Like was I said, trying, he took it yeah, very seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't phone <laughs> that shit in. Yeah. And like I said, I will always respect that. Yeah, Bela's carrying those. Bella carried those whole fucking movies on the foot on his back, and they were they were movies for kids. Basically, they were not intended for an adult audience. So, that's not who the that's not that's not who was paying the fuck. That that's not the asses in those seats. The asses in those seats were kids. Yeah, and that was mostly what it was with science fiction and horror in that era. They didn't have adult fans really. That wasn't until later. You fucking, you know what I mean? Psycho kind of. Uh, that really did kind of change. That, the game. that because prior horror. to that, I kind of feel right. like horror and sci-fi. That was more, like you said, seen as a, like a kids genre. Mm-hmm. They didn't really take it all that seriously. Low so it's like bad. we're not gonna like make it right. good. Like we're not gonna give any quality to it. It's just like a bunch of dumb kids watching it. So yeah. Gives so they just as quick as possible, as cheap as possible. Kind of like a fucking Chinese wushu kung fu flick. Similar. They yeah. just were made quickly, um, shot and edited in camera. Uh, the guys that were making fucking Chinese wushu, they'd be they're, they're filming five movies at, at the same time, five different movies at the same time with the same cast. Yeah. And the dude's trying to keep all the shit. Stuck. Well, yeah, they're trying to like economize. Right. right yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> basically what Ed Wood was, but nowhere near the budget. Yeah, I don't even think he had enough. He, no. had, he had the same amount of money as they had. No, he had no. to steal shit to get it in the movie. Sure. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about Boris Karloff. Now that we're two hours and 30 minutes okay, in. Okay, good. I gotta go check the chicken. All right, he's gonna go check the chicken yeah. out. And uh, yeah, yeah Christopher Bell said Bell and Boris were never enemies. Yeah, I really wanted to, they really kind of like sold, like, I don't know, I kind of feel like they really played that up. Um, because yeah, like it's funny and it's rivalry and conflict and that always sells and stuff, but According to everybody that knew them and according to everybody that was around at the time, their relatives and stuff like that said, yeah, they didn't uh, hate each other at all. They had like a good they weren't friends, I don't think, but they had a good professional relationship and a lot of like mutual respect for one another. All the stuff that came out later about, you know, like I said, it's funny in Tim Burton's movie, but that's not Bela Lugosi didn't like feel that way about Boris Karloff. Like I said, he might have been a little bit professionally resentful that he wasn't as successful maybe but like i said he never i don't as far as i know he never blamed boris karloff himself for that so he wasn't like resentful toward boris karloff himself 
All right, so Boris Karloff, obviously, not his real name, uh, born William Henry Pratt in 1887, which is crazy. It's a long time ago, uh, in a place called Camberwell, uh, London, England. Now, he was actually the youngest of nine children. Now, I think either both his parents died when he was young or his dad took off and his mom died, but he didn't grow up with, like, both of his parents. Like, he was actually pretty young when they were, when he didn't have parents anymore. So he actually got raised mostly by his older siblings. Like, he had a half-sister and he had, like, some older brothers and stuff. So they were the ones that raised him because his parents were... It smells so good down there, man. It smells good up here. I had to turn it way down to 200. We'll just okay. slow cook it now. It's seared on the outside. So we'll just what you gonna make with it again? You're just baking. I make the whole some. Thing? Uh, I got rice made, or I can make mashed potatoes. I think mashed potatoes would be better. Okay, I can do it. I'm kind of over rice. We've had okay. that a lot because we've had a lot of Indian. Food I got. I um, thawed some um, hamburger. I'll make some, uh, and I got that rice. So I got old rice. I'll make some meatloaf with rice in it, and it's like uh, some green peppers from the garden and everything. Like, like meatloaf right? for tomorrow. For tomorrow, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah, because I was going to say, like, you're doing baked chicken, right? <laughs> no, no, I'm also prepping for what tomorrow. Yeah. Planning okay. ahead. That's what I thought. That's Constantly what. planning ahead. So, so, yeah, so Boris was actually, uh, because he didn't have parents uh, as younger, he was actually, like, raised by his half-sister and his older siblings. Now, a lot of his family, including uh, all of his brothers, were in diplomatic service. So they were kind of, like, high up in the government or whatever. So his dad, as we mentioned earlier, was uh, half, I believe he was half Anglo, half Indian. And because uh, his, yeah, his dad had a British dad and an Indian mother. Okay. And then Karloff's mother was also, I don't think she was half Indian, but she did have some Indian ancestry. So when Boris Karloff was a kid, like if you see pictures of him as a kid, like you can look online and I've seen him in documentaries and stuff. He was um, fairly dark skinned, like for the time. And so he did, We there's a great documentary on Shudder, if you have Shudder, that's called The Man Behind the Monster, where they kind of go into this a little bit. But he got picked on a lot because he wasn't uh, so as he, lily so, white as the other kids. So he's Western European, probably around one quarter Indian from yeah. India, not American Indian. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So You'd he, never know. You wouldn't You'd really, but when they kind but of you have to fucking put kinda, him in, when yeah. they put him, like, would have put a beard on him or, like, yeah. put some, like, he does look more. Once they mentioned it, and I'm looking at him in, 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 in color, I would go, yeah, I kind of see it. But you know what? He looks almost Arabic, like some, like Omar Sharif or something. Yeah. You remember how Omar Sharif kind of yeah, looked? Yeah, I remember. I think, I'm not even sure he was fucking Arabic, but he probably was. At least his name was. That's the thing back then. It's like a lot of you never could tell because it's like they had like a bunch of Italians playing Native Americans, yeah, all that kind of shit. His name is Omar Sharif, and you check, and he goes, "Oh man, no, he's Jewish." You know what I mean? They could just do it anything. They they named you took a stage name based upon the image you wanted and what and what you looked like and what kind of roles you were expected to get. Right, and you'd have these uh, a lot of these hotties, old silver screen hottie females. They'd have these exotic french sounding names they're from southern california they're chicana women you know part mexican that happened a so lot, a lot actually yeah, well lot. didn't like rita hayworth i think she was uh she was chicana i think she was latina i think yeah yeah and they yeah and chicana. they chicana. yeah and they and they uh dyed her hair red and yeah. like changed her name and everything like that yeah. because they didn't want they wanted her to be like you know. yeah yeah all this bullshit today they think diversity is new no diversity in the united in fucking yeah Northern but back America, then back it wasn't 200 years it wasn't as but it wasn't acknowledged as diversity yeah. though it's like we're well, trying to make everybody like not evil. on tv that's what I'm saying. TV was for the general of American audience. American TV was, and then movies were designed for a general American audience, and they were literally G-rated, a lot of that shit. And everything was made generic, and everything was made, and the generic, the generic fucking American ethnic group was just white. You know, Western European. That's who they were marketing to. That's where the money was. But when you really looked looked at the fucking people involved in this, this goes back to all of Hollywood and television. It's basically white and Hispanic with a few blacks. That's really what it was. And uh, if you go back and you also look at the actual numbers, the 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 racial makeup of Northern America has been pretty similar. About thirteen percent black, about you know fifty something or sixty percent. Um, what you would call kind of Caucasian and then the rest of them would be some kind of like 
what you would call like la- Latino today, which is funny because a lot of Latinos are Caucasian, depending on where they come from. It, it, it's a, it's ridiculous, you know, ridiculous divisions am- amongst the ethnic groups in, in North America. So, oh, Jenny's back. Okay, so I had to. Fill well, like up. I said, it's like yeah. you know, yeah, in. In practice, well, I don't even know if I want to say that, but it's like, yeah, actually there was diversity, but you weren't allowed to say that it was diversity because they were always trying to, like, put you... Trying to make it look white and generic. They were trying to, like, make it look white and generic or trying to, like, fit you. If you looked a little bit not white and generic, then they would be like, okay, well, you're an Asian. It's like, yeah, but I'm from Puerto Rico. (laughs) You know what I mean? It was like that kind of shit. Yeah, they were trying to make it more... Yeah, but you look not white. Yeah, well, you've got to be not from nearby, but on the other (laughs) side of the goddamn planet, you're real super exotic. It was like the carnival. The more exotic you were, the fucking better. If you were Chicana or fucking... Which is a mixture of basically... Irish Americans and, and well, Victor says Chicano is American born of Mexican. Descent. Yeah, yeah, it's American yeah. born of Mexican descent. But I grew up in that area, and I fucking my friends that were going to Dominguez High School, fucking more than half of them were Chicano, and the girls were Chicana, of course. Yeah, they were Mexican American, but they were also heavily racially integrated with fucking Irish Americans and German Americans. They were part Caucasian, at least half. Jeffy Art says and, Omar Sharif was Egyptian, I think. He was Egyptian? Oh, I'd okay. have to look that up. Right. I'm not really sure. And a lot of the a lot of the Chicano or, or, or Chicano people that I grew up with in, in high school, a lot of them aren't there anymore. They moved away. They moved away out of, out, out of California. They went moved deeper into the United States, and they married white people or Mexican people, just depending. It's just, just like the Native American Indians, you know. Every, everybody was interbreeding with each other. And like uh, when I was in the army, all the guys that I knew that were from the islands, like Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian and Pacific Island guys that fuck I served with, they're all here on in the mainland. They didn't go back home. And they're all married to white girls. And it, it has been going on for fucking centuries. If you make it, you end up in the fucking mainland of the United States. You end up marrying who you work with. That's all it is. Yeah, so it's harder to see, like, when he's, you know, older, like, when he's at, I guess, like, when you see, like, younger pictures. But if you see pictures of him as a kid, yeah, he was kind of, like, at least compared to, you know, the super white, like, uh, other English kids, he kind of got picked on some because he was kind of uh, dark looking. Now, he was actually uh, spent his school years in Enfield, Mm. uh, you know, which, you know, we've talked about that, Enfield poltergeist. Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, he went to Enfield Grammar School and then later went to some private schools. Yeah, what's funny is that if you're a North American, when you see Karloff, his acting work, you assume he's just some British blue blood. You know what I mean? Fucking, that's how he pulled himself off. You know what I mean? You would never know that he was of, ri- of mixed background. But the thing about it, though, yeah. was that his family, because, I mean, his they family were, were, were all bloods, consular, they, they, yeah, yeah, because so they, were rich. they were kind of yeah. like, I don't really know, and we'll kind of get into this, because I kind of feel like everybody in his family, like his brothers and everything like that, were in the consulates. They were all, like, yeah. high up in government service. Yeah. And like I said, at this time, you know, it was very, the, you know, the very colonial, like, English thing with over India and everything. So a lot of them were high up in government positions, and I kind of think that they expected him to do the same thing. Now, when he went into acting, I don't know necessarily if his family, because Bella Lugosi, his family were just kind of like, yeah, no, that's not a thing that we're doing. We, we want, like, some actual, like, trades that you've learned. Boris Karloff, I think he had that perception that his family felt that, like they expected him to go into government service just like they did. And then when he was went into acting, I think he kind of perceived himself as maybe a little bit of a black sheep. But after he got successful um, and he went back to see his family, they were actually like all into it. Now, I don't know if it was just because he got famous. So it might be that like if he was just a struggling actor, they might not have like responded to him in the same way but he i don't know why but he always like perceived that his family like thought maybe he was the black sheep because he didn't go into consular service like the rest of them did and was like an actor so i kind of feel like he maybe had a little bit of 
I don't know. He had some feelings about that, but I don't know how like accurate they were because I don't know his family. But so, uh, so yeah, so he actually did go to university with, uh, you know, at first, like in the early 1900s, with a view to going along the same lines as his family was, but he really wasn't having it and he dropped out. And then he just kind of like wandered around, like he left England and he actually went to Canada. And much like Bella Lugosi, like he kind of worked his way across. He basically worked on farms uh, and just did odd manual labor like trying to work his way across the country, like Canada in his case, uh, United States in Bela Lugosi's case, but same kind of like, uh, ended up in pretty much the same place. Now, the thing about uh, Boris Karloff was that not only uh, was he mixed race, uh, he was also, when he was younger, bow-legged, and he had a lisp, which actually he still had, like for all of his life, but... You can kind of hear it in the movies. You can hear it, yeah, and that's yeah. the thing, but... Uh, it's like it made it he made it work for him yeah like i kind of feel like he did try to get rid of it but he never could and i guess in the end maybe he was just like fuck it i'm just gonna like you know lean into it it was a classy list and it was <laughs> yeah and so you know and i kind of feel like it almost kind of like worked in his favor which well, is we, weird that's that's kind of like a good that's a good like example of like using a weakness quote unquote yeah. And making it something that's like distinctive to you because that's like his voice is one of the most iconic things about him, yeah. even though he obviously did have a list. There's a scene where he's talking to fucking, uh, fucking Lugosi in Black Cat over the damn chessboard, and he's this satanic, like Sith Lord inside his castle. This futuristic fucking, well, it was futuristic back then, but it even looked, it was very night, very Art Deco looking tower of glass and steel and shit and he's moving the chess pieces around fucking and they're playing for the fate of this young american couple with the hot chick and shit and fucking he's gonna try to steal the hot chick vetus is gonna try to save her and he's talking to vetus and he's obviously lisping in that but yeah. it sounds cool the that's way, what i'm the way saying he's playing that's play, the, the way the, the that... way he plays it off I mean, he's normally like, I kind no of Vetus, then you and I, and, and, and like, and he's like, yeah, I will get you, Shamar. You know, yeah, he's obviously lisping. I, yeah. I, I recognize that even back in the day. Yeah, but it's just he has a really cool accent, and the way he delivers it, it sounds like real stylish. He just, That's what know, I mean. That's yeah. kind of like a prime example of something that in most people yeah that would be like something that you would need to overcome because it was like yeah. an imperfection. But for whatever reason. It worked for him. Yeah. I think that he, like I said, I think he did try to not have it. Like, he did have, um, you know, he was bow-legged, and he did kind of, like, work his way through that. But he never could get rid of that lisp. And I think after a while, he was just like, I'm just going to have it. Yeah. And that became, like, a signature. And like I said, his voice is probably one of his most iconic things. He Shit, he would do voiceovers later on in his career. Yeah. And that was kind of one of the things that he was most famous for was that voice. So it wasn't a detriment in the end. I think that's like a really good example of like using something that would normally be seen as a weakness. And in in anyone else's case, it might have been. But the fact that he just owned it and it just became a thing that he had and it worked for him. I don't think it would work for everybody. It just depends. But it worked for him. So it was, was the that. delivery. Yeah, I think, I mean, the and fact that Slow he, and measured delivery, yeah. his facial expressions, and yeah, that, that's how he got it. Like over. I said, it just, it made him very distinctive, because yeah. like I said, it was just, he had that great face, and that great, like, which was kind of craggy, and he was yeah. kind of like, and then he, he had like that- statue. Yeah, and then he had like that voice that had like a little bit of a lisp to it, but it was, the, it was okay, like, you know what I mean? I don't know, yeah. it's just, it was just a whole I'm thing. I'm gonna plug the Black Cat, on. people. Go see the Black Cat voice. Yeah, Carl we did a review of it a while back. Yeah. It's so, it's really good. It's got it's both really these good. guys in it, and fucking they're both, it's, it's, it's their best work, and they're both, they're the right age, and the edit, and the way it's shot, and the art, and the fucking, the script is really good. It's a fucking good movie. That's the that's the best movies that they that they both did. If you ask me, they had I mean, a lot of great. They movies, were in a lot of good movies. But together. when they were together, that's their best movie. Yeah, I think it's the best movie where they're. You know both what? It's, we, we should probably do like a thing like all of Lugosi and uh, Lug Lugosi and Karloff's movies that they did together. Yeah, and see which one is the best one. I'm gonna say I've seen a bunch of them, and that's the one that stands out. To I don't me. know. The Body Snatcher is pretty good too. Although that was good. like a, that was like a later that one. That same but... one. Um, the Black Cat 
And the Raven was the Raven is came on the same VHS tape, and mm-hmm. I li- and I liked the Black Cat a lot better than the Raven. Isn't that the one where Boris Karloff uh, is he's a criminal? He's got to get his face changed. Wait, did that happen in that? Yeah, and and and, and I haven't seen the Raven. Bella goes. He's kind of like a plastic surgeon. He could change the way his face looked. He was on the run, and he's yeah. Now what? Black Cat and the Raven. I think it might have been the Raven. It's black and white, right? I don't know. That's not... That was on maybe. Rock. Maybe that's what I... Like I said, Black I haven't Cat, seen the Raven in a long time. They were Poe... I know that both of them had Poe titles, but they had nothing to do with the Edgar Allan Poe Well, I know stories. the Raven had nothing to do with yeah. like the, They just called it I think it that, that might be the same one. Because they so, were trying to So, Karloff isn't the criminal on the run that needs his... I don't chase. remember. I haven't seen okay. it in a long time. Okay, yeah. I haven't seen it in a long time. All right. Because I remember seeing that movie, but I get it confused with like some other ones. Okay. So I'm not really sure if that's the same one. I thought Raven. I thought the Raven was more like the comedic one that was more like a, like a thing that had. Because I thought it had Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff, and I thought that um, uh, that shit. What's his name? Uh, was in Peter Lorre. Um, Peter Lorre. Yeah, yeah that's I thought a color he was one. in it. That's a color one. This I was, thought he this was in it black as well. and white. It's the same around the same time that. Yeah, Christopher around. Bell said the Raven is uh, Vincent Price and Peter Lorre. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was thinking. There was it was the one that came on the VHS tape that had the black cat on it. It's the black cat, and then there was another. Maybe it was Pit and the Pendulum. And it Pit had Boris Pen- Karloff. Pit well, and Pit and the goes. Pendulum just had Vincent Price in it. That was Vincent. That was a Vincent no, Price. No, this is thirties. Oh, okay. It's black and white. Wait, did they make Pit and the Pendulum back and in the Yeah, it was black and white, and it was it had Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi in it, and it had a Poe title. And it was one, it was made after the Black Cat. But only like maybe a year or two. Oh, shit, man. I can't remember which one. I don't know. We might get into it, but okay. let's, uh, All right. yeah. Christopher Bell also points out Karloff was a founding member of the Screen Actors Guild. Yeah, I want to get into that, too, because he was, like, really instrumental in uh, doing that. He was a very big advocate of uh, actors' rights, which you'll find out why later on because of the shit that happened to him <laughs> when he was, like, filming Frankenstein. So, uh, so Yeah. So he basically, so he comes over to Canada and, uh, you know, starts working manual labor and trying to get kind of like acting jobs. So he f- joins this company called the Gene Russell Company in 1911 and started like touring all around Canada in various like stage productions and stuff like that. He also was doing manual labor on the side, like he worked as a railway baggage handler for a while. And then he got another job with another theater company that was in North Dakota and they had an opera house over like a hardware store and they would like do productions in there. So he was doing that kind of stuff. So like I said, it's not like he wasn't like an overnight success. He was he had been working and like doing this kind of stuff like for most of his 20s and 30s. He didn't really get famous until he was in his 40s. Now, um, because of the manual labor that he had been doing in Canada and the U.S., like trying to make money, like while he was trying to get his acting career established, Uh, he actually got really bad back problems. And because of these back problems, he actually ended up not fighting in World War I because he had so many health problems. So uh, Boris Karloff eventually uh, made his way to Hollywood and was in a bunch of silent films, usually as, like, in very, very small roles. And kind of in between he still had to keep doing manual labor so he would like dig ditches or you know just work on construction sites that kind of shit like in between because most of the roles he had around this time period were very 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 small um some of his early roles were like in kind of serials like he was in one called the masked rider from 1919 uh he was in one called the hope diamond mystery from 1920 there's like some other ones that he was in around this time period but like never any leading roles or anything like that He usually would get cast as, you know, exotic foreigner type roles, like Bela Lugosi did. Uh, You know, he's Arabian, he's Indian, he was was almost always a villain, that kind of thing. Now, one movie that he was in that actually probably was, I know Frankenstein was like his iconic role, but I think his breakout role where people like noticed him was another movie from 1931 that was called The Criminal Code. Now, this actually wasn't a horror movie, obviously, it was like a prison drama. And he um, he had actually played this same part, I think, like in a stage production. And then he was like in the movie and that actually like earned him a lot of attention. 
that he was in this film. So, uh, so I think that was kind of like what maybe was instrumental in getting him uh, some work. There was he was in another movie too in 1931 where he played. It wasn't a main character, but he was like a supporting role, and it was a movie that uh, was called Five Star Final. And that movie actually ended up winning uh, the Oscar for Best Picture that year. And because he was a supporting role in it, so that brought him some attention as well. It was called The Raven. Yeah, that's what we said. Boris Karloff, okay, Bela Lugosi. Like, okay, I'm thinking of a different Yeah, it was 1930. I'm thinking of like the later one that yeah. they made. I'm thinking of the later one they made. So, uh, so yeah. 1935. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, all right. From... From all of that, uh, he started to get attention, and so they cast him as the monster in Frankenstein. And as I mentioned earlier when we were talking about Bela Lugosi, Bela Lugosi later on said that he was the one that recommended, because Bela Lugosi, like I said, was offered the role of Frankenstein's monster in the movie and turned it down for whatever reason. And he said that he was the one that recommended Boris Karloff to, but I'm not sure if that's true or not. But because the story I heard was that James Whale, who directed Frankenstein, actually saw Boris Karloff in like the commissary, like the, um, you know, the cafeteria or whatever, and saw his face and was like, oh my God, like I could do so much shit with that face. And so that's how he got it. But I don't really know. I don't know what the story was. Everybody tells a different one. So, uh, so 1931, Frankenstein, James Wells' Frankenstein, the classic, came out, and that made Boris Karloff a massive star, like, overnight. Now, obviously, the costume that he had to wear, uh, they put four-inch platform boots on him, and they had to bulk him up, so he was wearing, like, all this padding and stuff, so it would make him look, like, way larger. So, um, and also he had like all the makeup they were putting on his face, like the iconic Jack Pierce makeup that took about four hours to put on. So Boris would have to get there at five in the morning, like to the set. And then, uh, they would put all the makeup on every single day. And then he'd have to put all the stuff on. There was weights. There was all kind of stuff. So, uh, the, the shoes, I believe what I've heard, like weighed 11 pounds each. So, you know. He had to kind of clomp around in that stuff, and I'm sure it wasn't fun. So basically, uh, yeah, so the makeup on Frankenstein was so iconic that actually Universal went out of their way, which I think, I don't know if this had been done previously, but they actually went out of their way to like copyright the uh, creature design. And I don't know if that had been done prior to this or not, but because it was so iconic and they were just like, yeah, we don't want anybody doing that. That's why when you see like later Frankenstein movies, you can't do the same thing unless you like pay Universal because that's kind of like their property. So there's that. Now, a year after that, uh, as I mentioned, Boris Karloff also played Imhotep in The Mummy. I haven't seen it, Jenny. We've got to see it. I love them. I haven't seen it. Honestly, like I said, as awesome as the makeup in Frankenstein is, yeah. um, which is amazing, but I really, really like Boris Karloff. I really like the makeup they did on him in The Mummy. I think he looks super, super cool. And I honestly really, well, I'm into like mummy stuff and like, you know, uh, ancient Egypt kind of stuff anyway. So I don't know. I really, really like Boris Karloff in that. And I'm not like saying like, cause Frankenstein is amazing and I love the original. I also want to see Karloff's Fu Manchu. They said it's a great movie. That's fucking weird as shit. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Cause he was, yeah, he was in a yeah. bunch of stuff. So yeah, he was in the mummy, which again, very iconic. And that whole like picture of him, like as in, Oh, I love that shit. I think that even looks better than Frankenstein. Uh, but he was also in uh, another iconic uh, old film from this time, the old dark house, uh, which also had Charles Lawton in it. And he was in The Mask of Fu Manchu, which uh, Tom just mentioned. So basically, yeah, he was in all these like in within like a year or two. So he's like an international star. As I mentioned earlier, it got to a point just within a year or two where he was one of those guys where he just went by one name. You could just put Karloff on the poster and everybody would come see that shit because he was like super famous. So as I mentioned, even though... I don't know why, but I always, per I guess because of Frankenstein, I always perceived that Boris Karloff was w a way bigger motherfucker than Bela Lugosi. But Bela Lugosi apparently was six foot one and Boris Karloff was five foot 11, which like I said, is not short, but I don't know. That's kind of like upsets my whole weird. <laughs> that's like a whole weird thing. I always thought Boris Karloff was way taller than Bela Lugosi, but I guess not. 
Uh, so yeah, so Boris Karloff was five at eleven. So basically, Karloff didn't have, even though he got famous from Frankenstein and the Mummy and stuff like that. I think because those two roles were heavily dependent on makeup or like being, you know, very obviously a monster. I don't think he got typecast in the same way because if you're going to be Dracula, I mean, that's mostly you. He's, you know, Dracula is mostly like a human. He looks like a human being. Whereas like if you're Frankenstein's monster, stitched together corpses, and if you're a mummy, you're a mummy. So it's just kind of like there's that's a lot of makeup going on. So I don't think Karloff got, he did like do a lot of horror movies, but I don't think he got typecast in the same way that Bela Lugosi did. And like I said, it's probably like luckier for him that he was a native English speaker. So he didn't have that thick accent and everything. Yes. He had some other things to overcome. Like he had a lisp and blah, blah, blah. But it, I don't think he had the same obstacles to overcome that maybe Bela Lugosi did. And the thing about um, Karloff too, was that he had played because he had played so many uh, diverse roles prior to Frankenstein. I don't think anybody especially typecast him in horror films, even though he was in a lot of horror films and he would always kind of play those kind of characters, but he was pretty easily able to get other roles, uh, you know, in genres other than horror, much easier than uh, Lugosi did. And another thing too, somebody mentioned it earlier, he was actually in the original Scarface from 1932. So there was that. Um, and he played like a soldier in a 1934 movie called uh, The Lost Patrol, which was made by John Ford. And he looks actually great in that. I saw like some stills from it. So that's kind of the thing. Yeah, mostly it was horror was his thing, but he was in like shit tons of Dems other movies Don't forget well. Grinch Stole Christmas. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Yeah. We're going to get to that. But uh, so, yeah. And honestly, as I said, because... Bella Lugosi had been sort of, um, he was supposed to be the guy that was taking over the mantle from Lon Chaney because Lon Chaney, you know, obviously Phantom of the Opera, he was like, you know, man of a thousand faces and he died, you know, earlier than he should have. So they thought Bella Lugosi was going to kind of like take that over. That didn't necessarily happen, but they had these two big horror icons and, they so they started putting them in movies together and honestly it's just kind of like i don't know if it's not the same dynamic as you know your other big horror pair up which is christopher lee and peter cushing it's not necessarily the same thing but i man i always really really liked seeing bella lugosi and boris karloff in a movie together it's like I, I don't know there's just such the chemistry between them is different like i said than christopher lee and peter cushing but I don't know. There was just something really cool in the way that they like worked off of each other. So, uh, so yeah, the thing about it. Okay. So Karloff was in Frankenstein, obviously. Then he was in Bride of Frankenstein from 1935, which is crazy because it's one of the few sequels that people actually say is better than the original. I don't know if I'd go that far because they are different. Bride of Frankenstein is more a black comedy, but I don't know. They're both different, but I like them for different reasons. Uh, he was also in Son of Frankenstein, which he wasn't super excited about. I think he was in his 50s at that point. And I think at that in Son of Frankenstein, well, actually in Bride of Frankenstein, I think they actually had him talk and he wasn't really into that uh, decision because he thought that the character was better if he didn't talk. But, you know, he still did it anyway because, you know, everybody got to work. Now, Son of Frankenstein also had Bela Lugosi in it. So there's that. Now, he was also in another movie called House of Frankenstein in 1944, in which he played the doctor more than, like, the monster. Although he's not called Dr. Frankenstein. I think he's called Dr. Neiman. But it's kind of like the same situation. Uh, so he also played, like, some other, like, mad scientist characters later on. Like, he actually did play Dr. Frankenstein in uh, Frankenstein 1970 in 1958. And he actually played the grandson of the original creator. So he was actually, like willing to go with the mythos and like play some other stuff now here was another thing there was a kind of a cheaper studio called monogram pictures and i think uh, lugosi did some uh, work for them as well so in the late 1930s boris karloff was in some movies there as well now he played a character named james lee wong a chinese detective obviously boris karloff is not chinese by any stretch of the imagination 
but uh yeah he <laughs> but he was in some and like you said he played fu manchu like earlier on but yeah he also this played, is standard shit he man. played yeah he played yeah. a chinese detective just, well that happened a lot like but i'm not saying it's good i'm just saying that happened a lot back in the actors early. fucking did any role you give them pretty much yeah all the way up to the fucking 80s and 90s they did that 80s 80s pretty much oh yeah tom, was not, tom the, uh tom baker fucking um uh my favorite doctor who all right no he didn't play it yeah yeah he did he did fucking um playing an arab yeah fucking uh sinbad in one of the sinbad movies yeah, i think it was at 81 no 79 77 it's just the way it was an actor would, could do any role I thought that movie was earlier I thought it was late 60s or it no, could, maybe 70s. it could be early to mid 70s ah, I can't took remember me to see it. oh okay yeah, late, late I remember 70s. we reviewed it but I can't remember yeah, what yeah. year it came out no. uh, Legendre 007 says were Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing acting together in Hammer Horror movies from the very beginning yes um, actually the first Hammer Horror movie and we actually talked about this because we're going to put up a review of Horror of Dracula uh, from 1958, like, that's going up on Friday. But the first Hammer, like, uh, remake of, like, a classic Universal movie, which was Curse of Frankenstein, which came out in 1957, uh, did have both Christopher Lee as the monster and uh, Peter Cushing as Dr. Frankenstein. So, yeah, they were in it from the beginning. We did a show about them, like, uh, a while back. So, it's, like I said, it's a different dynamic, the two of them. But... Man, they were always awesome. I uh, honestly, I kind of liked when they were, even though most of their movies they were, you know, it's either Doctor Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster, or you know, one's Dracula and one's Van Helsing. So they were usually like at odds. But I kind of like ones where they worked together too. I thought that was kind of cool because they seemed like because they were friends in real life, which I thought was kind of neat. But I was kind of like that. But Lugosi and Karloff, I think I liked them better. I liked them better when they were antagonists. I think they played off each other better as antagonists. But I haven't seen enough of it to know. But, that's uh, what I'm saying. But yeah, I'm they, not, I mean, they were good either way. Like I said, they were both amazing actors. So, uh, yes, yeah, uh, they said, oh, maybe that's why the dynamic with Bella Lugosi and Boris Karloff was different. They each first got famous independently. That's probably why. Like they weren't really like teamed up. I feel like Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, they. Yeah, they had, like, um, you know, careers before that, but they were pretty much teamed up from the beginning of the Hammer horror cycle, whereas these two were kind of like, they were in their separate movies, and then people were like, the studios were like, oh, both of these movies are successful, so let's put these guys together, type of thing. There was that. So, yeah, so Boris Karloff did play a Chinese detective uh, in a few movies, and uh, for he actually like you know he played Frankenstein's monster a couple more times. The last time he actually did the Frankenstein makeup was in 1962, and they did a Halloween episode of the TV series Route 66. Anybody remember that? Which also had Peter Lorre and Lon Chaney Jr. on it, because obviously Lon Chaney Sr. was long dead by that point. So um, yeah, so we're talking about the movies that they did together. Like I said, the Black Cat, which is your favorite, that was 1934. Yeah. They were also in several other movies together, uh, including one called Gift of Gab, that was also 1934. The Raven from 1935. Uh, Invisible Ray from 1936. One called Black Friday from 1940. Another one called You'll Find Out, uh, that was also 1940. And The Body Snatcher from 1945, which I, I really like The Body Snatcher, like I said. Uh, I haven't seen it. Yeah, it's good. I like it. Um, he was also in a movie called Tower of London in 1939 with Basil Rathbone. Uh, Bella Lugosi wasn't in that. Uh, he actually played uh, the henchman of King Richard III, so there you go with that. And he also uh, was kind of like did a British intelligence kind of role, like a movie called British Intelligence where he was like a spy kind of movie. Now, in 1944, like I said, and uh, because of all of the uh, stuff that he endured playing Frankenstein, uh, like I said, all the padding and the weights and the makeup and all that kind of stuff, uh, he had a lot of back problems throughout his life, not only from the movies, but also from all the manual labor that he'd done, like while he was working his way across Canada and the United States. So in 1944, uh, actually, Boris Karloff had to have a uh, spinal operation because he had uh, arthritis, like in his back. 
So in the late 1940s, well, mid-1940s, 1940, 1946, he was actually in some films uh, for RKO, which were produced by Val Luton, who also made some really good movies, particularly in the 1940s, Cat People being my favorite, which is another one that we should probably review. Uh, that was one of those was The Body Snatcher, one of those was called Isle of the Dead, and one of them was called Bedlam. And I think that he seemed like Karloff really seemed to be into these because they seemed like more he liked like more higher end he was a very educated kind of guy so he liked the monster movies but i think he wanted to do something more like elevated horror a little bit and that's kind of what these were so he was like really into that um you know he's basically like yeah i was in the frankenstein movies but i think we've done everything we can do with that and he said he even said this is really funny i found this like quote He's like, the last Frankenstein movie that he was in, which is called House of Frankenstein, he's like, uh, he called it a monster clam bake. He's monster. like, e he's like everything was that Frankenstein, Dracula, there was a hunchback, there was a man beast. It was yeah. a, so he's like, it was too much. Yeah. Um, and he thought it was like ridiculous and he didn't want to do it anymore. So he wanted to do, like, he didn't mind doing horror, but he wanted to do something that was a little bit more like cerebral, I guess, because that what was kind of more his thing. he's thinking about what they're imagining, thing. it was kind of like, fuck, okay, this is kind of like, uh, what he, I know exactly what he's talking about. Let's put it in a different. Let's put it in a different genre. Okay, kind of like how Bruce Lee was saying, martial arts fucking suck. There needs to be a new kind of fight where you can fight. You know what I mean? And get hurt and fucking and, and it is real fighting. And he was talking about MMA. All right. What what Karloff is talking about is Alien One and aliens. That's what he's talking about. Alien One was fucking cerebral, and he's also talking about shit like. He's talking about shit like fucking, uh, uh, what was the name of it? Blade Runner. Pretty cerebral. That's what he's talking about. But they just didn't have the technology then. Well, that's, and you know, and I get that. Because yeah. me, like I said, being a big horror fan, I, look, I yeah. love schlocky horror. I love gore. I love yeah. all that kind of stuff. I love all kind of horror. I'm not picky. But my favorite stuff is more... <laughs> Like I said, like elevated stuff. I like more yeah. literary stuff. I kind of tend to like stuff that's a bit deeper or a bit, but I like trashy shit too. It just depends on like what mood I'm in. I was a kid when Alien came out. My dad took me to see it for theater. There was nothing like that back then. That was state of the art. It was like leaving the planet and going to space and seeing a real alien. So I couldn't understand the, these these old timey actress actress I can imagine what it is that they're thinking. They could probably imagine stuff like that, but the budget wasn't there. The technology wasn't there. They didn't even have color film yet. You know? But there's a bunch of shit that could have been done that wasn't being done. Well, that's the thing, and I kind of feel like we brought this up a little bit on our uh, upcoming Horror of Dracula review, where Christopher Lee, I think, even though he likes playing Dracula, I think he was always frustrated because he wanted... Yeah. Like I said, he was more of like a literary guy and he really yeah. liked the book. And so he really wanted something closer to the book. And so I think I kind of, he kind of got frustrated that it was like kept getting farther and farther away. From the book, <laughs> like right. from the book, like from the source material. And he's like, I want to play something like just like the book. Like he wanted it more like literary, but they never really did do yeah, that. So and they still haven't. He's talking about a Netflix miniseries now. I really wish they would yeah. kind of do that. Although it's I kind of feel like, I don't know. Like Dracula is so like played out, but. Yeah, it's, been, it's played out. But it's nobody, nobody has made a fucking Dracula movie that's like the book. Nobody. Hmm. Although somebody in the comments mentioned that Dracula Untold is a good modern it is. Dracula story. But that's I more like about it. Vlad the Impaler. Right. And the thing about Still it is that movie. the novel, I don't know, it kind of like sort of maybe backhandedly like hints around yeah. that it's like maybe he's talking about Vlad the Impaler, but he doesn't like mention that by name or anything like that. I think but, he's inspired. It's inspired by. Yeah. So, you know, so it's not crazy that, like, films are saying, hey, he's talking about Vlad the Impaler. He probably was, but which, he didn't, like, overtly say that. Which would piss off a Valachian because fucking uh, Prince Vlad Draco, or, you know, what was his name? What was his real name? Prince, Ve uh, Prince, Prince Vlad Sepis. Tepis, yeah. Tepis or Sepish. I've heard it pronounced either way. Because they said that sometimes that T is supposed to be silent. And uh, he was actually a hero of Wallachia. Yeah, they fucking liked Well, yeah, him. they got statues of him yeah. there and everything. Okay. He was a badass. He was just a military potentate protecting the place from fucking the Ottoman Empire. And he did it by any means necessary. Bitch got job done. You'd get impaled, okay, if you came into his land. And he also, zero tolerance for crime. Zero. Which meant that you could leave a bar of gold out and nobody would take it. 
because not only would you pay, so would your family. So there was no stealing. Now, nowadays, people go, oh, well, you can't do that. Well, no, yeah, you can. He did it. He did it a long time ago. Uh, would it fly today? Not here. Uh, but, you know, that those days may come again. We'll see. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Okay. I know, I know what they're talking about. They want better movies. They want better movies. They want better scripts. They want better stories. Well, that's go the back thing. And like, you look at that shit. Fucking, some of them were good, but, man, they're so limited by the technology, you know. Well, that's the thing. It's just like any, I mean, actors, writers, anybody like that. They're, you know, that's, you're an artist and you kind of want, yeah. so you kind of want like specific things and you're not really getting it. Particularly something that's, I mean, a writer, you can kind of do your own thing because it's just you. But when you're working in film, that's a very much a collaborative effort. And so I can see how it'd be frustrating if you're an actor and you're like, wow, yeah. I really wish it would be like this because everyone's going to see my fucking face right. like up on the screen and I'm going to get blamed for this if it sucks. So, you and know, even though honest. it's not necessarily you that's ruining yeah. it. And let's be honest, <laughs> after that Hayes Code hit, everything got dumbed down. Those movies are fucking dumb because there's a bunch of shit you couldn't do. The bad guys could never win fucking uh all evil had to be punished so there's all kinds of fucking hokey shit you couldn't do a fucking real accurate story you know imagine if you had the haze codes during alien yeah <laughs> and it would have never worked so much of that shit would have been thrown out they couldn't have done it i kind of so, feel like they weren't even really allowed to do like nuance yeah, until no like nuance. the 60s see it ended up being very generic over and over again and that's that's one of the reasons why I got impressed by the Black Cat is pre Hayes Code and that shit there is man pushing the boundaries. You're like, yeah, okay, fucking incest. Well, not incest, but necrophilia. Implied necrophilia. And, yeah, sure. implied necrophilia. Everything was implied. Yeah. You got to. They were classy about it. They, because they didn't get into dude's private life. But what they're showing you, that's what it means. You know what yeah. I mean? Just. You got to see it for yourself. It's a good movie. It's classy through the whole thing. But I think it made people mad. They're like, oh, that's just unacceptable. <laughs> well, that's what know. I mean. It's cyclical but, because back yeah. then they were just like, oh, my God, everyone's like right. degenerates now. Like back in the right. 19, early 1930s. Yeah. And uh, all all of the blame can be laid at the feet of Hollywood. And like these yeah. movies, they're making everyone degenerate. So we have to kind of like take out all this stuff because it's giving uh, people ideas. The, Look, man, <laughs> Hollywood didn't make people degenerate. What made people degenerate was bad writing, okay? If you got good writing, you can tell any evil-ass story as long as the writing is good, okay? I'm a if big advocate of that. If the writing is mediocre, if the writing is fucking mediocre, you could tell a good story and it still fucks you up. Because you're like, oh, no, no. I'm just no, saying, no, like, can't be, you know, right? And I'm not just saying that because yeah. I'm a writer myself, but yeah. writers are kind of like the unsung heroes. That's it's where right. that's where the fucking story is coming right. from. Right. Yeah, y'all yeah. could fuck it up, like in the bigger thing, but it's like I kind of feel like if you have a good script, yeah, then that is that goes a long way toward yeah. like making a good. Yeah. I I'll, I'll I will kind of like. I'm going to say, like, and I'm not saying that it's like, yeah, everybody has a role. Actors, cinematographers, everything like that. But honestly, if you have a shitty script, um, you'd have to have really, like, supernaturally good, like, uh, actors and cinematographers and stuff to overcome that. Yeah. Also, I will say, on the back end, uh, editors. Editors, yeah. unsung heroes of Hollywood. So I'm going to say writers and editors don't get enough credit. All the people in between, like the director and the cinematographer and actors, they get credit. They get credit, but I kind of feel like the writer at the front end and the editor at the back end. I don't think you guys realize like how much that shit has to do with how the final product comes. Yeah, out. but I'm telling you what, when it came to those old movies, that 1930-something Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, Black Cat that I've been talking about before had a fantastic script, and there's something missing. Something got cut out of there. It has nothing to do with Edgar Allan Poe. It's about a dude who sacrificed his military unit during fucking the war. I think it was the Austro-Hungarian War, maybe? Yeah. He sacrificed him there to consecrate the ground to build his satanic temple. The officer was a Satanist. Boy, man, you didn't hear stories like that for a long, long time. Once that Hayes Code was done, you, all that shit stopped. And not in a credible sense. And a dude, and, Bor and Bela Lugosi comes out of a military prison called the Cool Gall. 
and he was one of fucking Herr Shalmar's fucking men, and he's going to get vengeance. And he also wants to know what happened to his wife, because fucking his commander stole his wife. And fucking they're up there in that damn castle that he built. It's, it's a steel and glass castle with sliding glass automatic doors and an intercom system. And it's, you know, it's something that back in the 30s you just you didn't see. It was fucking decades ahead. Because, of course, a Satanist, a Satanist has superior technology. It's just, and then all these rich people come for their satanic fucking rituals and shit. It's just, it's just a badass script, you know. And, uh... You didn't see things like that at that level after those haze codes started because it was, they had to tone it down. <laughs> they toned it down too much, you know. But you like could I said, see which way it was going. You could see the way horror sci-fi was going and it was going in a fucking good direction because it was weird shit, man, but it was stylish. They knew what they were doing. Uh, it would Had they stopped, had they not had that haze code it would have progressed. I think it would have. We would have had fucking honestly, badass Honestly, probably moves. we would have got like genres we know nowadays. We yeah. probably got would have got that much Long earlier, time ago. right? Because as it was now, it's like everything was kind of stymied, right? So everything kind of had to go in another direction, uh, and then it wasn't really till the sixties or seventies where shit like yeah. really busted. And out. And they really were worried. They they weren't. They were worried too much because the dudes that were writing this shit, they knew what they were doing. They, you know, you, they didn't really need to be controlled. It would, it would have been all right. It would have been nothing compared to what you saw today. Uh, the, but, I, but the writing would have been better. They knew how to write. I mean, holy they crap! Nowadays, you guys, you can publish a book literally called "Baby Fucker," mm -hmm. and it's fine. Right, yeah, you could, yeah, and the quality could be bad, and it would still be out there. I haven't read it. I've just, yeah. I've just seen that because yeah. I've seen it like on some other horror channels that yeah. like they read it because it's like obviously gonna yeah. read it because it's called Baby Fucker. But it's like now I kind of want to read it because the title. But you know, what I mean, I mean? So it, it's like it's some gross, <laughs> some gross horror shit. You know? And that's what I mean. It's like right. I'm kind of like. Look, and I will argue, I, I don't think that you should, like, censor anything. Like, look, you can write whatever shitty shit you want. I don't really give crap. Write whatever you want. Um, you know, nobody has to read it. Nobody's forcing you to read it. To an extent, I do like some extreme horror, but I do kind of feel like there's a fine line between I'm writing extreme horror to, like, push the boundaries of what's acceptable, which is good. We need to do that. Or I'm just writing fucked up shit because I'm an edge lord that wants attention. You know what I mean? It's a very, yeah. very fine line. Right. So I kind of feel like. Yeah, because no, no matter how it was going, you never would have saw some shit like Human Centipede until fucking way later. Anyway, you weren't gonna stop the fucking prog the march of fucking the, of time. No. You know what I mean? Our imagination. Shit will was not be like that gonna happen. <laughs> but here's the thing. I liked Human Centipede. I, I, didn't, I liked the first one. Yeah, I never really... Could have done this, without the sequels. I never but. really finished the second one. It got too boring. And I was just like... I, I fucking made two or three different runs on fucking Human Centipede 2. Yeah. Couldn't get through it. But Human Centipede 1 it made me feel very uncomfortable. So it, And that's what so it was it, supposed it to do. So it did its job. It, it was supposed to do that. You know what I mean? And I was like, yeah, okay, it's a good movie. And they were having fun making it, I could tell. You know and it was troll. It, it was a troll. They were fucking trolling your ass, trying to see how much they could get away with to make you uncomfortable. It was a story. They figured it out. They thought about it. <laughs> like I they said, didn't think about I don't it. know. Like they I figured it all out. I have like a weird relationship. Like I like yeah. a lot of extreme horror, yeah. but I don't. I like it if you're using extreme horror to like say something. I don't necessarily like it if you're just trying to be like, hey, look at me. Like, look how edge lordy I am. I you know think what I mean? Human centipede was that. It was and yeah, and it I was kind about of feel, making you feel uncomfortable. Which okay, fine. It worked. It takes a lot to make me it uncomfortable. It made me feel very uncomfortable. It takes a lot to make it me made uncomfortable. Me feel very uncomfortable. That Although makes, I yeah. will say I don't I don't like the whole the pooping thing. Well it, of course. It That's was I mean. meant to make you feel uncomfortable. I would feel very sure. uncomfortable. Yeah. Like I can watch any, like pretty much anything, and it yeah. doesn't really bother me all that much. And I'm not saying that to be a badass. I'm just saying and the one in like, the back starved to death. Right. Yeah, that was some fucking. But that's know, the thing. Like, it's oh. like any, like the second, like I can watch gore all day long. Yeah. You can pop out people's eyeballs. You can do yeah. like I don't really care about that. Yeah. But 
The second you start like pooping in people's mouths or like mm. vomiting and then drinking yeah. it or something like that, then I'm gonna be like, I'll watch it, but I'm just kind of like, ah, oh, god damn it, evil, I, don't, I don't like any of that. Evil kind of scientist stuff. scatophile fucking joins all these people <laughs> together into a human centipede. And fucking the one in the front is trying not to fucking let everybody down for a long time. It's fucking funny. It's not funny, all right, because he just abducts that, them. That would really suck in, if in that the, happened yeah. to you in real life. Yeah, he's got them all sewn together. Which I can't happen. help, but I know it's, like, funny. It's, like, a funny premise, but... You know, they were laughing when they came up with the idea. I'm sure they went, did. But then, then it worked, making, though, because yeah. we're still talking about it yeah. this many years Then they're years making later. the movie... And then they're trying to say, we're going to fuck them up when they see this movie. And it worked. It worked for me. I was like, oh, man. You know what I mean? And it worked because I remember In that a movie. way, I don't know. Like, I don't know if this makes me, like, the worst horror fan or the best horror fan because I'm so, I'm so empathetic that the first thing I do is, like, is think to, uh, like, what would it be like to actually be in that situation myself or yeah. see, like, my loved ones, like, in yeah. that situation. Yeah. So... You'd think that that would make me not want to watch it because I'd be overly sensitive, but it's actually like the opposite. And I'm not really sure. I can't explain it. You're a psycho. I can't explain it. You're a psycho. All right. I own that. (laughs) (laughs) We got to get back to this. You say that like an insult, but it's... No, I smell a chicken down there and I got to fucking make sure that they're there. Yeah, flock of seagulls. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I got them that for Christmas. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's Tom Six Edgelord. Like, a little bit. That's the guy that made Human Centipede. Yeah. A little bit. Um... Like I said, I'm not real into like poop stuff because it just seems like that's. It seems like easy. It's an easy way to like gross somebody out. Everybody's grossed out by poop, except for maybe like a small percentage of people, which I'm not judging. But I'm just saying that most people are grossed out by poop and vomit. So, if you're gonna put that in a movie, yeah, it's gonna gross people out. It grossed me out. Uh, made me gag. So there's that. But. I don't know. I don't, I don't mind that. And I think there's a place for it. I wouldn't say, like, oh, you shouldn't make that. Or it's like, make whatever you want. I don't give a crap. Like, and I'll probably watch it. But, I mean, for me, like, stuff that's more scary for me or stuff that's more effective for me is I want to see somebody make some shit that's scary without, like, scary or gross without having to resort to that. You know what I mean? Uh, to me, that I think that takes a lot more talent. But I'm not shitting on, like, exploitation books because I love those, too. So, I don't know. I like it all. I'm not, like, super picky. Uh, yeah. Oh, on the topic of poop in the mouth, I see you talked about Mad God. I have to watch you read. Yeah. We just watched that not too long ago. On I, I really liked it, but, you know. So, there's that. I just, yeah. I'm not, I'm not really into, like, the pooping thing. And I, I've kind of thought about, because I do book reviews, too. And I have touched on a couple of kind of extreme horror like i talked about um that book that infamous book cows by uh matthew stoko i think is how you pronounce his last name which was pretty fucking gross it's not like the grossest thing i've ever read but it was like pretty fucking gross like some pretty fucked up shit happened in it but again it kind of just it really rode that line between i'm like reading it i'm like i like this but is the dude just trying to be edgy like, just coming up with all this gross shit just to be edgy. Like, it's, it's really, really hard balance to strike, which is kind of why I'm very ambiv- ambivalent, like, about uh, extreme horror in general. Because I feel like a lot of it is just people going, I'm going to think of, like, the most fucked up shit I can think of. Like, you know? It's like a Serbian film. I'm going to rape a baby. You know what I mean? It's, just, you know, it's like that. And I thought, like, a Serbian film, I thought was a little bit edgelordy <laughs> you know what i mean yeah it's disturbing but i was just kind of like it seemed a little i don't know it seems a little try hard and i don't really like try hard i kind of like if you're gonna make something disturbing just make it disturbing like don't resort to the easy pooping in someone's mouth that's easy everyone's grossed out by that everybody so try to do something else to disturb me but i'm not shitting on that i'll read it but i'm just saying all right, so let me get back to Boris Karloff because I'm almost done. And then we got to eat because I'm kind of starving. So, again, we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about Bela Lugosi. I kind of feel like Boris Karloff was luckier in the regard that he actually had a really long career. Like, he never really had... I feel like he didn't really have a twilight period. I feel like Bela Lugosi was, like, super famous for, like, a little while, like, a couple of years. And then it seemed like a couple years after that, like, it was Poverty Row. And he was just, like, in these shitty 
like fucking Z grade pictures where I feel like Boris Karloff never really had that happen because, you know, he was in good films pretty much all the way up and then he went into TV and then he would like parlayed into stage, like he went back into stage work and stuff like that. So, and he really never seemed to be, and I hate to use this term because I don't really want to apply this to Bela Lugosi because I love Bela Lugosi, but he, like Boris Karloff never really had a period where he was like a has-been, quote unquote. And that might have been because one, he was older when he got famous. He was already in his 40s when he was in Frankenstein. Uh, and he'd already kind of like paid his dues, I guess. Like he'd already been in a bunch of like ro like smaller roles, like in films earlier. So as he got older, he almost became like an elder statesman. So he was in that and he was able to parlay that into like a really successful career, like until pretty much until he died, to be honest, because even after all of the movies dried up a bit, um, he would go on radio shows like he was on uh, Lights Out, which was kind of like a big radio show back in the day. Um, he would do like horror spoofs on like the Jack Benny show and stuff like that. Um, and he had his own radio show in the late 1940s. Uh, he had a show called Starring Boris Karloff. And, you know, and then the, later they did the like a television series of that, like for ABC. So he really didn't ever lose any respect, I feel like. Um, he also, I thought this was very funny. So as I said, he kind of started out like, a, like Bela Lugosi did on the stage. So he was in a production in 1941 of Arsenic and Old Lace. Now, the character that he played in Arsenic and Old Ladies, and he had, so I think he won a Tony for this as well. Arsenic and Old Ladies, there's a character in it that's a, ga that's a murderous gangster that keeps getting pissed off because everybody bitches that he looks just like Boris Karloff. So the fact that they got actual Boris Karloff to play this character in this play was fucking genius, and everybody loved it. And it was like a big, huge thing. Like he really, like I said, I'm pretty sure he got a Tony for that. Um, or I don't know if he got a Tony for that, but he got a Tony for another one. He was in another play where he uh, was in a play about Joan of Arc. Like he played the the guy that persecuted Joan of Arc. So there was that. So he was like a really respected stage actor, like after that. And then after that, he moved to television. Now, if you guys don't know, I have another channel called The Scare Salon. And a couple weeks back, I have started to watch Boris Karloff, the Boris Karloff hosted series called Thriller from the 1960s, where it was like a horror anthology. It actually started out as a suspense, more of a suspense crime anthology, and then segued into horror later on. Um, but Boris Karloff hosted it, and I was like really interested in watching it. And it's on, um, I can't remember what streaming service it's on, but I started like watching it. It's on Tubi or Voodoo or something like that. And so I started watching it, and I'm so I've been doing like reviews of them like six episodes at a time. So just like a couple weeks ago, I did like the first six episodes because I love Boris Karloff and I wanted to see. He's not in any of the um, episodes at first. He's just like the host, but he's in some of the ones later on. So yeah, so he had like whole TV series, and he was in. Um, so yeah, he was in Thriller, like I said. Uh, he was in one called Out of This World. There was one called The Veil, which actually was lost for a long time, and they actually rediscovered in the 1990s. And then he was in some Roger Corman AIP pictures. Uh, the Raven, like I said, I was thinking of that one when you were talking about The Raven, the one from the 1960s. He was also in uh, The Terror, which was actually the first, I think it was Jack Nicholson's first role when he was real young. Yes, yeah, and people in the uh, comments are saying, no, Raven was later on. No, there's more than one Raven. Yeah, I was thinking of the later on. I was thinking of the Roger Corman The one. 30s Raven was uh, Boris Karloff Belagosi. Yeah, because... Right after Black Cat. Because Boris Karloff was also in the 60s one, yeah. and that's why I was confused. That was like the, the Roger Corman and they were, one. I remember the, the 30s Raven being pretty good, but not as good as Black Cat. That maybe is another one that we yeah. want to see. But yeah, so but yeah, so he was in, uh, like I said, The Terror that had Jack Nicholson in it. Uh, he was in Die, Monster, Die. He was in The Sorcerers, which somebody brought up earlier. That was 1966. He was also on, like, British TV. So he never really had, I guess, like, a twilight of his career. He was pretty much, like, working, like, all until he was old. He was, And he was on, like, a bunch of, like, uh, panel shows, like, game shows and shit like that. Um, and, you know, he would be in a bunch of parodies. He was on Man from Uncle, or no, Girl from Uncle. Uh, he was in Drag in that one. Uh, he was on Wild Wild West, like playing an Indian Maharaja. There was that, um, you know. So there was that. Now, 
in the 1960s, mid 1960s, as Tammy brought up earlier. Uh oh, is it Pookie? It's Pookie time. It's Pookie. Yeah, what's up, Pookie time? She's, She's like, no, like, I don't want to be, be on a show. No, I'll, you, look up, look at, look at the camera, Pook. You come hang out. With look at the camera. She's like, Daddy, She's I don't like, want uh, to. I don't want to, Daddy. Daddy, I gotta play with things on the floor. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. She's, not, she's like. Uh, she's like doing her head like, no, 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 no. 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 Why are you? Why are you picking me up? And then she goes over there to the damn cat dip. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, Thomas Swafford said Car uh, Karloff was also an Inspector March of Scotland Yard, a British television series. Yeah, I was gonna like I had that in my notes right there. So yeah, he was in shit like all the time. Now, in the mid 1960s, I kind of feel like he got um, like a big career surge because of, as Tammy mentioned earlier, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, the Dr. Seuss adaptation, which shit, man, people still watch that at Christmas time nowadays. And yeah. that was what, 50, 60 years ago? Holy shit. The song? That was a long time ago. Now, you. see, the thing about it, the song, though, Yeah. I kind of feel like people thought that was Boris Karloff singing, and it's not. It's not? No. It sounds like him. That's what I'm saying. A lot of yeah. people, that that was actually a dude named Thurl Ravenscroft. Okay. Which, what kind of name? That's an awesome name. I don't name. know. But yeah, so um, that was an American guy. But he was singing that. But a lot of people did associate, because, you know, Boris Karloff had that distinctive voice, and he... He's doing a Karloff impression. Yeah. Right, yeah. I don't even know if he meant to, but that's how it, yeah. people did think. But it was a different guy. But, um, yeah, he did do the voice for that, like the voiceover. And so he got, like, hugely famous from that. And sh jumping off of that, he also got a bunch of work doing, um, like, reading stories for kids. Like, I even saw earlier on YouTube they had, like, a fucking clip from a show that he used to do like children's stories with uncle boris or something like that and he wasn't like being scary or monstrous or anything he was just sitting in a room like masterpiece hmm. theater like hmm. reading children's like red riding hood and stuff like that to little kids with his cool ass voice <laughs> so i kind of like that's kind of awesome i just kind of feel like he didn't fall into the same trap unfortunately that bella lugosi fell into like i you know he he actually was able to like diversify out and do stuff for kids like later on because he wasn't all that scary. So, like I said, somebody mentioned that he was in the movie Targets uh, by Peter Bogdanovich. That's 1968. And he was also in a British movie called The Crimson Cult, uh, which I think was the last movie. That was also 1968. I think that was the last movie that w came out like while he was still alive. Now, he was actually in a few movies after that, but they weren't released until after he was dead. He actually did some movies in Mexico, uh, some of them were called The Snake People. One of them was called that. Uh, the Incredible Invasion. Whoa, it's incredible. Fear Chamber and Being House of by Evil. Some shit, yeah. I guess. <laughs> were they and, in English or they in, or they in Spanish? I'm imagining. I don't really know. They said that they shot his scenes separately. Like okay. they shot his stuff in L.A. Like in right, 1968, yeah. and then they finished them in Mexico. So okay. I'm assuming they're Spanish language. Spanish, right, yeah. So I'm guessing that they probably dubbed him, which is kind of a shame. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he could speak Spanish or not I, no, I, I don't no, know probably not um so yeah so a lot of those and he did another one that was shot in spain called cauldron of blood um so those movies were actually released after he died so the crimson cult as far as i know was like the last one that was released that he was in while he was still alive now the thing about it like while he was working on these last movies uh boris karloff had really bad emphysema he only had Half of one lung Damn, half that was still one. working. A quarter of a so lung. shit, man. He must have been smoking his entire life. Yeah. They he had to like they would do a take and then he'd have to go over to the oxygen tank get and like some, that, get his yeah, air. Which yeah. holy shit. Um. Yeah. So there's that. So uh, I also mentioned earlier that he edited a bunch of like uh, books, like horror anthologies, like he did that as well. So his name was big enough to get into that. And as someone brought up earlier, he was actually one of the founding members of the Screen Actors Guild because of the shit that he had gone through on the Frankenstein movie, where he actually had some kind of like lingering physical effects from all of the uh, stuff that he had to do for that movie. He um, was kind of like a big advocate for actors' rights and for them having a union and everything like that. So he was actually one of the founding members of that, of the Screen Actors Guild. So he was really passionate about it and he was like one of the instrumental guys in like getting all of that started so that's pretty cool as well 
uh, because he thought that because of the shit that they made them go through back in the old days before there was a union before there was rules before there was all this other stuff they'd basically like hey we're gonna put like a 400 pound thing on you and like make you work for 12 (laughs) hours like and not let you go to the bathroom or anything like that so he's like yeah that shit's not cool uh so yeah so he like i said he was very instrumental in starting that so if you're a member of the screen actors guild then boris karloff is one of the people you can uh thank for that because he was one of the guys that started it now uh much like bella lugosi he also married five times which is crazy so did bella um and also had one child also bella lugosi bella lugosi famously married five times and had one kid a son uh boris karloff actually had one daughter uh named sarah karloff and if you see any uh documentary about him she'll usually be on there talking she seems like a lovely person uh and the daughter was also by his fourth wife just like bella lugosi's was um so yeah he apparently the the story was that when his daughter was born he was filming son of frankenstein and had to rush over to the hospital with all the makeup still on shit he must have been in his 50s or 60s when the daughter was born then huh? son of frankenstein i think he was 56 56, 56? yeah okay. yeah i think his wife was somewhat younger but um, oh she had to have been but yeah but because she had been in menopause because she had a yeah <laughs> postmenopausal probably been in her 30s or fucking 20s but yeah, because like I said, but both of these guys really didn't get yeah. famous, famous until they were older. I yeah. kind of feel like he was 43. I know that for sure. I can't remember how old Bella Lugosi was when he was in Dracula, but he wasn't young because a lot of the um, uh, publicity stills that I saw of Bella Lugosi were from his stage work when he was younger. So, but most of the stuff from like the 30s when he was in Dracula and everything like that, he obviously looked like he was already like in his 40s probably. Well, so, it makes sense because the audience has no memory of them as right. being younger, so there's nothing to associate them with a, with another time or other roles. He appears as a heavy, yeah, in his forties or fifties as a as a villain, a heavy character or something. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it makes sense. It's probably a pattern. I have to look at. It. I don't. If you had a, if you had a role in your youth. And it was remembered back in those days. You probably couldn't make a transition into a heavy character because they were like, yeah. Well, I think people like, were a lot. Buckwheat. They were a lot. <laughs> Buck, buckwheat can't be a vampire, you know. It's gonna be something like that. Buckwheat the vampire. Yeah, buckwheat. <laughs> Spanky and stymie. Stymie did something bad. No, you know, it's gonna be some shit like that. I would have watched a whole movie about yeah. Spanky. Yeah, Spanky. <laughs> By the time they had the fucking budget to do Spanky, those, guys, those kids were so played out. I remember when I was a little kid in the 70s, they'd show up on talk shows, and they were played out then. They were still wearing their fucking crazy little hats so you could recognize them and shit. Fucking poor guys. I don't know if I would want to. No. I, don't, I don't know if I would want to do that. They were like, whatever happened to Baby Jane action. They were doing That's that. what I mean. That's yeah. like, to me, that seems like... Yeah. I well, but then I can understand like being a child star that really does kind of fuck you up. Mm-hmm. In some ways, I kind of feel like maybe the reason, and maybe it's because it's horror too, which I think is a lot more forgiving genre. Yeah, because you're not dealing with yeah. reality necessarily. Um, so I think that horror is a lot more forgiving of like yeah. older actors. But the fact that both of these guys were kind of paid their dues on the stage and in smaller roles and stuff like that when they were younger and then by the time they got famous they were already in their they were already in their 40s yeah so everybody just kind of got used to them so nobody got used to them being like really young and dashing and whatever it's like everybody just saw them as they were and it's like they were kind of willing to take you young people you don't know what i'm talking about i'm talking about little rascals or our gang we grew up. And they, they were playing that shit. Fucking. I mean, that's commercial way before free. our time. That but... was before our time. That was twenties or thirties. Thirties, I guess. Yeah, when that we... was actually before my right. grandmother's time, to be <laughs> honest. But they would play our gang. You can see it all free on YouTube, which is fun. I went back and watched them, and no, they stand up to the test of time. They're still funny. They're still funny. Now, as it went on, it got more canned. But early Our Gang was funny. It was just kind of like reality TV. Uh, fucking, they would take these little kids from the 30s and fucking put them together and they would interact. And they were kids from the LA area. And they would kind of edit it together into some just funny adventures that they did. And Spanky it was, was the funniest. I yeah. It, the main. Th- it, <laughs> when we first started, the main ones was fucking Stymie. He, he was a black kid. 
with a fucking derby on. Spanky was a little boy. He was a baby when it first started. Uh, I think Alfalfa was walking around, though. And then you had... Who else what, were the main ones in the early part? But it was just... And then, then Spanky got a little bit older. And he could talk and shit. And a lot of it was fucking... Stymie and Spanky trying to get food at the local fucking... Not really a bar, but... They didn't have fast food back then. In South America, it would be called a luncheonetchi, which is like an open place where you had bar stools and a bar, and you could get sodas and sandwiches. And um, the luncheonette. And they're in there trying to talk their way into some food. This is all Depression-era shit. And uh, no, man, they were great. They edited it together, and it was all ad-libbed. And they were all selected for being funny and kind of like high, high IQ. And... Stymie, Spanky, and Alfalfa were the main ones, and they were the high IQ little kids. Most of them ended up fucking bad. Ended up fucking coming to bad ends. I kind of feel like Alfalfa got the worst. Alfalfa though, got shot and killed over a dog fight did, during a did, fight yeah. over a dog. In case you didn't know. Yeah, St- Stymie ended up being a, basically a bitter, bitter, bitter old man, out in the hood, unappreciated. You know, he could have been a lot more than he was. Time wasn't on his side. Evidently, fucking drugs may have had something to do with it. Spanky was the one that kind of ended up having a normal life, but he was just a little short fat guy. Um, Darla, Darla Crane, ended up being a U.S. senator. She was a little love interest little girl. She was cute. She could sing. She's kind of like a... Kind of like a... What's a little girl that could fucking sing and dance back in those days? Shirley Temple. Shirley Temple. Kind of like a Shirley Temple. Little brunette Shirley Temple type. And there was a bunch of other little kids that kind of came and went. But see, there's something to be said. I think that I would rather get famous a little bit later. Yeah. And I, because I kind of feel like if you're famous when you're a kid. Yeah. Yeah. It usually doesn't work out well for you. Now, no. some people have had it work out, like Jodie Foster. That worked out okay. Like, but usually she had it rough though too. From what she I did, but that's what I'm saying. But she was famous Somebody later pre- on. Tried to kill the president behind Jodie Foster. I know. That was some but weird shit. I'm just talking about her fault. I'm just talking about yeah. her career wise. I'm yeah. not talking about like what that motherfucker did. That wasn't her fault. Yeah, no. But um, she didn't even know that career did. wise, she actually like did. She started out as a kid, but actually yeah. she was able to parlay into like a very successful career as an adult. That. That doesn't usually happen. I kind of feel like it's usually better. It's probably better if you get famous when you're a little bit older, like I said, because then nobody's used to seeing you as a cute little kid or like yeah. a perky little 19 year old. And then suddenly like you're an old person and everybody's yeah. like, ooh, age gross. Yeah. And then like, but if they already see you as somebody that's, you know, in their thirties or forties already, then you aging isn't going to be quite as drastic and you're not going to be associated with a, being a cute child and now you're no longer yeah. a cute child i kind of yeah. feel like that's a word so i can see why a lot of child actors like end up yeah. uh coming to bad ends because a lot of them do another our gang icon was buckwheat eddie murphy who's my my favorite comedian that i grew up with and one of my favorites fucking going all the way back to them like in beverly hills cop the beverly hills cop series and and fucking everything else he did you know, fucking vampire in brooklyn and shit he would, he was on Saturday Night Live, he was doing buckwheat impersonations of fucking buckwheat. Buckwheat was a little black kid from the L.A. ghetto, the old L.A. ghetto from the 30s, wearing his sister's clothes and the little fucking cornrow type haircuts and shit. And he did all kinds of funny shit. And it, fucking, if you're young, man, go and go on YouTube and watch Our Gang, also known as The Little Rascals. And, um... We used to watch it in the morning, you know, when you're eating cereal and the shit. And everything in those old, old fucking little shorts that they made, they showed them before movies. There was no TV then. Still kind of stands it's kind of in terms of like the moral, the morals and the lessons behind them. They were good. And they were fucking funny. Little spanky punching grown men in the face and shit. And it was all ad lib. They made the, most of it. The early shit that was just all ad lib. They made it up as they were going on. And it was kind of like reality TV. It was funny. Closest you were going to get to the reality TV. 
would have me rolling when I was a fucking kid. And it had everybody else rolling back in the 70s. We would laugh at that shit. Even though it was old back then. It was old back then. It was, yeah. Like I said, yeah. that was way before our time. Fucking funny so, music and shit. Let me get yeah. into... Okay, so Boris Karloff, like I said, he yeah. actually got bronchitis in 1968 and got hospitalized and died of pneumonia in 1969. He was 81 years old. Uh, and actually, Boris Karloff, I don't know if you guys know this, but he has two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. One yeah. for his movies and one for his <clears throat> TV. Uh, Legendre007 said, Is it true that when he was in horror, Bella Lugosi was still accustomed to thinking of himself as young and dashing, and old a &E shows seemed to portray him that way? I'm not really sure. I don't know. Like, I haven't seen that um, documentary that you're talking about, but I don't know. I think that he did... I don't know. After he came out of rehab when he was, like, old, I think he realized, because, man, he looked bad, like, when he came out of there. They took pictures of him. Yeah. Like I said, he was open about it, so I guess he was okay with, yeah, you can publish pictures of me looking like this, mm -hmm. um, because he really didn't look like he was in good shape, because he was trying to, like, you know, be honest about the addiction and everything like that. But I don't know. Maybe up until... A certain time he did think of himself that way because like when he was younger he absolutely was a ladies man and he got um you know he was kind of seen around town it's like oh, with all these big ingenues and big stars and everything like that so he was kind of seen in that way and i think for a long time he did kind of consider himself that way but once he got past a point where he was just like in shitty poverty row pictures all the time I think he probably, like, wised up and was like, yeah, I'm not really what I used to be. Which, like I said, is sad because the same thing didn't happen to Boris Karloff. You know what I mean? Boris Karloff was able to... And I don't know if it was necessarily just anything to do with them. I think it was just kind of to do with the system as a whole. But yeah. Boris Karloff was actually able to parlay into like kind of being an elder statesman kind of thing and he i don't think he ever lost respect or he never yeah he was in maybe like a couple cheapy shit shitty movies but he had a back catalog of him he, being old so that yeah good, he didn't yeah, really he didn't really record. fall into the same and right. you know it should be said too he didn't get into drug addiction right. he didn't like to so he was actually he had like a lot of like health problems obviously but you know, he was able to kind of like keep going and keep his dignity, I guess. Somebody until mentioned ready. Robert Blake was also a little rascal, and I gotta say, my mom dated Robert Blake. Somebody set her up on a date back in the seventies with him. She thought he was nice, but she she didn't like him. She thought he was too old back then. I, which would in the seventies he would probably have been in his fucking fifties, probably forties or fifties. She didn't like my mom was probably in her twenties at that time. But uh, no, fucking yeah, Robert Blake. My mom dated him. That's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> Tammy says Ron Howard was the best kid actor to grown yeah. mature adult still directing. Yeah, that's right. Ron Howard's still around. Yeah. And like I said, he was, yeah, you know, he was in, he, he I think it was better that he parlayed more into directing because yeah. that was seemed like more of what he wanted to do anyway, yeah. more than acting. Thomas Wofford said 2020 embarrassed themselves when they did a segment on what happened to Stymie. They interviewed a guy who claimed to be him and wasn't. It wasn't him. Several people lost their jobs over that. <laughs> hey, it wasn't Stymie. I think I kind of remember like hearing yeah, about that. Yeah, funny. I didn't know about that. Yeah. And then they're talking about... I was uh, sure the Stymie just was ended up being a bitter old man and didn't want to do interviews in a very low-income house out in the middle of the hood in L.A. That's how. That's the last time. That's that makes me like so sad because it just kind of feels like because of the nature of yeah. movies, right? Like you know, all of us are still watching Buckwheat and Stymie and stuff like that as they were back then. Yeah. And you don't really, when you're watching it, you're just kind of like enjoying it. You don't yeah. really feel like, like what happened to that, like dude? what happened to that dude, like later right. on. And it's just like I'm sure like the money for that like yeah. dried up in like five seconds. Somebody mentioned that fucking uh, that that Eddie Murphy on Saturday Night Live did a Buckwheat got shot video. I remember that. And they did it like it was a news report. But we got shot. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. that shit was, I remember it being fucking funny. Uh, I imagine you could probably get a Saturday Night Live Eddie Murphy fucking greatest hits of all the fucking funny oh, shit I that imagine Eddie Murphy can, did. Sure. Saturday Night Live. Fucking, he was fucking f hilarious. Remember the time when Eddie Murphy did Whiteface and fucking impersonated a white person to see what the world was really like? And he goes up on the bus 
And when the black people leave, they pull out the hors d'oeuvres and they start fucking handing wine around. <laughs> all, the white, all the white people on the bus are having hors d'oeuvres. As soon as the black person shows up, they fucking hide all the shit. They get, it's just funny, man. Fucking Eddie, Eddie's there and fucking white face going true. like, what the right. hell? <laughs> the world's right. a lot better fucking when he's in white face and shit. <laughs> White people are secretly helping themselves. No, you don't have to worry. Don't, don't, don't pay for it. Somebody guy she goes up to buy some big item and shit, and fucking he goes and he can't. He didn't have enough money, and the and the, and the cashier's like, "Don't worry about it. Just take it." <laughs> it let me tell you, black people, that doesn't happen. Okay, we still gotta pay for shit. <laughs> fucking funny. Although y'all could be forgiven for thinking that. Yeah, that you probably gotta, happens. Gonna, it's think, like I know. Yeah, you might think that happens. That doesn't happen. I wish it happened. I don't <laughs> yeah, want to yeah, have to pay for anything. Uh, Tammy said Robert Blake uh, has a lot of mental problems. Because yeah. His dad treated him so bad when he was yeah. little. Yeah. I mean, you know. My mother's friend in, in, uh, introduced them and kind of set them up. He was looking for a girlfriend or something. This is like back in the 70s. After my mom got divorced. She went on a date with him, but she didn't like him. My mom was a hottie back in those days. <clears throat> Every time I think of Robert Blake nowadays, yeah. I just think of... I know I don't think of, like, the, the wife shooting, but I think of yeah. uh, him from Lost Highway. Yeah, yeah. That dude was a he, creepy he, motherfucker. He, yeah, he was, yeah. Well, and also I think of him from uh, In Cold Blood. The whole wife thing is sus. Is sus. But if I'm going to call him out... I got to call out Shat because Shat's wife situation was kind of sus too. It was. Um, Honestly, I don't know. I don't know if Robert Blake had that. anything to do with his wife dying. I'm I'm neutral on that. Um, but yeah, the whole William Shatner thing. I feel like Shat gets a pass. You got a pass. People forgot about that. There was some. Weird I'm not shit. saying that Shat murdered his wife. I don't think that. It but was it's just, just some weird shit to happen. But it was like a weird situation, and I his just feel like call, people don't talk about weird. it. People don't talk about it. As his much phone as call to the to to nine one one. They played it, and it, it sounded fake. My wife, she's she's dead. She's in the pool. He was acting. He was definitely acting. I but see, that's the thing. I just yeah. the way your voice sounds. I don't know yeah. because William Shatner is so known for being like over the top. Over Maybe the top, that's yeah. just the way he talks. Maybe I don't and know. he can't turn it off. She I don't know. Was, she was definitely addicted to drugs. She definitely was found dead in a pool. Mm -hmm. She drowned somehow. There was no signs of violence. You're never going to get a conviction. So. That's what I mean. And that's the thing about that um, is that, you know, yeah, it's totally possible for you to get, like, so fucked up on drugs or drunk or whatever that, that you could you drown, absolutely yourself. drown in a pool. Like, right. yeah, it happens. Um, you know. Yeah. There was no proof of anything else. So, but sure. It was just weird. It was just weird. Right. Now, the thing with... There was no proof to prove that fucking... Uh, what's his name? Shot his wife. He did not shoot his wife. Somebody else shot his yeah, wife. Yeah, now, yeah, I don't think he shot he Robert not, Blake. Robert I don't Blake think he shot, shot his wife. wife. Somebody now, else shot her. did he pay someone to shoot the wife? I don't know, that's a different question. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think he did. There's no way. His his gun was on fired and, and I don't she think was he shot did. while his gun was in the custody of the people that owned the restaurant because he had to carry a concealed permit. And while she went out to the car, was in the car, and somebody shot her while she was out there. It was L.A. Weird shit happens. That's what I mean. It could have been totally random. Could have been random, but nothing was ever taken. Yeah. That's, nothing was you know. taken. It was just... She was I'm just, just like I said, I don't know. I wasn't there, so... Yeah. Like, I know he didn't do it, no, but I'm just it. saying, you know, obviously you could have paid just, somebody to do it. it. I don't know if he did that or not. Some people surmised, was that a hit? Because they were fighting, Maybe. but a lot of couples fight. That's what I mean. It's like, yeah. it would take a lot right. for you to pay actual money right. to, like, have your significant have other killed. Have on her, yeah. I mean, well, L.A., you know, I guess. If you know the right guy, just a certain amount of drugs you get. <laughs> uh, if that was a pro hit, it worked. True. You know. Yeah, there it is It would have been a ghetto pro hit. Didn't Not, not much money involved. It did work. I just, there's just no proof if it was a pro hit. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not coming down on one side of Right. Legendre at 007 also said people also think Robert Wagner was suspicious when Natalie Wood drowned. I think we talked about that. I think we did a show a long time ago about Hollywood mysteries, and we yeah. talked about that because Christopher Walken was there, too. And I think the whole thing was they thought, didn't they think that, like, Natalie Wood and Christopher Walken were, like, having a thing or... 
Am I thinking of the right thing? Yeah. But yeah. So that that was super suspicious. I'm not accusing anybody, but that was also a very suspicious situation. But I'm not saying that like weird accidents don't happen because they do. Um, but that's why yeah. cases like that are so difficult because yeah, it absolutely could have been that it was just like some bizarre like fucking freak accident. Yeah, that's right. possible. That's but, the same with Shat and all those. I mean, but I understand how like if the circumstances are weird, then yeah, you have to look into that shit because it's absolutely couldn't have been an accident. It might not have been an accident. But I must say know. that in certain states, those dudes would have went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Some states like Louisiana, you'd go to jail. Both of those dudes would be in jail if they if they weren't famous. They'd be like, well, be being famous jail. helps. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Being famous helps. Uh, you know, I will say, and having money helps. Yeah, obviously, because you can afford a defense. Because you know, you're it, it, my broke, obscure ass. Uh, you know, if I was involved in anything that was like suspicious, I would just guilty. Get a, I would just get a break. Guilty, yeah. I, I wouldn't really. As soon as they, if you don't have any money, they <laughs> accuse you. You're fucking. Guilty. Yeah, I'm in trouble. Yeah, like I said, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware of that. So, um, probably about time to shut it down. Huh? Yeah, I'm yeah, getting man. That food so is good. smelling really it's good down so good. there. <laughs> I have to go down there and check on that. And we haven't eaten since God. It's almost right. 10 p.m. We haven't yeah. eaten for almost 12 hours. Yeah, you realize that, I'm gonna that, right? Whole leg quarter. You want a whole leg quarter? Sure. Okay. You gonna make That's tatoes? Good. Got the match those ready to go. Man, make some potatoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't eaten for like uh, eleven hours at okay. this point. We had we had lunch early Let's at like eleven. Eat. Go ahead and shut it down, Jim. All right. So hopefully you guys enjoy the show. I know we went off on a lot of tangents, but you know we do that That's the all the time. Of the show. Anyway. Yeah. So uh, so yeah. So be sure to come by Friday because we don't know what weird cheap ass or weird ass liquor that we'll be doing a taste test on yeah, but we'll right. find something we'll go to the liquor store yeah. we'll go to the liquor it's store like hurricane. tomorrow yeah maybe we'll Probably go to the liquor hurricane. store tomorrow or friday and we'll like find some like weird ass. maybe he'll pick some and i'll pick some uh but yeah and tomorrow i'm gonna put up another crime in memorial video it's gonna be about three murders that were possibly maybe possibly cia related uh but maybe not and I'm also putting up a review of the 2022 movie Revealer because I know a couple people uh, asked about that because it was on Shutter. So I did a review of that. And I'm going to put that up tomorrow as well. So we will see you guys again on the live stream on Friday evening. Thank you, everybody, for dropping by. Thanks for your super chats. We love you guys. We will see you again Friday night. Bye.